Monica, do you have one? Of Mark, are you ready? Zoom is ready. Mr. Jump, okay, thank you. Uh, I now call to order the regular session meeting of the Board of Commission on the City of Tarpon Springs today, Thursday, January 7th, 2021 at 6 p.m. Uh, I wanna say Happy New Year to everybody uh, here and uh, watching online. Uh, this is a continuation of the December 15th, 2020 Board of Commission regular session. So we're not gonna have um, public comments that aren't going to be discussed on the items tonight. Um, roll call. Mayor Lahuzis. Here. Vice Mayor Carr. Here. Commissioner Terrapani. Here. Commissioner Donovan. Here. Commissioner Vadikiotis. Here. Uh, due to ex extraordinary circumstances, the board would uh, need to consider allowing Mayor Hal Alahusis to participate uh, in the meeting via Zoom. Um, it's a formality uh, because he can't be here in person. That's is why I'm going to be running the meeting. Is there a motion on the board? Motion approved. Second. Uh, roll call. Commissioner Vadikiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor Lahuzis? Yes. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, I would like to move up the ratif uh, ratification of executive orders first, uh, since this is required to be done tonight by state statute. Uh, Mr. City Manager. I think the city attorney has to read the resolution. I'll read resolution 2021-01 by title only resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, ratifying executive order 2020-45 and extending the declaration of local state of emergency to December 29th, 2020 ratifying executive order 2020-46 and extending the declaration of local state of emergency to January 5th, 2021, ratifying executive order 2021-01 and extending the, the de declaration of local state of emergency to January 12th, 2021 and providing for an effective date hereof. That was the reading of resolution 2021-01 by title only. Those are the three orders between time of uh, the last meeting uh, that we have to ratify. Do we have any uh, board comment? Move approval. Okay. Second. Uh, Ms. Jacobs, have we received any emails? We have not received any emails. Mr. Jump, is there anyone online wishing to speak on this item? 
If anyone would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do have a raised hand. Okay, we do have a raised the... hand at this time. Okay. If you could state your name and address for the record. Uh, Laura Maidenberg, 1437 Sail Harbor Circle. Go ahead, ma'am, if this is about the executive orders. Yes, I just wanted to comment that this is the nature coast and the reason why we moved here and um, we need to keep it as natural as possible and not develop. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, I think your public comment is for the next item with the uh, ankle harbors. Um, this is for the executive orders. I'm terribly sorry. 2021 01. And if anyone who would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in. And we do not have any raised hands at this time, sir. Okay. Do we have anyone in attendance that would like to speak on this item? Okay. Seeing none. Um, any commissioner comments? Oh, on this item? Yeah, no. Okay. Um, roll call. Commissioner Vatikiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor Alahuzas? Yes. Uh, we're going to move to item 15. Uh, I do have a few comments to make, uh, but I would like to um, ask Commissioner Terrapani based on our memo we received tonight. Um, to make a couple comments. Sure. Thank you, uh, Acting Mayor. Um, Honorable Mayor and Board of Commissioners, as you know, I have a conflict of interest on this agenda item tonight. And uh, so I will, uh, again, be participating in the discussion or the vote. Um, and I sent you a memorandum this afternoon basically stating that this is a one-item agenda. Um, and given that I'm not going to be partaking in the discussion or, or voting on the one item, uh, I would ask that you excuse me after the swearing in so I can go home and be uh, with my young family. Thank you. Motion to approve. Okay. Roll call. Commissioner Vatikiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Commissioner Terrapani? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor Lahuzas? Yes. Um, before I uh, defer to the city attorney for item 15, Anklet Harbor, uh, I do want to make a, a couple statements. Um, we welcome all public comment, and uh, it's great to see a, a full house and a lot of people online tonight. Um, public comments shall be made to the chair and not directed to anyone in attendance or staff. Public comment is not an answer and question session. Personal attacks or slanderous comments will not be allowed. Uh, this is the first warning. If any personal attacks or slanderous comments are made, you will have one second warning and then I'll be asked to leave. As a reminder, public comment is limited to four minutes unless you are given additional time from someone in attendance. Um, City Attorney. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, I wanted to go through a couple of uh, house uh, rules that um, that I want to get uh, known and up front so that we, everybody has an understanding as to what we're going to be doing tonight. First of all, I want to read the quasi-judicial hearing process. This is the same um, procedure that I had read at the last two meetings, but I want everybody that is present to also hear it. This is a quasi-judicial proceeding of the Board of Commissioners. It acts in a quasi-judicial matter rather than a legislative capacity. At a quasi-judicial hearing, it is not the board's function to make law, but rather to apply law that has already been established. In a quasi-judicial hearing, the board is required by law to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in the code of ordinances in order to make a legal decision regarding the application before it. The board may only consider evidence at this hearing that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues. If the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has met the criteria established in the Code of Ordinances and the board is required by law to find in favor of the applicant. By the same token, if the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has failed to meet the criteria established in the Code of Ordinances, then the board is required by law to find against the applicant. With that being said, I'd ask to, um, for 
all the commissioners to disclose any ex parte communications that they have had with regard to this application. Now is the time to do that. I would ask that you disclose who you spoke to uh, and the substance of the conversation uh, or conversations. So, okay, so uh, Commissioner Vaticiotis. Yes, um, I uh, wish to disclose that I had conversations with uh, Ms. Terrapani and also Mr. Terrapani. The substance of the conversations were um, kind of a chicken and an egg discussion of, of whether this was completely the developer's plan or did the staff uh, guide them in some way to uh, address the uh, comprehensive plan. Also, there was quite a bit of discussion concerning the um, uh, second access and then also a brief discussion concerning the dock and that there had been no information on that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Vice Mayor? Uh, I spoke to Carl Wagonforth yesterday. Um, nothing particular about the site, just about being an affected party and he had some questions. Okay. Commissioner Donovan, did you have any? Yeah, I also spoke to Carl Wagonforth yesterday about the Friends the Ant quote becoming an affected party. Okay. Uh, with that being said, um, I know that Commissioner Tierpani has already left the room. He's acknowledged that there is a conflict of interest and so he will not be um, participating this afternoon or this evening. Has anyone else had a conflict of interest that they need to disclose? Okay, there being no other conflicts uh, uh, being shown, I wanted to discuss a couple of different things. The first thing is I want to let you know that earlier in the week that we had received a request by an organization called the Concerned Citizens of Tarpon Springs, Inc. They asked to be considered to be a affected party. You remember that under the law in order to establish being an adversely affected party, those persons must show that the zoning action adversely affects their legal recognizable rights or interests, which must be an interest that exceeds the general interest of the community welfare shared in common with all citizens. After having received information from the attorney representing the group um, and also case law that had been provided by the applicant, I made a determination that they are not an adverse um, adversely affected party um, based upon the factors of the Renard decision that was issued by the Florida Supreme Court in 1972. That being said, in an abundance of caution, I have advised the attorney representing the concerned um, citizens of Tarpon Springs, Inc. that they will be able to present testimony and evidence and cross-examine. Um, and uh, the attorney is here tonight and she will be doing that. Um, so you should be aware of that. I have not asked, been asked to provide any additional information about any other um, person who believes they are an affected party. So if there are through the evening, we'll have to address that. But right now, the way that we're gonna handle this is, is that we're going to allow Mr. Armstrong and Ms. Graham to address uh, the, the commission as we move through the process relative to presenting witnesses and making objections. Um, so, um, where we left off at the last meeting was is that we had stopped the meeting after the direct examination of the stormwater expert for the city. His first name I had written down is Rick. Uh, this is the time for Mr. Armstrong to step forward if he has any cross-examination of the stormwater expert. Once that is completed, we're gonna to move to Mr. Smith, um, uh, Mr. Paul Smith. Uh, the city said that they were gonna be calling him as well. <clears throat> I believe it's relative to um, reclaim water um, availability. Once we complete that, I believe that there is a person who is gonna be here from FDOT who wants to testify as to, um, I, I believe the US-19. So uh, with that being said, as a starting point, once those things are done, then we're gonna to move to the e applicant. The applicant present witnesses and testimony. Um, and then we're gonna to move to concerned citizens of Tarpon Springs. They will uh, <coughs> make their presentation next. There, of course, could be some rebuttal. Once that is completed, we'll listen to um, the email correspondence that you've received over the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, and then we'll allow the public at large to make any uh, statements that they wanted to make. And I'm hoping that that gives some clarity as to the process that we're gonna take tonight. So with that being said, I'd like to save some time and have everyone that's gonna speak tonight um, stand up and I'm going to swear you in all at one time. And then I may ask you when you step up whether or not you've been sworn. So if you'd raise your right hand, you swear that the testimony you're about to give is going to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. 
Okay, so the attorney, you need to stand back up. I didn't, if you raise your right hand, you, I need you to take the oath as well. You swear the testimony vote to give is going to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. So we'll start off then. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, do you have any cross examination of Rick, the stormwater expert? No, sir. Okay, so Ms. Graham, do you have any uh, cross examination of the stormwater expert? No, sir. Thank you. Okay, with that being said, we can move on to Paul Smith. Mr. Smith, are you available? I am. Okay, so you are going to be making a presentation based upon uh, Ms. Vincent's um, statements at the last meeting. So it, the floor is yours at this point. You, you were sworn in, were you not? I was. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, sir. Good evening, Paul Smith, Public Services Director for the City of Tarpon Springs. Uh, regarding the city's reclaimed water system, the city uh, produces on average about 1.8 million gallons a day of reclaimed water. Uh, and of that, approximately 80% of it gets reused. The remainder, primarily in the wettest months, uh, gets discharged to the Enclote River as a highly treated, finished, uh, advanced treated effluent. Um, regarding this project, staff did their own estimates of the potential demand based on the plans, the irrigable area on the plans and to convert it to uh, equivalent number of single family homes, it was somewhere in the range of 35 to 40 homes worth of demand. So in a big picture, a relatively small demand for reclaimed water, something that we can accommodate. Um, the city does have a 12 inch diameter reclaimed water line on Live Oak, and that is the connection point to serve this proposed development. And um, as I said before, the city does have the capacity to serve it. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, does this commission have any questions for Mr. Smith? I do. Uh, Commissioner Vaticotis. Thank you. Um, we're talking about reclaimed water. Um, and I assume you've seen the applicant's uh, comments, Mr. Smith? I have. Okay. Um, so basically they're representing that they would agree to build the uh, line from Live Oak Street and bring it on to site and utilize reclaimed water as long as uh, we would provide them the needed water to do so that to fulfill their um, uh, reclaimed water needs. So I just want to ask formally, do, are we agreeing to that? Yes, that is something that we can do. Uh, would meet the same agreement terms of all reclaimed water customers, which means it's an interruptible service um, based on availability. But yes, that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Any other commissioners have questions for Mr. Smith? I'm seeing um, no. I do, uh, Mr. Trask. Mr. Trask, uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Smith. Uh, in, in case that we don't have enough uh, reclaimed water, it would be possible for the uh, for the applicant for the project to turn to another source of uh, watering system and how that can happen. Yes, they would have to come up with a, a proposed alternative to the reclaimed water um, to supply their needs. Um, I think they've... Uh, They've already expressed an interest in extending it. And if that's something they uh, are going to do, I think it would be beneficial. Okay. Maybe something that we need to discuss later. Yes. The applicant. Thank you. Mr. Trask, that's what I got. Thank you, Mayor. Commissioner Vaticus, you have another question? Yes, the, um, Mr. Smith, extending the uh, reclaim line, if we get to that point of a second access uh, off Hayes Road, extending it in that direction, um, it, I, I know there was some discussion that reclaim water is already on Jasmine Avenue, and um, I'm getting mixed answers as far as whether it's uh, county reclaim water or city reclaim water. So I've got two questions. One, um, would it be something that the city would be interested in to extend its reclaimed water line to Jasmine through this second access if that materializes? And number two, uh, what is the reclaimed water on Jasmine Avenue right now? Who's, whose water is it, the city's or is it the county's? I'll start with the last question first. The uh, reclaimed water is the city's system. It extends east on Live Oak and then serves the uh, North Lake subdivision and also the townhomes of North Lake further to the southeast. 
So uh, Reclaim Water is available to that area. As you move north to the Leisure Lake Village Mobile Home Park, and then further north to Sail Harbor, those areas are not served by Reclaim Water currently. I would say that we have approximately 110 more homes worth of capacity under current conditions. Now, there's a lot of factors that go into that estimate. Um, so the uh, estimated 35 homes I mentioned earlier would easily fit within that remaining capacity, but we're really at a point where we wanna be strategic with any future development of reclaimed water projects. And I'm talking, you know, in excess of standard infill projects, the small neighborhood sort of things. And I'll also say in our master plan, we do have a subdivision identified already with reclaimed water um, connection availability, and that's the Oakley Village area. So I would recommend other areas to expand, particularly when it involves expending city money to do that. I think there's some lower hanging fruit. Let me ask you, is there, is there a way to extend the line along Jasmine from the North Lake development to those houses further north? There would be. Uh, I estimate that to be about 5,000 feet. We run it all the way up to the top of that area. And I think that that would be a costly thing. I also understand that they're unincorporated. They're not in the city right now. I think we have, as I mentioned earlier, some some areas within the city that could use the reclaim water as well and um, much closer to connect to. Well, I mean, kind of looking ahead in the future, um, wouldn't it be smart to ask for an extension if this second, again, it's all predicated on this second access um, off Hayes to Jasmine to have that, whether it's the line is charged or not. I mean, rather than, or at least, um, uh, establish some kind of an easement where we could actually drop a line in later and connect it to the uh, development's reclaimed water line. It, an easement, that, certainly, yes. I just would hesitate to spend any city money on infrastructure going to that area. Um, it really depends on the interest in reclaimed water. As you probably know, our current ordinances don't require people to connect. So we're making an investment on speculation if it is a city investment. Okay, so easement is okay in your view? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trash. You're welcome. So, uh, Mr. Armstrong, do you have any questions of uh, Mr. Smith? Thank you, Ms. Graham. Do you have any questions of Mr. Smith? I don't know where she went. Uh, oh. We just all reclaim now. I'm sorry? Reclaim now, right? We're gonna move on to the other utilities. It's whatever they're gonna testify to. I don't know what they're gonna testify to, so. So, Ms. Graham, do you have any questions of Mr. Smith? No, sir. Okay. Okay, well, that being said, if there are no other questions, um, we can move on to the next witness. It's my understanding that someone from FT... I'm sorry. Trask, yes? I, I have questions on uh, sewer and potable water. Okay, do you want to ask them of Mr. Smith now? If that's who is Absolutely, he's on the stand. Or... That'll keep us from having him come up and down. So if you okay. have those questions, let's do that now. Yes. Okay. Um, on sewer, um, I, I understand what the current plan calls for, uh, the preliminary development plan, running it down Live Oak Street from the, the current site to the uh, treatment plant. Um, is that line upsized to accommodate any other expansion along that way that may be needed, Mr. Smith? I think that line would have some additional capacity. It is a four inch line, as I understand, as proposed. And based on the number of units, I think it can easily carry that demand and uh, leave us some options later on, depending on what's being forecast. But I also see us having some capacity on that Live Oak force main. It's a six inch force main serving that area. So it really depends on what comes along in the future, but I think we do have options. Okay. Other than adding additional diameter to the line. Correct. Okay. Um, <clears throat> was there any um, discussion of, besides this option of carrying it down live stroke, of connecting it to some other offsite lift station, let's say off Jasmine? I believe there's, um, there's a lift station near North Lake at the north side of North Lake. 
Yes, I know staff looked at that and due to the number of units, the amount of wastewater produced, um, it was recommended and reviewed with our own consultants that um, they have their own dedicated force main. Okay. Um, does that include uh, the capacity? I, I know you can upsize lift stations and things like that. And then beyond that, you have to look at the diameter of the force main. Um, but beyond the, the number of homes that are already hooked into it, um, is there capacity for hooking in homes that are not on septic further to the north, regardless of whether they're uh, in the county or not, say Sail Harbor? Yeah, and as I mentioned before, I would see two options with that. One, this new force main proposed, and also the Live Oak six inch force main. It would have to be designed, but I think between those two potential uh, connection points, I think that could be accommodated. That second line go along Jasmine to the north? The second line uh, is on Jasmine, I mean, sorry, Live Oak itself, but it does not go any further north. So what would you would propose, running a second line across US-19 down um, uh, to the uh, east and along Jasmine over towards these other homes that are not served? north of North Lake? I actually know what I would propose in this case, and I'm just talking conceptually, is um, something coming down Jasmine itself to Live Oak. It's quite a long run, but it certainly could be done if that was the design plan. Well, given that we may have, you know, we may or may not have a second access, let's say off Hayes Road, and, and this was one of the problems I've had so far that the development was pretty much designed and what we're talking about right now is being designed around that. Um, was there any, is there any value to, let's say, uh, rather than a private list station, making it a public list station through some sort of an easement to the east of the project, let's say along the Hayes Road area and, uh, and upsizing that and uh, not just accommodate the, um, the, the, the apartment complex that we're talking about right now, but any of the additional capacity that might be needed at the north end of Jasmine. Was that been discussed or thought about? No, it hasn't been discussed. I'll tell you one concern I would have with that. We already have um, a situation along 19 of city invested sewer that has been in place since the 90s that we're having trouble getting people to connect to it. Why it wasn't required in the very beginning, I don't know. But once people are on septic tanks, our experience has been it's not an easy sell. Um, so to oversize a force main, to speculate that we could get people to connect in the future to it, all the while having an oversized force main, you know, in itself is problematic. You have to maintain certain minimum velocities to keep it from getting clogged up. And uh, so that means, you know, very large pumps operating on something to possibly add something in the future. It's just not, um, it's not something that I would readily uh, recommend there. Uh, I think there is a way to make that, that area served, um, but doing it that way, I'm not sure is the best way. Have we looked at that? Have not looked at it. Okay, that answers the question. Um, that's what I have on sewer on potable water. Uh, the potable water for the apartment complex is going to be uh, serviced by what direction and where? I don't have that detail in front of me. Um, I, I recall it, it comes off of 19. And I believe it comes in that main entrance off 19, if I remember reading the plans. Okay, I'll, I'll save that one as well as some of these others for the uh, applicant. But um, I know that you've always been big on maintaining the quality of our potable uh, water. And I also know that we've had some issues with dead end lines. And um, I don't, I haven't looked at, so far all we've got is a spaghetti diagram of how these uh, potable lines are gonna be looked at. Um, what do you know what we have off Jasmine as yeah. far as water? I can, um, if this helps, I don't know if you can see this diagram. I know this is pretty low tech the way I'm doing this, but if I'm pointing here, this is 
Jasmine heading up, you can see the Sail Harbor area. It's a looped type system. So we do have some looping that happens there. Um, here's Live Oak down here. Is this helpful at all to you? This is Live Oak and then heading up to serve Sail Harbor. That's an eight inch main going up that way. Well, what about extending and cross connecting into that with an apartment complex? So we have at least some cross circulation. So there's no dead end. Is there any value to that? I could see, yes. I, I wouldn't stand and tell you that there's never value to circuits in uh, water systems, that's for sure. Um, yeah, that would be a benefit. Okay. I think we did sewer reclaimed potable. Thank you, Mr. Smith. That's it. You're Thank welcome. You. Based upon those questions, Mr. Armstrong, do you have um, anything of Mr. Smith? Okay. Ms. Graham, based upon those questions, do you have any cross-examination? Okay, thank you very much. So we'll go ahead and move on to the next witness. It's my understanding that someone is here from the Florida Department of Transportation. Do you want to introduce him, Renee? Uh, let me try. Okay. Uh, Joel Provenzano, are you on the line? Yes. Okay. So I'll let you introduce yourself and, your, um, your, and what your function is at, FD, at FDOT, please. Okay, before we do that, Mr. Provenzano, I want to make sure that you've been sworn under oath. Did um, did you take the oath when I gave it earlier? Did you raise your right hand or do, you, do I need to swear you in? Um, I did. I did take it. Okay, thank you. If you could go ahead and proceed then. Okay. Uh, my name is Joel Provenzano. I work for the Florida Department of Transportation, a state agency that oversees all the state roads, uh, US-19 being one of those state roads. My role with the department is I am currently the access management administrator and the senior traffic engineering specialist. And I am with district seven and I work out of the specifically out of the traffic operations office. A little bit of background on my expertise. I've been in the civil engineering field, site development and public uh, transportation for about 20 years and specifically about 17 years has been in the traffic operations field. Um, so basically I am the driveway, median opening, traffic signal, turn lane guy for the department. And I oversee a five county uh, jurisdictional area, including Pinellas County. Okay, Mr. Provenzano, have you had the opportunity to review this application? Do you have any comments on it? I have had an opportunity to review it. Um, the uh, site, the engineer working for the developer has met with us um, a few times to go over their concept, what's being proposed. And um, FDOT is in favor of the proposed turn lane design and the driveway design and placement. And we find that uh, not only is it innovative, that it is consistent with the latest national and state um, traffic safety initiatives. Okay. Is there anything else that you wanted to comment on? Um, after uh, reviewing the traffic from the drone footage and also being uh, familiar uh, with this area um, and knowing the traffic in this area, that we find that we believe um, there will be adequate gaps uh, because of the signals, um, let's see, to the north, Beckett Way, which is about 2,300 feet to the north, and also the signal to the south at Spruce Street, which is about 2,700 feet to the south, um, that this is, basic, this is almost a closed system, meaning that there's no major um, side streets. The only side street in between those two signals is uh, Live Oak Street, uh, which is uh, just to the north of Spruce Street. But Live Oak doesn't really add a lot of traffic to the US-19 system. Basically, what that means is when the signals to the north and south are activated, the gaps that are created there by stopping north-south traffic on US-19 translates to gaps directly in front of this site. So we believe it'll operate safely and efficiently and a review of the traffic shows that it should operate at an acceptable level of service. Um, and that means that uh, all motorists uh, should be able to successfully uh, negotiate this. Um, and we also find that the design is 
a very good design for promoting safety, much better than a traditional full median opening, which has lots of conflict points. This design um, has, I believe, about uh, almost a third of the conflict points as a traditional full median opening design. And conflict points are uh, what create crashes. Is basically all it is is probability. The more conflict points, the more opportunity um, for vehicles hitting one another, the crash rates go up. The less conflict points, the crash rates go down. So that is that is our finding of their proposed design. Thank you. There may be some questions for you if you can just hang on just a moment. Does anyone on the sure. commission have questions? Yes, um, I do, uh, Mr. Trask. Okay, Mayor, why don't you go first? Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Pro, uh, Provenzano, thank you for being on the call. Uh, this has been one of my uh, concerns is the traffic going in and going out of the uh, development. Mm -hmm. uh, the first question I will ask is the applicant requested to have two uh, access points to the development, but he was only um, uh, actually uh, awarded one. It was only recommended to have only one. Is there any way you can tell us why you only recommend to have one? instead of two? Um, so my understanding that the rear access that would have connected over to uh, Jasmine Avenue. So typically when FDOT is looking at how a development is connected to the overall roadway network, whether it be the state roads or the local roads is uh, typically DOT uh, recommends actually having additional access points. If we find that that would keep traffic from having to go onto a main road. So if there's a grocery store located off of a local road behind the development, we would try to make sure that there's an access point to that so vehicles can get from the development to wherever they're going without having to get onto the main road because obviously that reduces volumes on the main road. Now this particular development, when I looked at the roadway network, I noticed that there wasn't really anything on the local network other than additional homes and residences um, that people of this development might be trying to get to. And that if they're to going to any type of um, a commercial establishment nearby that they would still have to get on the main road. Now, what I was able to determine was that obviously this driveway will operate at a good level of surface for the traffic that is being generated by this development. What I do not know is that if the development were to exit out the rear onto Jasmine Way and then uh, subsequently to um, uh, Spruce Street or Mellon Street at Keystone Road where there's a full median opening or Jasmine Avenue at uh, Tarpon Avenue where there's also a traffic signal down there, I do not know if the additional traffic from this development going towards those intersections via the local roads, if there's gonna be any adverse impact, I do not know if those intersections are gonna be able to handle uh, the additional traffic. Um, so I can't comment specifically on that, but what I do know is that their driveway will be able to handle their proposed traffic. Thank you. Uh I have uh, another question. The uh, the five second gaps. It was mm -hmm. calculated uh, in uh, uh, if I, in December, I believe. Uh, do you think that uh, that can be improved, or you think it's going to get worse during the winter months, when the traffic is going to be uh, much larger? So that's kind of what I was stating about um, the traffic signals directly to the north and to the south of this proposed driveway and median opening um, is that the gaps that are provided by those signals uh, will directly translate to gaps in front of this development. So instead of this development needing its own traffic signal, it would be able to benefit from the very large gaps in traffic created by the northern traffic signal and the southern traffic signal. And we believe that five seconds is an adequate um, time to be able to negotiate three lanes of traffic um, shooting over into the median or making the U-turns. Now, what I am aware of is that uh, the traffic um, engineering team for this development met with me and expressed that they had even increased it from five seconds to um, a greater time frame than five seconds, but I had uh, told them that we FDOT believed that five seconds was 
was adequate in anything that was shown above five seconds, like a seven second or even a 10 second gap was very, very conservative. That if, um, if, if it could be shown to work in that, then in the real world, it will 100% work. Uh, thank you. You have mentioned about the, uh, the two traffic lights that we have, one in mm -hmm. the south, one in the north. Yes. If those two traffic lights are being better uh, synchronized, you think that's going to help the uh, five-second uh, gaps or the accelerator band and this max? Um, well, it's our understanding that they that they operate pretty efficiently today. I can't speak directly to how exactly those two signals um, are synchronized, but what I could say was that since there's no, there's no what we call added traffic between the two lights, like there's no major east-west cross street between those two traffic signals, um, that the only traffic is from some minor driveways between there that like when, when those lights stop the north or south traffic, that they would be able to go. Now, you actually may not want them to be completely coordinated because you got to remember what's being proposed here is the ability for a vehicle to turn out of this development, head, let's say they uh, want to go south on US-19, they have to make the right turn and they have to go north into the U-turn lane. So they'll need a gap in northbound traffic in order to do that. And then they'll get to the end of that U-turn lane. They'll make the U-turn to head back south. And so they'll need a gap to do that. Now, if those gaps were to occur at the same time, um, they could actually miss out on that window of opportunity because it takes time for the vehicle to make the ride out go the 400 feet distance in the U-turn lane and then be prepared to make um, a U-turn. So what this might actually do is allow vehicles to get out, to stack in that middle turn lane or the U-turn lane and then wait for the southbound gap to arrive. And then when the southbound gap arrives, then they can make subsequent U-turns. And, and typically what we find is that it wouldn't, won't just be one lone vehicle making the U-turn, that there might be uh, maybe three, maybe up to four vehicles sitting there waiting to make a U-turn. And if they get a, a 30 second gap in traffic, that's enough to clear uh, four vehicles waiting to make the U-turn. And as long as they're not uh, waiting an unreasonable amount of time to make that U-turn, that's what we call the level of service. So if it's really bad, it's an F. If it's super great, they only have to wait a, wait a couple of seconds on average to make the turn, then it's an it's a, um, it would be like level of service A. So this is not expected to operate at a deficient level of service, uh, even if there are multiple vehicles waiting to make the U-turns. Um, based on everything that we've seen, they should be able to make the gaps. And especially my review of the drone footage um, assured me that that assumption was going to be correct in the real world as well. And yes, we do understand the traffic might be greater um, uh, with in season, but uh, DOT, you know, we we account for that. We know what our peak uh, peak season factors are going to be, and just by looking at the traffic, um, we can tell that it should be okay. Thank you. You just answered the next question that I had in regards to the uh, level of service. Mm -hmm. uh, I have one more question to ask you. Uh, in your professional opinion, do you think by build by um, developing this? Uh, uh, this project that will create in any safety concern to the traffic on US-19? Um, well, the only, the only safe road is a road without cars. Um, so what we have to do is any intersection, any turn lane, there will be crashes. Even with the traffic light, there will be crashes. The question is, how many crashes are there going to be? Um, that's why I was saying that this type of design with the reduction of conflict points, we believe that the proposed design is the safest design possible and should um, create the lowest number of crashes possible while still allowing this development to take place. Uh, thank you for answering all these questions because traffic was one of my concerns. Thank you so much, Mr. Trask. You're welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Commissioner Donovan, you had questions? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Trask, and thank you for your presentation. Several of my questions were just answered, so I'll try to make this as simple as possible. Do you believe that a secondary access point is necessary at all, or are you completely satisfied with the single access point on US-19? 
uh, FTOT is completely satisfied with the single access point off of US 19. We don't see any benefit to us or to the total site or local uh, traffic circulation pattern, like I was saying, because it does not appear that there's anything um, commercial that would be more easily accessed by having um, the ability to access Jasmine Avenue, which is the main north-south road. Um, so for those reasons, DOT is perfectly fine with the one access point. Okay, thank you. Are you have questions? I've got a question for you, Joel, a couple of them actually. Um, <clears throat> so is there a requirement for the application? Is the DOT making a requirement for these to be installed for the application to be, uh, or for the applicant to break ground? Yes, in order to receive a driveway permit for us, in order for them to construct in our right of way, they will need to construct these um, turn lanes, modify the median, construct the driveway and the subsequent right turn lane into the driveway. And all the U-turn lanes will all have to be done in order for them. And those have to be proposed, uh, full engineering plans submitted before uh, we sign the permit for them to work in our right of way. But why is that a requirement? Is it a, is it law or is it just um, preference or how does that work? Yes, that that that, that is or? that is per uh, state law and specifically per Florida Administrative Code fourteen ninety six and fourteen ninety seven. And that's fourteen dash ninety six and fourteen dash ninety seven. Okay. Um, I've seen these uh, 19 shut down, uh, if it's a U-turn or left-hand turn. Uh, why would we see these shut down in other parts of US 19? Uh, can you clarify the question a little? What do you mean by so, shut down? Um, so I've seen left-hand turn shut down, um, so completely closed Okay. Um, on US 19. What would cause that to happen? Is it a certain amount of fatal accidents? Is it a certain amount of non-fatal accidents that happen at the intersection? Um, help yes. me understand. So um, DOT, my department specifically, uh, may look at the crashes and review the crashes to see if there is an issue. Um, the number one reason why we shut down left turn lanes at a directional median opening is because of something called the Good Samaritan crash type, basically where we have a continuous right turn lane that might run all the way to a traffic signal and it might be hundreds of feet long. If we have a left turn lane in a directional median opening within the area of that continuous right turn lane and vehicles have to turn left across the right turn lane in order to get to a side street or a commercial driveway, what might happen is the vehicles on the main line may be backed up from the red traffic signal while vehicles in that right turn lane are still free flowing all the way to the traffic signal. And when a vehicle turns left, the quote unquote good Samaritans will create a gap for vehicles like they'll stop and they won't block the median opening allowing the vehicles to make the left in front of them. But if they get hit by a right turn, a vehicle coming down that right turn lane, that's what's called the good Samaritan crash. And if we get a bunch of those type of crash types, then we might close a median. Other examples of closing uh, medians would be if there's a lot of fatal crashes or a lot of angle crashes, we typically look for a performance measure of around five angle crashes per year. So if it's greater than that, um, then we will modify uh, the median openings um, after a uh, public hearing process, or if a developer is coming in that area and generating a lot more traffic, and we believe that the problem may get worse, um, we may require the developer as part of their permit to modify the median openings. Okay, so DOT is more reactive in this in that aspect then. Yes, but with but with a design like this, uh, we we've been working directly with the developers, the developers engineers engineer. um, in order to come up with this design in a proactive sense because we believe that this design will be much more safer than a traditional full median opening. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm aware there's no full median openings in North Pinellas on US-19, so. Correct, um, correct. So, okay, um, have you evaluated at all the, the, I guess the crest of the overpass of the bike trail and the amount of space between the U-turn going 
to northbound. I, so it would be northbound traffic um, coming down um, the overpass of the bike trail. And then where the U-turn is being proposed, is there enough line of sight with the speed traveled? Uh, has that been evaluated at all? Uh, do you understand what I'm talking about? So are you so referring to the northbound U-turners being able to see vehicles coming southbound over the bridge? Uh, it would be the other way. So you'd be coming from Spruce or the Ford dealership going north. Um, okay. And it would be southbound vehicles making a U-turn going north. Let me, uh, let me see. I have my Google Maps open and I'm dropping down to look. I, I didn't note any type of specific, um, what we typically call a vertical sight distance challenge. Um, even looking at it right now on Google Street View, it appears, judging by how far back I can see the vehicles coming over the crest of the bridge and with an understanding of the street view camera being mounted at around the height of a, a semi truck driver's eye point of view and knowing that in reality, it's actually lower than that. It still is consistent with what we typically look for as sight distance. And it, se it does seem to exceed the amount of sight distance that's needed. We got a question. Uh, you know, I'm not yeah, too. So, familiar. in my professional, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, you're good. I was. I was just going to say. So, in my professional opinion, I don't see any issue with the sight distance. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I've got a couple more questions. Uh, since the traffic study was evaluated, or the videos were taken in December of, I think, this past year. Um, I've been working from home myself for the past nine months, and I know a significant amount of other individuals have too. Um, if, if traffic goes back to normal, as I come to Tarpon Springs, I typically take a left on, uh, Klosterman, Martin Luther King or Tarpon Avenue. I don't typically venture North. Um, when I get to Klosterman, Martin Luther King and Tarpon Avenue, there's typically a ton of backups. Um, mm -hmm. are you aware with your experience and history of US 19 of many backups from Beckett way? towards Spruce at all? And do you foresee any issues getting out of the complex uh, during rush hour um, of this project? Um, I, I don't, and from, an, from a spacing standpoint, and I know I kind of gave those distances earlier, but I will just um, restate them again. So DOT looks for ideal spacing. And what that means is the most ideal spacing we can typically hope for for any connection point, whether it be a development or a major side street is half a mile. And since Beckett Way is 2,300 feet to the north, it exceeds the half a mile. And uh, Spruce, the next signal to the south is 20, uh, 2,740 feet to the south, then that also exceeds the half a mile. And even the closest side street, which was Live Oak, uh, is still uh, 2,150 feet to the south. So we're still also looking at a half mile. So this is actually the most ideal situation that we can hope for. And we rarely get this type of good spacing um, for a development um, for all the sites I review. And I review a couple hundred uh, commercial sites every single year. Um, so this is, uh, this is pretty rare. And the opportunity to do the type of design that they're proposing without it impacting any other intersections or any other commercial driveways is also pretty rare. Okay. Um, my last question is gonna be around uh, some type of signalized uh, red, red light sure. uh, at the U-turn. Um, so, let me just uh, explain this a little bit more. I understand that you've got a significant amount of experience in, in engineering and traffic engineering. Um, so initially when I talked for the first reading, I brought this up um, and my thought process was, is that it would be a red light at the U-turn to prevent those cars from going across traffic or attempting to go across traffic uh, when uh, the southbound light at Beckett is green and then when the northbound light at spruce is green so um ultimately what it would do is when the light turns red at beckett for the southbound traffic uh the cars that are waiting to make a u-turn onto the southbound lanes mm -hmm. they would have a red arrow and then once that 
uh, I don't know if it'd be 30 seconds, or whatever it is, the, the red arrow would then turn into a yellow blinking arrow um, that would allow them to move um, or do the U-turn at that point. Is that anything DOT is evaluated uh, anywhere else in the county or in the area? Is this something that potentially could add some additional safety features? Um, and, and, and I'm more looking for protecting the individuals that are going north and south um, on 19. And then uh, because when I'm doing this, uh, there's always those times where you see people making a poor judgment and thinking they have enough time, but then they sure. end up getting slammed and cause an accident. Um, sure. And that is a great question. And let me just explain um, why uh, U-turns are a little bit safer than regular turns, just as a little bit of background information um, before I fully answer your question. So um, what we're expecting here are the vehicles to make U-turns unsignalized. And as you stated, your concern was that, well, if it's if it's unsignalized, will they have a difficult time negotiating that? Will they misjudge the gaps that they have in approaching traffic. And in what we have found, I used to be the districts, uh, before I was hired by the state, I used to be the district's uh, safety, traffic safety consultant. That means for four years, I evaluated issues exactly like that. And what I found and is also consistent with the national understanding is that when a driver is required to make a U-turn, is that to the driver, it actually seems like a more dangerous maneuver. The reason is because that they know that they're going to be exposed to oncoming traffic for a longer period of time. Whereas for like a left turn, they know that they can just quickly shoot the gap and accelerate and be out of danger very quickly. Now, the driver's understanding that they're going to be exposed for a long time, that's what actually inherently makes that movement safer. And the crash data supports that. It is incredibly rare that we ever have any type of intersection with a what we would call a U-turn crash problem. Because typically, the motorist will wait for larger gaps in traffic before they make the U-turn because they know they're going to be exposed for longer. Um, and even aggressive drivers are shown to wait longer. So in all of my reviews of all um, intersections that require traffic to make U-turns that are unsignalized, um, we have only found one in the entire Bay Area that we would consider to be unsafe, where there was actually a U-turn crash problem. But that had another reason why, is because all the vehicles that were making the U-turn in order to get back to a signalized side street had to then cross all three lanes of traffic after they made the U-turn in order to get to the left turn lane to make the left at the traffic light to get back to the community that they were trying to go to. So because they had to cross all those lanes of traffic, they were exposed even longer to the oncoming traffic and they misjudged it. So here we would not recommend adding a traffic signal because like I stated earlier, we're always gonna have crashes anytime we have an intersection. And whenever you signalize something, you will have crashes. You will have rear end crashes due to a signal. The question becomes, if we don't have a signal, will the crashes be worse? So then we evaluate it to, to that performance metric. Um, based off of the amount of vehicles that are being proposed here, how many are gonna be making the U-turn in the peak hour, how many gaps are being shown and what the level of service is being shown. Uh, we believe that not having a traffic signal at this location will be safer than having a traffic signal. We would actually expect more crashes with a traffic signal uh, because with U-turn type maneuvers, even if there is a crash, we typically find that it's not that severe, that it's a very minor fender bender and the rates are incredibly low. Like the number of crashes that we expect per year might be very low, maybe one or two um, per year at the most. But with a traffic signal, especially along a busy corridor like US 19, just the number of rear end crashes alone could easily be over 20 per year. So we have to weigh that benefit. Um, and obviously, if 
fatal crashes were to start occurring or severe injury crashes were to start occurring for some reason that we can't anticipate now, but again, we don't see any reason why that would happen, then we might consider um, signalizing it at that point, but there has to be justification uh, for that. Um, because again, everything boils down to the amount of crashes that we would expect. Okay. Um, just for clarification, did you understand that it would just be a signal for the, the individuals in the U-turn lane? It wouldn't be a signal for the traffic going north and south? So, uh, so according to the national standards on the MUTCD, in order to turn vehicles across other traffic lanes, um, you you are required to stop the approaching traffic. Okay. Um, if you signalize the turning movement, you do have to signalize the main movements also. Okay. I have no further questions right now. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Commissioner Vaticiotis. Do you have questions? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Trask. Uh, good evening, Mr. Provenzano. I've got a number of uh, questions and some of them may sound a bit pointed to you, but I'm actually trying to uh, understand this access management for the city a little better for myself, actually, and then um, maybe it'll help with some others as well. And I don't mean any more into it than just what the question is. So um, sure. if you could bear with me. Um, I'd like to know when the earliest was that your division or department met with the applicant for this site? Um, I believe it was actually in the fall of 2019, if I recall correctly, because I remember we were not into the pandemic yet, and it was before that time. Um, and I met with them in person along with our um, FDOT uh, Pinellas office permitting staff. Okay. Um, how many times have you, have you yourself met with them? Uh, we have had, I believe, two in-person meetings that I recall, and we have also had about three virtual or telephone meetings. Okay. This included you as well? That's correct. I've been part of all of them. Um, during those meetings, um, let's see. Oh, um, and, and on, on, during those meetings, at some point, it was decided that this single access would be adequate for the site. Do you know when that was? It was during the first meeting. The idea was brought up uh, with the applicant because it was something that was a newer state and um, federal safety initiative. And we had brought up the idea with them. They agreed with the idea. They saw the benefit of the idea. Um, because we did not have the ability to really do a full median opening because like it was stated earlier, we don't have any other full median openings um, along this corridor that are not um, that are not unsignalized. And so one of the big concerns was that even with a traditional bi-directional median opening, that the only way for vehicles leaving the site to go southbound would they would have to drive all the way north to Beckett Way and get in that left turn lane and then make a U-turn to head back all the way down across the bridge. Um, but that violates FDOT's access management standards because we try not to send uh, traffic more than a quarter mile in one direction out of their way. So that way we're not adding more than a half a mile to anybody's particular journey when they're leaving a site. Um, so we didn't see that as being a viable option. So we kind of created this particular option, what you see today, out of necessity. Um, thank you. At that first meeting, uh, so it was FDOT's idea, is that correct? The soft set median opening? That Are is correct. Yes, that is correct. Were you given a gap study or what, what did you make that determination that that was the best option for this site? Um, a lot of it was professional experience and working with uh, crashes in median openings because uh, I've been with um, even when I was a consultant, I've been working for FDOT Traffic Operations Office since 2009. And uh, this is primarily what we do is study the safety of alternative intersection designs. And we're always trying to be innovative and find new, safer ways of doing uh, median openings. Um, and we had, uh, I've been recently working at the national level 
um, looking at uh, crashes involving motorcycles, even at traditional or bidirectional median openings. And um, even at traditional openings, we were finding vehicles still turning left in fr front of motorcycles was a problem. And, you know, how do we, how do we even solve that? And this idea uh, was floated by as not only being beneficial for reducing crashes with motorists, but being extra beneficial for reducing uh, crashes with motorcyclists as well. Were you given any analysis? Um, at the time, no, it was just a, a preliminary idea. Um, but part of our permitting process is that we require um, the development engineer, whoever is working on the roadway stuff, um, they, they are required to do the analysis and the traffic study to prove um, that the initial concept idea will work. So from that very first meeting, you were certain that this offset lane median opening concept was going to work? Yes. Based off of all of our experience and work along US-19, we were pretty confident um, that once they did the study, it would show that it would work. Did you know it was 404 apartments? That is correct. It, I believe it was assumed it would be about 400 even from the initial meeting. Okay. Was a second access ever discussed? No, the the sex the second access was not um, discussed with DOT. We typically only bring that up if DOT sees a specific need for a second access. But because we didn't for this site, it was not brought up initially. Okay, so all right. Um, so I, I I'm not going to put words in your mouth. So basically, there was no analysis uh, based on the, the FDOT's uh, decision. It was um, professional uh, experience, and um, and there was no discussion of a secondary access because you felt it was not needed. Um, it, that, is that correct? Yes. Is that a, or, During a, that summarizes the first meeting. Correct. Um, notwithstanding that, is there, and I, I suspect the answer is going to be no, because you probably haven't really looked at it, but it, is, is there any option for a second access on US-19 from this site? Um, an option for a second access on US-19 would not be advisable because we could not control the uh, vehicles the same way we could from a single access. It would increase the conflict points, thus increasing the potential for more crashes. Okay. Just out of general, um, how many days of traffic counts are typically needed to support a traffic light uh, application? Oh, for like a for like a traffic signal, we would typically look for like a, a three day count, uh, taking the worst case scenario, basically whichever one shows the highest peak movement, the number oh. highest number of cars counted in that particular day. That's what we would take for the analysis. Alrighty, um, so you were I, at least I, I, were you shown the gap study at some point? Yes, we have went I went over it in detail with the developer's engineer. And one day of data is enough, even during a COVID crisis? Um, yeah, so what there is a little bit of gray area when it comes to current traffic and COVID. But what DOT and my colleagues around the state have all agreed to is that we just are requesting traffic counts from today moving forward. We're not really looking at the historical rates. So what we're doing is we're, we're saying, just go do the counts today during a normal school day, um, see what the counts are, apply the normal growth factors that we would normally apply um, because we're still anticipating growth because uh, what we have realized is that the peak hours, which are the things we're primarily, primarily concerned with, the AM rush hour and the PM rush hour, those are not the same, nor do we believe that those will ever return to what they were previously just because of the virtual options a lot of office and professional workers now have. Um, so we, we don't think traffic is going to quickly return um, to what it was, but we do understand though that it's still not 
a lot lower than what it was previously. Like what the way businesses are operating today is the way we think that they're going to probably still be operating a year from now. Okay. So in the future, are you going to ask for more than one day of data for this to confirm a, a final permit or, or is this enough for you? No, or what we, what we do is we look to see how close they are to meeting uh, acceptable levels of service, uh, the gaps, all of that. And after reviewing this particular site, we don't, we have no concern that this will be able to adequately handle the traffic both now and into the future, because we're looking at the full build out. We're looking at the traffic from the full 400 units. And obviously they won't be able to build anything more on the site. So looking at that ultimate traffic and comparing it to what's out there today and seeing that, you know, this operates at um, a very good level of service because uh, we're not expecting massive growth on US-19 within the next 30 years like we would another road in an undeveloped county. Pinellas County is pretty developed. And so the growth factors are very little, um, even for a road like this. Okay. Um, there's a lot I can say about that, but that's not, that's for a discussion for another night. Mm -hmm. um, the, the applicant, um, their traffic consultant has submitted an updated report uh, where it's not just the um, gap study or gap analysis based on a critical gap, but there's something that they've referred to as a total gap duration. And that kind of gets into what you were saying that if you've got a, um, a, 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 let's say a 15 second gap and um, the critical gap is five seconds, then you can get three cars through there. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's what they're basing the total gap duration on. How often do you see or is a total gap duration used for uh, justifying or convincing you that, um, that the access management is satisfactory, the, the performance of it? Yes, it, it makes sense. And it's looking at it the same way that um, me and my colleagues would also look at it if we were studying um, an intersection or a median opening, you know, because we will sit out there, I'll sit out and observe traffic and look at the total gaps and I'll uh, get on in CCTV cameras, turn it toward an intersection, look at the total number of gaps of how long they are, how many cars can uh, fit through in those gaps. So the way that they're analyzing it is consistent with the exact way that we would analyze it too. Okay, so I, I'd like, thank you. I'd like for you to confirm what you said earlier that um, you would have questions concerning redirecting traffic, let's say off a rear site onto Jasmine and either onto Spruce or Jasmine Tarpon Avenue. In other words, you would have questions concerning whether those two lighted intersections could handle any additional impact coming from the site through that back entrance. Is that what you said? That's correct, because I don't have the level of service analysis for those other intersections, so I can't definitively say if directing traffic from this development to those intersections, if that will have a negative impact on those intersections or not. Okay, but you're satisfied without having seen the level of service analysis for this particular access that you were okay with that back in early in the fall of 2019? Yes, based off of our, all of our experience in reviewing similar sites to this all over the Bay Area, along uh, roads very similar to US-19 and US-19 specifically, we were pretty confident that what the developer would show in their traffic study uh, would work. Because I, I review all traffic studies for developments for the department. So that's one of my primary job functions. So I'm pretty used to what the results of those studies will show. Okay. And um... I know FDOTs, um, I've got a little experience with, especially with District 7, um, and you work by standards. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the five second uh, critical gap. Um, what, what do you, what 
standard do you base that on? I mean, I'd, I'd like to know what that is. I, I haven't been able to find anything for crossing three lanes um, in a 55 mile an hour plus. Well, typically we would actually, um, when our district, because we're a little bit more involved, we would actually go out in person and measure it ourselves to see if it would be acceptable in a normal vehicle using one of our DOT vehicles and just measuring uh, the, the gap acceptance manually, um, which is what I used to do a lot of when I worked out in the field. Um, you know, so the, the best way of doing it is actually going to the site and reviewing that specific site and accelerating from where the driveway would be across the lanes at a reasonable rate, not rushing it, and just seeing exactly how long that takes because different factors can affect every location. And so we can speak in generalities, but if it works for this particular site, then that's the best analysis that can be done. And like I was saying, uh, reviewing the drone footage was a great way to actually see um, traffic out here and how many gaps were created. And I believe there was even footage of a vehicle uh, making a U-turn. Um, and heading back to the south in front of the legendary tattoos driveway and seeing exactly how long it took the vehicle to do that. And I believe it was even a delivery van. So it wasn't even a passenger vehicle and just seeing if they could do that um, in an amount of time that was necessary in order to, you know, not have traffic coming up behind them, hit their brakes. And, you know, that, that's another thing that we look that we look for because drivers in every area are also different too. And how they react to vehicles turning in and off the roadway system is also different. Um, so I, I know that their traffic engineer will be able to explain a little bit more behind their methodology and exactly how we did it, how, how they did it. And all we do, DOT does is review because we don't do the studies for them. Like I said, they have to do the study we review it to make sure it makes sense. And if my team agrees that what they have proposed makes sense and we don't believe it's gonna cause any safety issue, then it's good to go. Because engineering, traffic engineering is ever evolving. And so we're always open of new, to new ways of doing the studies and new ways of looking at the data and new ways of evaluating the data. And the drone footage was actually a great new way of evaluating um, this particular intersection. So I'd actually applaud you guys for getting that footage. Okay, but that was not done until December. Right. Okay, so you don't have any standard that you can reference a five second critical gap. Um, I don't, the department does not have that five second is acceptable. Those type of things are normally left to our engineering discretion. Okay. Um, Just, this is kind of a loaded question. How, how much is FDOT going to um, uh, commit to paying? How, how much money are they going to commit, commit to paying for the uh, offset lanes that are being proposed? Um, FDOT is proposing no money outside of just our standard uh, review time for our staff reviewing what they have provided, reviewing their engineering plans, and also handling the processing of the permit. The applicant or the developer in this case is expected to pay for all of the offsite costs because they are the ones who are generating the need for the change. Um, and that's actually listed in the Florida state statutes that they are to be responsible for that payment. Right. I think that's it. Thank you, Mr. Provenzano. Thank you. Vice Mayor, you had another question? Yeah, Joel, I had a couple more questions I forgot to ask. Um, the left sure. turn that's currently there that goes into legendary tattoos, mm -hmm. um, is that going to be recommended by the FDOT to stay there? Or is that going to be recommended to be removed? So that would need to be removed as part of the proposed plan. So where you have that northbound left going into directly going into their driveway, um, that will be replaced with the southbound U-turn lane that will then go north into the project driveway. The way that anyone accessing the legendary tattoos parking lot, um, the way that they'll need to do it in the future is they'll need to drive past that current point, get into the northbound U-turn lane that's being proposed by the applicant, 
make the U-turn into the southbound right turn lane that then goes into legendary tattoos. And that's an existing southbound right turn lane that goes into the tattoo parking lot. Okay, understood. Um, and then the entrance is a gated entrance to the apartment complex, the proposed apartment complex. Is that something that uh, FDOT evaluates um, when deciding, I mean, is that, any, is that evaluated at all uh, for how much space is from the gate or the key code to uh, US-19? Yes, um, typically that is something that we look at. That comes from also engineering experience and looking at multiple other gated locations um, adjacent to state roads. And that's something that we review um, during our analysis and review of the plans is to make sure that it is set back far enough. I, I, I don't recall what the specific distance for this gate was, but I do recall that when I looked at the site plan, where it had shown it was not something that popped off the page as being too close um, to the state roadway that we needed to look at it further. But it, it is still something that will be reviewed. Okay, J just for clarification, that's something that's reviewed before the final approval is given then, right? That's correct. My office will review that. Right, thank you. I have no further questions. Okay, so Mr. Armstrong, do you have any cross-examination of Mr. Provenzani? Thank you. Ms. Graham, do you have any cross-examination of Mr. Provenzano? Yes, I do. Okay, if you could stand up to the microphone and uh, tell us who you are and who you represent. Good evening, Commission. My name is Jane Graham. I'm an attorney with Sunshine City Law. I represent concerned citizens of Tarpon Springs. And I have a number of questions for Mr. Provenzano. Good evening, Mr. Provenzano. How are you? Good evening. Okay. Um, you had mentioned that the proposed turn lane is safe. What data on accidents in the area have you reviewed? So when DOT does the corridor studies um, and when we change the existing median openings to be bi-directional median openings, we do before and after studies. And generally we look at the rates of crash reduction and the redate rates of reduction for serious um, and fatal injuries. And it's not only something that we do, it's something that our central office up in Tallahassee, um, the one who's in charge of all of the disciplines for each of the districts, they do these studies as well. And then they train, uh, train us on what to look for in what to expect in regards of reduction of crashes. And it's been proven not only at the district level, but at the state level that having um, uh, U-turn lanes or bi-directional turn lanes um, in lieu of a full median opening reduces overall across the board, greatly reduces the number of those type of uh, severe and fatal crashes. Provenzano, have you looked at actual historic data of accidents in that immediate area? Yes, yes, I have, um, in my time with the department, I have reviewed probably cro close to 300,000 individual crash reports, um, including along this entire section of 19, plus other major state roads all throughout the district to evaluate um, where there were problems and what type of crashes even occur at these locations after we modify them to make sure we understand the full um, safety uh, benefits and implications. Okay, and um, do you have any data with you right now to say how many accidents historically, like let's say in the last 10 years have been in this immediate area? Um, I mean, I have access to our signal four and our online crash data management system so I can I have the ability to pull crashes from a specific uh, year range or date range and see exactly how many rear ends side swipes angle crashes left turn crashes occurred we we have accessibility uh, to that data directly so in, in evaluating this proposal did you did you pull that data to look at past crashes no because this is a proposed improvement change. Um, it's not 
we're not modifying something that is a known safety concern, we're adding something um, to the system. So obviously in this particular area, we wouldn't necessarily have any rear end crashes because like we don't have a traffic signal here. Uh, we didn't expect that the legendary tattoos parking lot created any type of crazy crash problem. So uh, we didn't see the need to evaluate that. What we are evaluating is whether or not we believe what's being proposed to accommodate the development's traffic would add an unacceptable amount of crashes to the system and that we don't believe to be the case. And, um, and just to follow up to that, have you used any tools to forecast the frequency of collisions for this proposed intersection? No, the frequency of collisions is just based off of knowledge of other locations in the district that is um, similar to this and knowing that if we are requiring motorists to make a U-turn, is that the more safe option or the less safe option for this particular intersection? And we see it as being the more safe option, which we believe you know, the crash is to only be a couple uh, per year. Whereas like a signal here would easily create more than 20 per year on average. Um, could you tell me, you, you had mentioned this drone footage. Could you tell me again the specific dates that that drone footage was taken? Uh, I do not have the dates in front of me. I'm not the one who ordered it. Um, I think the city might have more specific information on that. But, but you would say it was in the last, uh, the last few months. That's correct, right? Yes, that is correct. Okay, and so that was taken in coronavirus time. That is correct. Now, in your experience, have, have you looked at how, you know, in the current COVID times, have the traffic patterns, do they look different than historic patterns to you? Yes, we have noticed specifically that the amount of traffic in the PM rush hour and the AM rush hour um, has been reduced. During the peak of the coronavirus, during full lockdowns, those numbers were reduced by almost 50% across the entire district. Um, but now it's anywhere between 70, um, 75% to 90% of what it was previously. It just depends on the area and how many um, like professional business class offices are in that area and whether particular intersections directly serve those type of complexes that have professional office workers or not. For this specific area mm -hmm. that you looked at, um, what if you could estimate what you think the difference might be? Um, if I had to take a guess at what the difference would be directly in front of this site, I would say that based off of the area, it's probably about 80 to 85 percent of what it was pre-COVID. Okay. How many conflict points exist on US-19 near the property today? So conflict points would just be the legendary tattoos driveway, which is currently a directional median opening with a single left in, right in, right out operation. So the left in um, has to cross uh, a total of four lanes, three through lanes and a single right lane. So the left end um, creates four conflict points and then the right out creates a conflict point and then any vehicles that make the U-turn from that left turn lane to head back south um, can also create an additional conflict point with the right out traffic. So we're looking at one, two, three, four, four, five, five conflict points. Um, you had mentioned that, you know, Pinellas County is, is pretty built out and, um, you know, <laughs> that definitely is a conversation for itself. Um, but have you considered how traffic patterns will change given the, the growth that's going on right now in Pasco County immediately to the north? So is the question about the change in Pasco County or Pinellas County? It's the change in Pasco County and how it might impact this area, which is just bordering Pasco County. Uh, for that, we have to look at total uh, regional 
volumetric analysis, which is not my department's direct purview. Um, we do have a department um, that does look at those particular things, so regional models. Um, I cannot speak to that because I am not an expert in the regional model forecasting. Okay, and and so it's it's safe to say that no one has actually looked at that in this particular proposed project yet. Uh, we consider this proposed project to be a very small drop in the bucket considered to regional models. We only start looking at regional models for developments um, when we have um, uh, developments of regional significance and this development does not rise to that status. And, and what do you base that on? Are there certain criteria that the department makes that um, decision? Uh, yes, but that is our other office that that's our planning office that looks at those particular things and planning office has not brought this particular development to my attention as being anything um, of regional significance, nor historically has any development like this a 400 unit multifamily been ever considered uh, development of regional significance. How do you characterize an unreasonable time for waiting for a U-turn? Um, an unreasonable amount of time, it's the typical level of service analysis. So that can either be evaluated uh, one of two ways. Um, there is the Synchro um, software that is most often used for analyzing U-turns at signalized intersections and HCMS software that is utilized for evaluating stop controlled intersections or intersections where you have vehicles stopping in the median, which would also just be considered like a stop controlled type of um, um, scenario. For normal people such as myself, um, mm -hmm. is there translating that into a number of minutes that you'd have to wait? Um, it, yes, it, well, we, we typically use seconds when evaluating the level of service and the, um, the applicant who actually did the traffic study would probably be able to share uh, what the number of seconds expected for any one of the movements leaving or entering the site may be. Okay, I just have one last question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, will these proposed changes, in your opinion, improve or worsen the level of service on US-19? Um, as far as the level of service on US-19, there is no change to the level of service of traffic. The added traffic will create a new level of service, but that new level of service only affects the added traffic. Basically, the traffic that is entering and exiting the site. But the level of service on US-19 is the number, is based off the number of vehicles that are served by the through lanes in each direction during the peak periods. We do not expect that to change. This project does not generate enough traffic that the percentage of change would be completely negligible. Okay. And, and what is the current level of service on US-19 in this immediate area? The, um, the applicant who performed the traffic study could answer that from the results of their traffic study. So you don't have that off the top of your head? No, I do not have it off the top of my head, no. Okay, thank you very much. That's the end of my questions. Right, thank you. It. Any other question, Mr. Armstrong? Do you have any additional questions? No? Yeah. Okay. All right, it seems that uh, we're done with Mr. Provenzano. Thank you, sir, for your uh, participation today. I, I think that we can release you at this point, so you don't have to hang on. Thank you for your time. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, um, now it's your time to put on your case. I think the city's witnesses are done. Not that Mr. Provenzano was a city witness, but we finished with Mr. Smith. Can you all hear me okay?
Why don't you raise that mic just a little bit? Um, maybe we can hear you a little bit. That's, I think, are probably better. Is Since this you're better? so tall. Yes. Thank you. Uh, if you can't hear me at some point, just raise your hand and we'll either readjust the microphone or I'll raise my voice or I'll make sure we get through to each other. Can you raise your voice just a little bit more? Okay. For me? How would you feel if I took my mask off? That'd be, that'd be better for me. <clears throat> Uh, excuse me, excuse me. Um, can you move closer to the microphone at all? How's this? That's better. Either that, or, um, Ms. Uh, Vice no Mayor, we can move them over to this uh, this microphone here. It can be a lot closer. I think that's going to be a better situation. If, okay. Why don't we do that? Then everybody can hear, and we don't have to have the face mask removed. Good evening, is this better? Yes. Thank you. My name is Ed Armstrong. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Hillward Henderson. We are located at 600 Cleveland Street, Suite 800 in Clearwater. I represent the Morgan Group, which is the contract purchaser. Uh, the Morgan Group is exclusively a multifamily home build, uh, builder. They only have apartment type products they have constructed over 2,000 units, managed over 4,000 units, with a value approaching $3 billion. The reason why I make that point is that this applicant clearly has the experience, the financial depth, and the skill to implement this project. Um, as you know, one of our applications is for RPD zoning. The RPD zoning in Tarpon Springs essentially invites a discussion between the applicant and the commission um, the most recent example being the Eagle Creek case on Klausman Road. And Ms. Tara Payne and I presented that to the commission um, last summer and fall. And you'll recall that discussion back and forth uh, about the project. At the insistence uh, and strong recommendation of Ms. Tara Payne and I, um, we explained to this applicant early on, and they were very quick to understand the profile and the sensitivity of this parcel in the city of Tarpon Springs, particularly from an environmental standpoint. And they were wonderful in working with us to help develop a plan that minimized the full extent possible the <coughs> impact on the environment. This is not the type of developer who played the game of, well, I'll submit a plan at 1,200 units and hope that maybe I'll get approved at 400. There was no gamesmanship in this application or this process. We came in from day one and they were committed on day one to putting their best foot forward with a very responsive plan. During our discussions with the commission, um, there've been a number of requests from the commission collectively for, um, I'll call it improvements to the project, suggestions, requests, requirements, things of that nature and a very long list of items if we add them all together. A whole long list of those requests coming from the commission to the developer are being satisfied to the developer. Now, that said, every transaction has an inflection point. And at some point, the project is hard to make financial sense of. If it's if the requests and demands become overwhelming. And unfortunately, the concern we have is that we're nearing that inflection point. And don't misunderstand me, we're gonna do everything we can to get to yes with this project. But there's one issue in particular that has us very concerned. And that's a discussion about re requiring the applicant to be responsible for the physical construction of Hayes Road. Um, now, the Morgan Group, this is important to note, 
can provide through impact fees and other concessions, significant financial support for the construction of Hayes Road, but um, it's unfe infeasible to expect the developer to be responsible for the actual construction of the roadway. Um, Ms. Terrapani will uh, be testifying later this evening in great de detail as to why that's unfeasible. You will hear significant testimony tonight from residents who are passionate in opposition to this case. And we all can respect their passion. However, under law, the commission is required to base its decision only upon competent substantial evidence, which are facts and not the opinion of lay people, regardless of how many of them come forward to oppose this application. Your analysis is limited to the facts induced at tonight's hearing and the additional facts contained in the record. And your application of the code sections that are pertinent to this case to the facts induced at tonight's hearing. Um, I just would note for the commission that it, uh, around shortly after one o'clock this afternoon, we received a 563 page email from Ms. Graham on behalf of her client um, with materials and content pertinent to tonight's hearing. We're gonna to respond the very best we can, but um, when we get a last second ambush of, of that type, it's very hard to respond in less than, you know, in less than five hours to 563 pages of content. Um, if you recall back at first reading, similar thing happened. One o'clock the afternoon of the hearing, more or less, or maybe later in the afternoon, there was an email sent in to the city saying, we haven't had a chance to learn about this project and uh, you must table it. And the commission saw through that request. Um, it, it's just, I, I assume if we have another hearing down the road, we'll get the same sort of thing. But honestly, uh, while annoying, the fact is that's not the reason to support our application. The reason to support our application is because we will demonstrate with overwhelming testimony that we meet the standards and criteria set forth in your code. That we meet the criteria for approval. Um, my first witness to present to you is Christopher Hatton. But what I would note um, for the mayor and, I, and Mr. Trask as well, um, in the submittal by Ms. Graham, uh, there's what is tantamount to testimony. And at the appropriate point, and you can tell me when that is, I would like to cross-examine Ms. Graham. Okay, with that, I'm going to ask Christopher Hatton to come forward and address the commission. That you were sworn in. You raised your hand and sworn an oath. I did. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Christopher Hatton. I am a registered professional engineer with Kimley Horn and Associates. Um, I have 29 years of experience in transportation engineering. Uh, born and raised in Tampa, so it's all been in the Bay Area. Uh, this October will be my 30th year. Uh, I received my bachelor's of science uh, in civil engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology in 1990, and then my master's in transportation in 1991. Uh, and I was actually very honored this past December uh, by the Institute of Transportation Engineers, the Tampa Bay chapter, to be named the Transportation Engineer of the Year. Uh, what I'd like to start off with, if we can get the, uh, is it gonna be up there or just? Hmm. Mark, can you switch to the, uh, there you go. Should be. Oh, okay. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Thank you. Um, when People may be confused a little bit, and I know I saw this in some of the uh, material that we received uh, today, uh, that transportation concurrency uh, still exists in the city of Tarpon Springs, uh, but, but that is not the case. Certainly tran uh, transportation concurrency, which we began back in the 1980s, uh, no longer exists in that same manner. Specifically in 2011, uh, the, uh, the Community Planning Act 
eliminated statewide transportation currency management systems. Um, specifically, uh, as part of that, and this is actually in your uh, Tarpon Sprig Code of Ordinances, uh, section 122.11 mobility management, uh, it states that in 2013, the Pinellas County MPO approved the Pinellas County Mobility Plan Report. And the intent of this mobility plan report was to replace local transportation concurrency program with a system that provides local governments with a means to manage the traffic impacts without requiring developers to meet adopted level of service standards. So while we will hear and I've seen information as it relates to level of service, A, B, C, all the way to F, um, that is not what basically the city of Tarpon Springs requires for developments. Back in May of 2017, they repealed the former, the city did, the field repealed the former 122.1101 uh, section, which pertain to minimum acceptable level of service standards. And instead, the transportation element in the comprehensive plan, which does show some operating deficiencies of level of service conditions, these now require applications of mobility plan provisions in order to manage the transportation impacts and to increase mobility through the use of mobility impact fees to fund transportation improvements. And then lastly, of course, transportation management plans, which is what significant amount of jurisdictions now require, are required specifically for the city of Tarpon Spring. Transportation management plans are required per 122.11.03 for development applications seeking to utilize development management strategies. And I know we presented earlier uh, in our first case, several of those strategies which are being performed or will be uh, basically offered if this development proceeds. I did want to get into, again, some background just because it's been uh, about a month since we were last here in terms of the transportation analysis. Uh, we did obviously work extensively with the city, their transportation consultant, as well as the Florida Department of Transportation. Uh, you heard earlier Mr. Provenzano, uh, his uh, excellent recollection in terms of the process we went through when we met with him earlier uh, and some follow-up meetings that we have had, which again is actually just standard practice for these types of developments. Um, the access that what has, has been talked about certainly uh, from the FDOT uh, in terms of uh, asking for and us agreeing to, to construct, which will be done adjacent to, immediately adjacent to the project, the offset left turn median opening, which will improve an overall safety as compared to a full or even a directional median opening centered on the project's driveway access. And again, to uh, just recount, this is a graphic that actually shows the AM and the PM peak hour project traffic and how the actual project traffic movements uh, will actually enter and exit the project for both the AM and the PM peak hour. And here is the location of the driveway AM peak hour, PM peak hour. And what's important to focus on on this AM and PM peak hour volumes is specifically a comparison, and this was actually shown in the original, our original presentation to the board, the comparable site analysis. And you will see that other land uses which could go on this site and their scales as compared to our proposed project of a 404 apartment units. What you will see here again is the 145 uh, trip ends, if that means it's an in and an out, and the AM peak hour and the 178 in and out during the PM peak hour compare very favorably to the shopping center uh, scenario, certainly also to the office building scenario. In fact, over 100%, in some cases, 500%. Now, what you will also hear as well, I saw in some of the information uh, talked about in terms of what is the, you know, the daily traffic. Well, the daily traffic, yes, for the apartments will be a little over 2,000. But for an office building, it would be 3,500. For a shopping center, over 16,000. And uh, comparatively, in terms of this site to the others, is very important to recognize. Now this is a graphic uh, certainly that uh, Joel spoke to as well, meaning in terms of conflict points, in terms of uh, existing median openings, in terms of what the FDOT has been trying to do, not only um, in Pinellas County, but across the district and certainly throughout the state is to actually reduce 
uh, the number of conflict points and thus increase safety. And what this is, is a, a graphic which basically shows a full median opening, the number of conflict points. And this is again for a six lane facility, very similar to what potentially could go in there if that was allowed. And again, that is certainly not the case here. But there's also the bi-directional, as Joel mentioned as well, which basically takes out through movements as well as left movements uh, exiting the site. Ultimately, what was being um, uh, suggested and recommended by the FDOT is the offset left turn median opening. And again, this is something, as Joel said, was being a very innovative and again, reducing conflict points. Now, something that I wanted to bring up as well was that, you know, in terms of data and the like from FHWA, I've seen, again, in the last day, 24 hours, a lot of information from um, information that was uh, uh, submitted to the city that talked about R cuts. And those are reduced conflicts or restricted um, median openings such as this. So we've seen a lot of information about the R cuts. We're not doing an R cut. We're doing better than an R cut. As Joel said, we are more innovative. <laughs> we are going to be more improved in terms of safety numbers, reduced conflict points than what even the R cuts are. And that's again being talked about in several of the uh, informations that we've seen. Now specifically, People talk about this, you know, in terms of media offset, which is again, confusing for some folks, but the whole idea is obviously to not focus the full median opening or even in that directional or R cut median opening at that location, to send it to another location. And we have a couple of examples here that we can show you. This is uh, the Crystal Lake Mobile Home Park, which again shows adjacent there. You've got this offset U-turn lane here. Got one at Sun Valley Mobile Home Park, very similar situation again. So these are not new to US 19. These are not new to the DOT. Again, my, my hat's off, I've, applaud, I've, I've worked with Joel for many, many years in terms of obviously, as we propose developments, the DOT proposes options and we actually try to get obviously because we all want something that's most in terms of safety and reduce conflict points. And that's what we're trying to do. Specifically, this is one that you know, Joel had talked about during one of our discuss uh, discussions uh, adjacent here to the Queen's Pizza again. Here's another one. This is just south of the site. So again, these are types that are existing. Now, what is kind of new in this case is that is specific, singular, basically uh, centered around our development with both an offset on the north and south bound. But as Joel said, it's the, it's the perfect opportunity to be able to do that. And then again, lastly, I know I saw some other stuff about residential and yes, residential developments. Here's the Sun Valley to be able to utilize this type of development as well. Now here's some information, and this is actually why we had actually originally brought up the R cut, even though we weren't able to present this at our last board presentation, we actually had a slide that talked about the R cut because the actual R cut, there's been pretty significant amount of safety data and research that's been done relating to the R cut. So we utilize that information, knowing all and well that our option, the option that the FDOT is requiring that we are committing to do is actually better. So with that in mind, you see here the improvements of just the, even the R cut, which again, we're doing better because we have the offset. The R cuts allow a left in here. This would be allowed in this case. As you heard from Joel earlier, that's not gonna be allowed anymore. They're gonna take away that northbound left uh, into the tattoo parlor. They're gonna require them to go up and do that safer U-turn. Again, 50% decrease in conflict points. And I think the most important part aspect, and I think Joel uh, spoke to this as well, is actually the severity of the type of accidents that we see. They significantly are reduced. 40% in terms of injury, and then a 70% reduction in fatal crashes. I know it was asked earlier uh, during one of the cross examinations in terms of uh, crash data that have been looked at. The three um, examples that we brought up in our uh, first slide that talked about the other uh, offset median openings, we looked at eight years of crash data. And in there, there was an, on average about only three crashes per year. 
and there were no fatalities at these. This is from 2012 to 2020. So, and, and pretty impressive knowing obviously the amount of traffic on 19. Now again, this is the uh, gap study. We conducted a gap study and I know there's been a lot of discussion about that. Are there standards, et cetera, and the like. And there really is no industry-wide standard. In fact, what you'll see here from the uh, MUTS manual, which is the Manual on Uniform Traffic Studies, which is produced by the FDOT, it actually says the best thing you can do is to actually do field data. So basically going back in the case if there's an existing right turn, if it, it put it this way, if our development existed as it did today and there was the offset, we could go back and see what type of gaps might be acceptable by the folks leaving. Seeing what that actually is, that would be quote unquote an acceptable gap. Well, we don't have that. We don't have that yet. But as Joel said, we did look at the drone video as well. And of course we collected our own data as well. So we had a plethora of data in this case. Um, but I did myself personally, I did a uh, field observation. And again, the MUTS manual asked for field observations. Obviously, we're, and we have an example that we'll show in just a second of a vehicle, a van, as Joel had mentioned as well, delivery van that was actually making a U-turn. So part of what we actually wanted to utilize in here, and this was a, uh, an actual part of that drone footage, which is looking south, that's a van right at the legendary tattoos um, driveway. And what you will actually see is this counter count down the basically time of the gap. And what this ends up being is about the van basically accepts about a six and a half second gap. So again, when we've used, and I'll get into some of the numbers in the next few slides, that the uh, van is actually gonna use as an acceptable gap about a six and a half second gap, which you'll see. And just a, uh, after this car, the countdown begins. Before the next vehicle comes. And as Joel said, the vehicle goes through, not slamming on the brakes, it was a gap. So that is ultimately, in a best case scenario, what you would actually utilize to evaluate what an acceptable gap is. So again, going to um, back, this was some of our original data. We had evaluated uh, a five second gaps. Now what we did was a very conservative one when we did our original study, because these individual gaps are just specific gaps. So for instance, if we have a 46 second gap, which we did early 7 a.m., for a 46 second gap, we basically just counted that as one gap and nothing more. So what you see during this for the gap study, excuse me, for both the uh, AM and the PM peak hours, this is the northbound direction. These are the gaps of greater than five seconds. And these are the needed gaps that are making those U-turns. Uh, we actually have acceptable number of gaps. Now, uh, I know one of the commissioners talked about you know, potentially saying, well, that's, that's not good enough. We wanna see 10 seconds. So we did evaluate 10 seconds. Now there is no statistical or technical backing for 10 seconds, but we wanted to put it up there. And what we actually see from a 10 second perspective is in three of the four cases, we do actually have enough cases. The one that we do not have is the uh, southbound uh, scenario in the morning scenario. Now, in addition, we did go ahead, and I think one of the commissioners also brought this up in terms of the gap duration. And I know you also heard from uh, uh, Joel as well that that is a, is a way that the FDOT also looks at gaps. And again, that is not as conservative as what we did when we did what we called individual gaps. So the gap duration, and the commissioner's right, and Joel's right too. Let's say if we have a 46 second gap, for instance, that we would actually say that for instance, it would be able to get four 10 second gaps in there. Wouldn't be able to get that six seconds, that would just be lost. But there are oftentimes in a development like this, you'll have vehicles queued up wanting to go out, whether it's a right turn or whether it's a U-turn. So we looked at that. Now we also put then here a evaluation of the seven seconds, which again was something that again from the MUTS manual and also some of the uh, evaluations that we did from the drone looking at that van, which again, we consider a you know, very good uh, operational as well. And again, what we see is that number of seven second gaps are greater than the need that we have for both the AM and the PM peak hour. And again, in the same scenario, the 10 second gaps 
that we evaluated using the duration meeting is still in three of the four scenarios, it is still acceptable. And again, this was a slide just because uh, I, I, I believe that uh, the uh, consultant for the city had already been on, so I knew she might not be able to be on, but this was basically the information when she reviewed the drone information that basically it was her evaluation in terms of acceptable gaps for the five saying that based upon the data that she had reviewed, this seems reasonable given the uh, drone videos. So I'll open for questions. Okay, are there any questions from the commission? I don't see any down there. Mayor, do you have any questions? No, sir. Okay. I've got one question. Yes, Vice Mayor, go ahead. Um, outside of a signal, uh, and that may be not as safe in your opinion, um, is this the safest option for this development, proposed development? I do believe it is, yes. And as Joel said, I actually believe it is more safe than a, a signal in terms of the number of conflict points and the number of uh, severe accidents that uh, it would reduce. If a second, um, let's say exit is added to the back of the property, um, do you foresee the demand um, exiting the property going down then? Well, I, again, a lot of it is driver perception. I know, again, Joel spoke to that as well. Uh, you have people that some people would see a five second gap. Some people would see a three second gap and be feel that is acceptable. Some can be see a 10 second gap and not see that acceptable. So that is driver perception. That's why we like to get field data in terms of whether or not that van would do it. I don't know the van. I'll just say what they saw. They, they saw that a six and a half second was acceptable. I'm sorry. I think I, you misunderstood my question. So um, there was a discussion about a Hayes road potential ad, right. uh, ingress egress, but I'm just saying, what if it was just an exit? Um, do, you, do you think the demand would be down if there was an exit, another exit opportunity that their demand would be down on US-19? I'm sure if some people would, I'm sure some people would, would use the Hayes Road, yes. Okay, thank you. From the commission, Commissioner Vatikiotis. Yes, I do. Uh, okay. Make this drop one more thing down. Good evening, Mr. Hanley. Good evening. Um, uh, Mr. Provenzano answered many of the ones that uh, I had, uh, kind of a technical thing, and, and uh, I'm not going to beat to death this gap uh, analysis and stuff. I know you can turn the apple many different ways as an engineer and kind of come to the same conclusion. I'm not saying it's wrong. I, I just know that that's always, a, and sometimes it's a good way to do. Um, the, the question I have is, is getting back to Mr. Provenzano, it was their idea to do the um, uh, offset median openings uh, for the U-turn. Was there any discussion? I guess, first of all, let me ask you, how earliest were you involved in this project? I, I know he, he said fall for 2019, but I think he meant May of 2019 based on- your, Correct, it was, your, yeah. Yeah, right, I think it was May, yep. Okay, so how early, how early were you involved in this? Uh, I was not at the first meeting with the FDOT, so I was not at that meeting but I was at the second meeting um, subsequent in 2020. It was Kimberly Horn? Part? Kimberly Horn was, yes, yes. It was one of my colleagues that was at the meeting initially. How, in how long was Kimberly Horn involved in this? Uh, since the beginning. So they were at the meeting back in, in May with FDOT. With Kimberly Horn. That was the first meeting with Kimberly Horn as well? Kimberly Horn, yeah, the meeting that we met with FDOT. No, I, I mean, how, what was the soonest you were um, uh, contracted with? Oh, I, I do not know that answer. Was it much earlier than? I, I, I don't, you don't know. The answer. Okay. One of my colleagues would have to actually answer. All right. During any of this time, as the far back as you can recall, was there a second access ever discussed, whether it was with the city or FDOT? Not to my knowledge. And as Joel mentioned, uh, FDOT usually looks at that in terms of uh, from safety and also alternative routes. So when they did not bring it up, and certainly they brought up the uh, offset and said that they thought it was adequate. That was exactly what we were thinking as well. And and how did we evolve, we meaning the city and yourselves, how did we, the applicant, how did we evolve to a waiver request on this? I'm, I'm um, just trying to understand. It, it I, seems like, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but to me, I'm trying to elaborate a little bit so you can kind of get just of what I'm asking. It, it seems to me that we didn't discuss um, a second access, or, you know, between the city and, and um, uh, uh, Kimberly Horn, and therefore, how do we make a second, I mean, a single access work, and we need a waiver? Um, is that 
pretty much the way you saw it? I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. Yeah, I'll, I'll let one of my colleagues speak to that, because um, honestly, again, I was involved. The, the part that I was involved in, certainly, is it related to meeting with the DOT. And ultimately, you know, once we had been in discussions with the FDOT, and the FDOT discussions were that, again, a single access on US-19 would be acceptable. I know that there were talks. I don't know when that is. Again, some of my colleagues can address that. But in terms of, and I'm sure they're, they will go into some detail in terms of some of the obstacles, in terms of the right of way and the like. But to no, no, our point, fine. we never did it because it was never again put out there as a requirement in terms of what the FDOT did. Mr. Trask, how do you want to handle that? You want the next person to come up so I can ask that question? Or? No, you're only going to be able to ask questions of those people that they present. If they don't present that witness and that question doesn't get answered, then there'll be a second person getting up. If, they, if they're going to present a second person, yes. You may not get an answer to that question. Okay. Okay. All right. Let me let me just. I know Mr. Armstrong's getting up, but let me just continue. And Mr. Armstrong, you can jump in there with Mr. Trask if you'd like. Um, okay. Um, I don't know if, if you were uh, given. There's a new uh, map, if you will. Um, October 16th, showing a different level of service uh, F that I asked for um, there to be some verification of that. Um, as far as the currency, whether it's on the table, um, we have our transportation comp plan policy 1.42, uh, which it says that the um, regulatory development, the land development regulatory system, I think you've discussed that, uh, shall include provisions to address development that's impact deficient roadways, including facilities operating at level of service uh, E and F and volume to capacity ratios of 0.9 uh, are greater to ensure that developments generate more than 51 peak hours trips. Um, does not occur without providing some mitigating improvements. So that's in our comprehensive plan. And um, so we have that as a policy, basically saying that, okay, if you've got a level of service F and you've got volume to capacity ratios of greater than 0.9, which you do have, and our traffic consultant pointed that out uh, and had a little bit of a mm -hmm. written discussion banting back, back and, and forth, forth on yeah. that. Um, and then we've got greater than 51 peak hours. So that's, that's the, I mean, peak hour trips. So um, we've got that. And then you make reference to House Bill 7207, uh, which was on page 27 in your TI. And I, I know what that is as well. It just pretty much eliminates, uh, kind of pulls the rug out from the uh, comp plan review by the state and, and some other things. Right. Um, so I, I'm just, from what I he see all of this put together, it almost sounds like um, local governments can determine their own transportation management plans. That's number one. But TARPON really doesn't have any um, that you've seen, I guess, except some language in the in the uh, in the modal um, mobility. Yep. Yeah, that was adopted, and the um, and, and that that you're really not required to do anything, but you're doing this um, offset median cut, and that should be sufficient, regardless of whatever else. Am, am I interpreting that wrong, or do I hear something? A little, you're, you're mixing the streams, if you will. One is more operational. The offset, the left turn median opening is strictly offset, and that is dealing with the jurisdiction for, in this case, it's FDOT. That is not basically more of transportation management strategies, which again, the intensity reductions, the density reductions, those are the, the basically transportation management strategies that we deal with, with the city of Tarpon Springs. And we have offered, I believe, eight of those. Right, and there's no, you, there, you feel that there's no need, because I know that our traffic engineering consultant uh, made some statement about maybe FDOT requiring some mitigating features uh, because of the uh, questionable levels of service and that. There, and I think you came back and said, well, there's no requirement to do so or not or in the seven year plan, I guess that there's ex any any improvements expected in that area. So uh, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get the sense of, is or, or what you saying that um, because and this is going to help me as a commissioner, because of the way our comp plan is written because of all these other things that have happened with this House Bill 7207, that sort of thing, 
that that is kind of a hole in the requirement for what you're proposing to do? I, I actually, I, I wouldn't call it a hole. I would say statewide beginning back um, probably not long after House Bill 7207, the Community Planning Act of 2011, several jurisdictions, and I would say it is, is grown in the last, you know, again, almost decade now since it was approved, have moved away from concurrency because of what 20, uh, the right. 2011, and they have now focused on mobility, which again, takes really the focus off the auto-centric focus that concurrency was for, for decades. And it brings in pedestrians, it brings in uh, transit, it brings in um, bicyclists and the like, and it focuses those types of mobility issues. Now, specifically to the city of Tarpon, again, they're not saying, throwing their hands up, saying there's nothing that we can do. Some of these strategies, for instance, the intensity reduction, the type of commercial use that could come on there, and we've shown a significant reduction there, the density reduction from 485 down to 404, those are real type from work, play, live kind of scenarios. That's kind of thing be in terms of what's being proposed on this site for recreation so people don't have to get in their car and leave to do something. So those are real strategies that are being asked of the transport or the, the city of Tarpon Spring of the applicants. So actually, I think it's a very strong um, ask in terms of what the city has. So uh, just are these philosophical statements on your part that you're getting at? With no, this is, I've, to, again, I've almost I mean, I'm 30 not sure years how, I'm, I'm more interested in the um, offset median cuts, which are operational. Sure. Yes. And it sounds like you're speaking of something more statu statutory. Well, I thought you were going back to what the city was talking about. So that that's the transportation no, no, I'm, management I'm, strategy. What I'm trying to get at is that you're not suggesting that that there's nothing more than we should be doing on this because you're doing you're taking care of it for us with these two um, uh, offset median openings. In other words, what you're suggesting is there's nothing else that's needed, nothing else that's required. In other words, if FDOT says it's yes. sufficient, there's nothing else that's required that, that I see in your code or in your transportation or in your comp plan that says we need to do. Is that pretty much it? And a concise way to say that linking the two that in terms of the access that we are in agreement with the access and that there are additional items that are being done, but they're not necessarily specifically operational again in this, in this case, they're transportation management strategies. Okay. Uh, let me continue on here. Um, you answered about how long you were working on it. Have you spoken to uh, hey, uh, to the Pinellas County? I know there were some references of it being county right of way and sort of thing. Has anybody reached out from the applicant side to Pinellas County and talked to them about the possibility um, of developing Hayes Road? I have not, but I'll have to turn that over to one of my civil engineers. I, I specifically okay. deal with the transportation right. plan and the analysis. Um, so getting back to kind of what Mr. Provenzano was, uh, I don't think he was hinting at, but I want to make sure that this is not what we're talking about. And, and um, you, would you say that one access is more safe than two, such as Hayes Road for this development? Uh, it's certainly hard to compare, like again, because we did not evaluate that access in Hayes in terms of, um, volumes in terms of details in terms of what that would happen as far as our traffic impact analysis so very similar to what mr provenzano said we did not look at where those would go those types of impacts we did look at the us 19 one as did your traffic consultant for the city and evaluated that and ultimately that's what we made our decisions on okay so i mean you would agree with him that the objective is to reduce crashes right uh, reduce conflict points and ultimately increase safety by reducing yeah, safety. I, I guess Absolutely. that's a better way of doing it is to sure. improve safety. That's that's the bottom line to whatever we do. You're not going to eliminate problems. You just right. want to minimize them. Absolutely. Is that fair to try, say? Try the best we can. Absolutely. Okay. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Armstrong. Do you have questions of Mr. Hatton? We're going to try to get you both on the same microphones. Okay, I'll stand okay. just over here. Okay. Uh, just one. Mr. Hatton, can you briefly address uh, how the COVID effect 
has uh, impacted traffic counts? Um, well, and, and, and I think actually uh, Mr. Provenzano was uh, was watching uh, very similar the same webinar webinar I was just recently when we uh, had an Institute of Transportation Engineers webinar with uh, the national president from ITE, which basically he was talking about the impact specifically of traffic. Um, well, as Mr. Provenzano mentions, and again, I have the same basic data. Uh, obviously, we are seeing overall reduced numbers about this time near the end of 2020. We've seen numbers go back to about 75 to 90 percent, depending on the specific areas. Uh, the one thing that um, I agree, and I've asked some of my colleagues, some of my industry partners, uh, is that obviously, uh, I, while I don't think ultimately um, there's going to be a, a an overall reduction in maybe daily trips, just because we've seen things like Amazon trips and deliveries go up, certainly while the other trips, the folks staying at home might um, be reduced. We do anticipate seen uh, ultimately really an overall reduction, at least for the initial until obviously growth grows uh, in the AM and PM peak hour where folks, again, working remotely can do that, are allowed to do that, uh, depending on, again, what industry they are, et cetera. Um, so from that standpoint, while we ultimately see that the number will be uh, uh, ultimately, again, hopefully back to, to normal and just in terms of what we would see, the benefit we do uh, actually see in, in this horrible pandemic is that probably those peak hours, those ultimate uh, impacts in terms of numbers will ultimately be reduced. Thank you, Mr. Hatton. If you can hang on just a moment. Ms. Graham, do you have any questions of Mr. Hatton across examination? Okay, we're gonna look for Ms. Graham. She may have separated from the room. We just hang on just a minute, Mr. Hatton. Sure. All right. While we're waiting for the other attorney, the other you have another question, Mr. Armstrong. I do. Um, so, Mr. Hatton, your analysis took into account the reduction in trips made, um, you know, as an adjustment to account for in your analysis. Is that right? Uh, we did what we did the original study. We had done counts uh, back in uh, 2018, I believe. So we evaluated what those counts were up to then are the ones that we did in 2020 and made an adjustment for that so that we ultimately tried to get that impact of the overall reduction in terms of, the, of what we did in our traffic study. Um, thank you. I am willing to respond to the question presented by Commissioner Vaticiotis. Okay, he stepped out. Let's just wait until he comes back so he can hear you, Mr. Armstrong. So, Ms. Graham, do you have, Mr. Delacus, do you know where she's at? Uh, as Peter Delacus, 514 Ashland Avenue, as you all have become aware, uh, Ms. Graham is five months pregnant, and as many of the women know here, uh, sometimes when you're pregnant, your bladder doesn't hold as much. So if we could have a momentary break, I'm sure. sure Absolutely. We can wait a couple of minutes for her to get back into the oh, auditorium. Here we go. Okay. Ms. Graham. Cross-examination of Mr. Hatton, the traffic engineer. Yes, um, just one question for you. When you have looked at the gap study, did you take into account different kind of road conditions like wet, ro wet roads or other things like that? M meaning like wet conditions? Yeah. Um, those obviously when we were when I was doing my condition and when we saw the drone video, uh, there was not wet conditions. So that was not included in part of the our gap study now. Okay, that's all. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So, um, Mr. Armstrong, you wanted to answer Mr. Um, or Commissioner Vaticiotis's question before we move on to your next witness. You can call your next witness when you're done, I guess. Sure. Commissioner Vaticiotis. Uh, asked a question of Mr. Hatton. Mr. Hatton was unable to answer about having to do generally with when did the Kinley Horn firm become involved with the project? Is that a fair characterization of what you're asking? 
when Kimberly Horn was first uh, contract? Fair enough. Um, I can have someone here come forward and answer that question. I would just say that um, that testimony will be limited to answering your questions, not intended to go beyond that. Who would it be? Chris? Are they going to be called later on in this process? Likely not. Okay. Mr. Armstrong, my interest is from the traffic. There may be some other technical areas, but that's, you okay. know, you deal with that. Let's see if, if Nathan can be responsive Makes to your question. Makes any right? Sir, if you could state your name, please, and your occupation. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Nathan Lee uh, with Kimley Horn and Associates. Uh, 655 North Franklin Street, Tampa, Florida. Were you sworn in earlier? Yes, sir. Okay. There was one question from Commissioner Vatikiotis, and that was when it was Kimley Horn first um, hired on this project? Retained, yes. Kimley Horn has been on the project since the end of 2018, approximately December. Speak a little louder, please. Kimley Horn has been uh, um, contracted on the project since the December of 2018 or end of 2018. December 2018? Yes, somewhere in that. Would that in, have included the? Traffic I don't have the contract. Well? Like I can't pull it up, so it was somewhere in that ballpark. For no December twenty eighteen is good, but that would have included the traffic as well. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, hang on. Don't don't disappear, Miss Graham. Do you have any questions of this witness about the time when Kimley Horn started work for the applicant? Ms. Graham. Mr. Okay, Chair. go ahead and have a seat, sir. Thank you. Mr. Armstrong, you want to call your next witness? Yes, the next witness I have for you is Cindy Terrapani, who is a land use planner who's intimately familiar with this project. And she's going to tell you what her professional credentials are and then speak at length about uh, this project and the criteria for approval and how it is consistent with your comprehensive plan. Mr. Chairman, you were sworn in earlier? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Trask, I have. All right, thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners, Vice Mayor, and uh, Commissioners this evening. I'm Cindy Terrapani, and I appreciate the opportunity to be, be with you tonight, uh, representing the Morgan Group, the applicant for this project. Uh, many of you know me, but I will just for the record uh, describe briefly my qualifications as an expert in the field of urban planning. I hold a bachelor's degree from Clemson University. I hold a master in urban and regional planning from Florida State University. I have over 39 years of planning experience in the public and private sectors. I served as the assistant manager for land development coordination for the city of Tampa, planning director for the city of Clearwater, and most recently vice president with Florida Design Consultants, a private engineering firm. I've also been qualified as an expert witness in land use litigation matters in many of the counties in the Tampa Bay area. I'm now the owner of Terra Panty Planning Strategies. I've been responsible for many clients' projects, large scale mixed use projects throughout the Tampa Bay area and worked on approvals for DRIs, comp plan amendments, rezoning, site plans, and all the other types of applications. Before I address the merits of this project, I'd like to address the baseless personal attacks on my family and me that have been made over the last few weeks. When I decided to become involved with the Morgan Group several years ago, I did so because I believe that they build projects that are high quality and are an asset to the communities in which they're located. I decided to become involved in the project to bring that high quality community to my home of Tarpon Springs. In our previous testimony and an additional testimony we will present tonight, we will demonstrate that the Anklet Harbor project is the best use for the site because it's consistent with the comp plan, complies with your zoning code, and protects the many unique environmental features of the site. I respectfully ask you to set aside these negative comments as I have and focus tonight on the merits of the project. We've submitted a document to you that contains our responses to your questions from the first hearing. It also responds to questions, specific questions from Commissioners Carr and Vaticutis. 
We hope we've answered your questions successfully, but we are here to, to fully discuss those uh, uh, later on in our presentation if you want to discuss them further. I'd also call to your attention, I handed out tonight a one-page document entitled Anclote Harbor Summary of Projects Compliance with Review Criteria. And this is the outline I'm going to follow tonight for all the reasons why this project meets your code and should be approved. The first and primary reason that the project should be approved is that it is in compliance with the comprehensive plan and the land development code. Our rezoning application and the RPD project narrative contain pages and pages of, de of de detailed analysis of how it complies with the applicable elements of the code and the plan. And I would refer you to those two documents. But I'd like to highlight a few of those for you. First of all, the project is an allowable use. Multifamily residential is allowed in both of the site's land use plan categories. The maximum density in these two plan categories is 15 units per acre. The project is proposed to be constructed at 6.3 units per acre, so less than half of the maximum density. Multifamily residential use is also allowed in the site's general business zoning district. We are proposing, as I said, 404 units. The maximum density allowed would be 485 units, and there are 81 units that will never be constructed on the site. The project is consistent with the future land use elements goals to protect and preserve the environment, improve the quality of life by creating walkable communities with high quality design standards. It also promotes housing diversity, including a variety of housing types. The project is consistent with the transportation element by providing a safe traveling environment for vehicles, bicycles, and pedestrians. We've had quite a lot of testimony this evening already from Mr. Provenzano and Mr. Hatton confirming that fact. The project accomplishes this on the site through the pedestrian circulation trail and offsite via the improvements that we will be required to construct at our sole expense. The project is consistent with the transportation element by reducing the amount of traffic as compared to the commercial uses that could be built on the site. The project is consistent with the coastal management element by protecting 21 of the 22 total acres of wetlands on the site. I've been a planner, as I said, for 39 years. I have never seen a project that, that maintained that level of wetlands on the site. Most projects want to mitigate or, or manage that off somewhere else off site. But this project, again, protects 21 of the site's 22 wetland acres. The project is consistent with the conservation element by prohibiting development on the Anklet River and large building setbacks between 175 and 400 feet. We also preserving the existing native vegetation by maintaining 16 acres of uplands untouched on the site. We also consistent with this element through protection of the eagle nest. Mr. Miklos will discuss that a little further later in our presentation. The project is consistent with the housing element by providing new housing to meet the needs of the city's growing population. The project is consistent with the recreation open space element by providing on-site recreational facilities for the residents. We've talked about these earlier uh, in our last meetings, but just to refresh, a large clubhouse and pool, several outdoor plazas, two canoe, launch, canoe and kayak launches, and a boat dock, and most importantly, a nature preserve that is connected through the entire site with a pedestrian trail. The site is also connected to the, to the Pinellas Trail which creates multimodal opportunities for residents to walk or bike to the Anclote Nature Park, the Live Oak Boat Launch, Dog Park, Splash Park, the Spongebox in downtown. The project is consistent with the utilities element since all utility services are available to serve the site and have adequate for the project, have adequate capacity for the project. As was discussed earlier, the, the applicant is committed to extending the sewer line and the reclaimed water lines to serve the project. I'd like to briefly talk about how the project complies with the land development code. We meet all the special provisions in the residential plan development district <clears throat> and all the general site development standards that the city has. We meet all of the dimensional standards in the RPD with one exception. We are asking for a waiver to the height limit to increase the height from 45 feet to 53 feet. The reason for this increased height is that it allows us to cluster those buildings away from the river, away from the eagle's nest, and reduce the building footprint on the site. 
So therefore the height waiver meets two of the waiver criteria. Number one, superior alternatives. When you have fewer buildings, a smaller total project footprint and less development of the site, that is clearly a superior alternative. The clustering of the buildings and the height waiver also allows us to protect the significant environmental features, including the wetlands, the uplands, the river and the eagle's nest by providing huge buffers from all of those, um, from all of those environmental features. We also comply with all the city site development standards and that is demonstrated on the data table and the preliminary development plan. And the staff report has a, has a one page table that explains all of that as well. He, I would refer you to those two documents. But just very briefly, let me list those that we comply with. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, with regard to density, we're proposing 6.3 units an acre where 15 would be allowed, less than half of the out allowable density. We comply with the minimum lot size and width, the minimum unit size of each residential home, the building setbacks, the building separations between buildings, the amount of parking, the wetland buffers, which at 50 feet are double the swift mud standard buffer, the open space as required by the RPD district, and the open space and impervious standards as required by the comp plan. Uh, now, if we could go to the slides and does somebody have the equipment? It's over here. It's right here. Oh. Mark, can you go ahead and switch that to the planning consultant, Ms. Terrapani's presentation? The next reason that you should approve this project is that it represents a downzoning with significantly less impacts on all city services. The site is currently zoned general business district, which allows a wide variety of commercial businesses. Under the GB district as shown in this table, up to 460,000 square feet of shopping center or other retail uses could be allowed, or 347,000 square feet of offices or some combination. As Mr. Hatton explained, both of these uses generate substantially more trips than the proposed project. Just to give an example, the shopping center is in the PM peak in the afternoon is five times the amount of traffic that the apartment project is, 500% five times. <clears throat> Additionally, the requested zoning district is the RPD district, which is accompanied, as you know, by the preliminary development plan. If approved, that site plan that's before you tonight is the only development that will be allowed on the site. There will not be any commercial uses allowed and only the residential uses in the design as shown. <clears throat> if approved, the developer is also required to submit a final development plan with a higher level of engineering design than you see tonight and bring that back to you, to your staff for review and then to you for final approval. The city's code does not allow major changes or deviations once the preliminary plan is approved. And if major changes are proposed on the final plan, we would have to go back through the public hearing process. So the value of the preliminary plan is that it provides certainty to you as a commission and to the public on the type and the amount of allowable uses on the site. I know we have seen this, you all have seen this site plan before. I'd just like to briefly run through a couple of the features. The site location on US 19, uh, site aerial, the site in blue. As I was talking about earlier, this is the river edge. This is the closest building to the river and it's 175 feet from the river. The other three buildings here are between 350 and 400 feet. This fifth building is obviously a substantial distance away from the Anklet River. There's 1,900 feet of linear, linear feet of frontage along the Anklet River. As we've just demonstrated, there is no building or development located directly on the river. There is a proposed boat dock in this, in this area. Um, would be limited, to, we have proposed tonight as one of the conditions that it be limited to 10 slips and it could only be used for the benefit and enjoyment of the residents. Of course, this dock would be subject to review and permits by the city and the Water Navigation Authority. Of the 22 acres of wetlands, as we just mentioned before, 21 acres will be protected. The wetlands are generally in this location. Uh, they form kind of a U around the two peninsulas, and there's some wetlands in this area as well. The nature preserve that is proposed is this section uh, in the Southeast Peninsula. 
Um, this is upland area of six acres. We are proposing a comp plan amendment to recreation open space so that no residential development or no development of any type would ever be allowed on that site. It would only be as a nature preserve, walking trail, exercise path for residents of the community. A little close up more. This is of course right along the river with the river frontage here showing the path along there that then continues throughout the rest of the site. Again, just a graphic you've seen earlier that showed the orange line that you see um, throughout the whole project is showing the pedestrian path that connects all the features of the site. Uh, Mr. Miklos is here from Biotech, but I just wanna show this again because it is a critical part of our project. From the very beginning, protecting the environmental features of the site was key to the design. Uh, the two eagle's nests that exist on the site are shown in this red area here. Um, the, we are proposing the highest level of protection. There are no buildings within 660 feet radius of the nests. Within 330 feet, which is the orange circle, there is some stormwater pond area uh, and stormwater system. Within the 660, there are again no buildings, but there are the remainder of the stormwater system and some parking. The applicant is also committed to having a biologist on site during construction to maintain best practices to protect the nest during con the construction process. Uh, Mr. Miklos will also provide more information on the gopher tortoises, but it is an obligation um, required by the state to relocate those uh, gopher tortoises to an approved preserve. Biotech has authorized agents who can do that work, and Mr. Miklos will talk about that in a little more detail. In summary, from the beginning of the project design, the environmental features of the site were the driving force and a priority in, in completing the design. This site plan demonstrates the extremely low level of development on the property. And I'd like to give you some numbers. Of the total 72.62 acre site, only 11 acres of the site will be developed as building and parking. That 11 acres is about 15% of the entire site. And these numbers, um, are on the summary page that I provided you tonight. An additional 16 acres are stormwater management area and the Eagle Buffer. That's the area between, uh, between the buildings and the river, that's 16 acres. An additional 16 acres of uplands are being preserved and that includes the nature preserve that we just talked about, the wetland buffer and the outdoor recreation areas of the site. 21 acres of wetlands will be preserved. That's about 29% of the site. And then there's eight and a half acres of submerged land that obviously will not be um, developed. But clearly a development of this size at 72 acres to develop only 11 acres of the site is a major significant achievement. Again, another uh, exhibit um, of the eagle nest and the eagle protection. The next few slides um, are demonstrate the high quality design by Morgan and its developments. Um, this project is the village at Baldwin Park in Orlando. Just to give you a sense of the flair, the architectural design the, and the high quality of landscaping and amenities at, at a Morgan project. <clears throat> this project is called Terraces at Town Center in Jacksonville. Again, demonstrating the quality of design that Morgan does. And although these are representative projects, they do show Morgan's commitment to design and this commitment to quality will also be done for Anclote Harbor. It was pre one of the previous questions, I believe it was Commissioner Carr asked for some examples of the signage that would, would be on the site. And I, obviously we have not designed the site yet. That would be a little premature. But this slide shows you the quality of the design and the quality of the landscaping that surround um, representative signs of Morgan pro projects. And the same high quality design would be done for Anclote Harbor. <clears throat> Anclote Harbor is a significant project in the city and it may, will make significant financial contributions to the city and other governmental agencies. Just to highlight very quickly, annually the project is expected to generate $1.4 million in new ad valorem taxes. And that's an annual ad valorem taxes. The city's share of that uh, taxes annually is about $380,000. The county share is about $370,000. <clears> and the school board share 
is about $450,000. project will have a significant impact with regard to impact fees paid to the city. A total of $2.9 million in new impact fees will be generated by the project. And just to hit the highlights on some of the larger ones, $573,000 in transportation impact fees, over $900,000 in water impact fees, over $600 in sewer impact fees, $393,000 in parks and recreation impact fees. Again, a significant contribution to the city. There are additional benefits, economic benefits to the project. As estimated by your staff, new local spending by the new residents is estimated at $8 million annually. New jobs for the community is estimated to be 356 new jobs. Obviously all those residents are gonna be new customers to patronize the existing businesses on the sponge stocks in the historic downtown and throughout the city new franchise fees paid to the city on utilities, and never, not last, but certainly not least, a new public art project to be developed on site or payment in lieu to the fund. The pedestrian trail within the project that I showed you earlier will connect all the residential buildings and to the nature preserve. This will encourage non-vehicular traffic within the project uh, by making it easy to walk or bike. We don't do it unless it's easy to walk or bike. If it's much easier to get in our car, we tend to do that, unfortunately. The development will have a business center within the site to encourage and enable residents to work from home and minimize external traffic off-site. Again, those are those transportation mitigation strategies that Mr. Hatton was speaking of. <clears throat> from the project, residents can easily access the Pinellas Trail and go south on 19 and then connect to other parks in the city, the Anklo Nature Park, the Live Oak Park, and Anderson Park further south on US 19. Even though the city hasn't completed their sustainability study, this will be the first green building project in the, in the city consistent with the city's sustainable goals. The developer has committed to the bronze level of certification by the National Green Building Standards, and that's one of our new conditions, number uh, three. The developer not only will install some electric vehicle charging stations within the site, but he's also agreed <clears throat> to add underground conduit at all the building locations so that as demand increases for electric charging stations, people buy more electric cars, he can add more stations. The developer will provide solar panels to serve the clubhouse. This is condition number eight. And as most importantly, as a sustainable project, the development preserves all of the environmental features on the site. The, build, the project has an extremely small footprint of buildings and pavement as we've talked about. And as compared to commercial uses that could be built today without any zoning change, it would have a substantially larger footprint and a substantially larger impact on the site. The, city, the project will make improvements to the city's infrastructure, and we've talked about this uh, quite a bit tonight, but just to confirm it, our condition number six, we will extend the reclaimed water. Condition number nine, staff condition number nine, we will extend the sanitary sewer, and there are other properties that will likely benefit by being able to connect to the line that we will construct. And of course, there will be more customers for all of these utility services. Earlier this evening, Mr. Provenzano and Mr. Hatton explained in detail the access to the project during US 19. I don't want to belabor that, but I do want to confirm that it is the applicant's obligation and his sole cost to construct the new right turn lane into the site, if you're traveling north, to be able to turn right into the site, and to, to construct both offset left turn median openings. I think Mr. Hatton mentioned, but I think it's it's worth mentioning again, the offset median openings are very similar to the channelized U-turns that exist all along US 19 that we all drive today. Uh, as we all know, FDOT has retrofitted those open median cuts to the, uh, the channelized U-turns. And there are many projects in the Tarpon area that have a U-turn um, as their access to their site. River Watch immediately to the north of this project Several of the mobile home parks in Tarpon, Tarpon Shores, Stonehenge, Sun Valley, and Tarpon Air. And the woods at Anderson Park multifamily also has a U-turn movement. The Reload Gun Range, the Hampton Inn Suites, and the AMC Movie Theater are examples of commercial projects that have a, do not have a median opening and have U-turns to get to their site. 
St. Pete College in Tarpon Springs and the county's Anderson Park also have the same access mechanism as this project. I'd like to talk for a minute about why the park is not the best use for this site. We expect that there may be speakers tonight who want the city to purchase this site for a park. I've just provided extensive testimony on the project's low level of development. It will probably most likely be less than development as a park but I'd like to explain why the park is not the best use. After the city approved the Walmart development on this site in January 2005, and up to the present time, which is over 15 years, there's not been any meaningful concerted effort by any citizen or any group of citizens to purchase the property for public use. Even when Walmart purchased the Kmart Plaza and, and installed their new Walmart store at the, Tarp at the Tarpon Avenue 19 location, making it clear that Walmart had no intention to build on this site that we're talking about tonight, there were still no efforts to purchase the site for public use. Some of the speakers opposing this project tonight were elected commissioners during part of the last 15 years, and they did not use their position to bring that item to a vote by the Board of Commissioners. Most significantly, over the last 15 years, the city's Board of Commissioners never discussed voting to put this on a referendum to purchase the property for a site, for a park. The commission recently received an electronic mail from Daniel Earls, who is the real estate agent for the owner of Walmart and responsible for marketing the site over the last five years. Mr. Earls email quote, email states, and I quote one sentence from it. In that time, meaning the five years that he's been marketing it, in that time, I've had no substantive conversation with anybody from the city or community regarding a purchase of the property, end quote. In contrast, the applicant has a site in the contract, is seriously interested in developing the site as evidence to their efforts, time, and money expended to prepare these applications before you and request your approval. I'd like to, uh, we, as Mr. <clears throat> Armstrong mentioned, we received quite a lot of data, which you all did as well, from the citizens, concerned citizens of Tarpon Springs today. And I'd just like to address a couple of those in the letter um, from Ms. Graham on page six and seven, she makes some statements about how the uh, project is inconsistent with the comp plan. Although not a planner, unfortunately she has misrepresented or misunderstands these policies and how they apply to the project and none of them are true. To give you an example, on page seven, Ms. Graham states that the, city, that the project is inconsistent with the city's policy for sites within the coastal high hazard area to not have an increase in residential density. As we've, as we've talked about earlier tonight, the project today is approved for 15 units per acre. And we are not requesting a plan amendment to increase that density. Furthermore, the, the proposed development will be developed at 6.3 units per acre, which is less than half of the allowable density. So that is a in, completely incorrect factual statement that we are inconsistent with that. I'd like to go through the revisions that we've made to the project in response to your comments. And if you could, I'm going to refer to um, the document that was sent to you earlier today. It's applicants suggested additional conditions. We are in agreement with the staff conditions in the staff report, but these would be in addition to those. So I'll just touch on those really quickly. I'm going to be happy to go back and answer any questions on them. Uh, the first one is that we are deleting the pocket park and that is no longer a, a request or a proposal to the city. Condition number two is that we will discuss with DOT the feasibility of a signal at the median opening. So we have done that, but we will continue to discuss that with them uh, as we go through the permitting process. Condition number three, we have now committed to des designing and constructing the project consistent with the bronze level of the National Green Building Standards and becoming the first green building project in the city. Condition number four, we've agreed to, to exchange two planting materials with two other materials, which will be shown on our final development plan. I'm gonna skip over number five for a second because it deserves a little more conversation and, and we'll come back to that one. Condition number six, we will extend the reclaimed water line, provided there's water available. And Mr. Smith this evening said that there was. Condition number seven, um, we are proposing that we would um, develop and prepare a conceptual hands, 
landscape hardscape plan for the city property that is immediately south of our entrance. This fees for this design would, should not exceed $20,000, but that would be uh, another contribution to the city. Condition number eight, we will, under, we will install the solar panels to serve the main clubhouse building. Condition number nine, we'll un install, in addition to installing the electric vehicle charging stations, we will un install underground conduit at each building location so that the additional stations can be added in the future. Condition number 10 is that we will continue to work with Pasco County Public Transportation to determine if a bus shelter is needed at the project. And new condition number 11, we will investigate planting additional trees at the project entrance, but this is subject to review and approval by Duke Energy because there is an easement along our entire frontage and Duke has a review and approval authority on all trees and landscape materials there, but we will work with them to try and do that. And the last condition uh, that I wanted to talk about, the next to last, is with regard to city condition number 16. We'd like to add onto that to add that the boat dock will have a maximum of 10 slips and they shall be for the sole benefit of the residents of the project. Now let's come back to everybody's favorite, the Hayes Road and secondary access issue. I'd like to discuss, um, we have spent quite a bit of time as a team um, investigating this in more detail and, and in analyzing the potential of constructing Hayes Road. I do have two more slides, I'm sorry. Um, if we could go back to that. Mark, can you go back to the PowerPoint, please? So let's talk about where the Hayes Road right away is today, first of all. So this is an excerpt of our site. Um, so this is the east edge of the site. Our site goes uh, like this um, and then down and that's the, the edge of it. So uh, Hayes Road right of way, it is not a road, starts here at the eastern, at the little tucked in corner there. And it goes all along east to Jasmine. This is Jasmine. Jasmine Avenue travels uh, north into Sail Harbor. Going south, it goes past several mobile home parks, Leisure Lake Mobile Home Parks, North Lake, the New Cypress Trail, uh, townhomes, that whole area. So as you can see, a couple things to point out about this. First of all, there is no road constructed within the right of way. That's issue number one. There are eight parcels that front this uh, right of way. This is one large parcel, two, this three and it goes as a flag lot goes up like this. And this is parcel number four that also fronts on Jasmine. Number five fronts on Jasmine, number six, number seven and number eight. Number six, there's a new home under construction. Uh, looks pretty completed to me today when I was there, roofs on, driveways in. Um, so there's a total of five homes uh, in, along this road. One, two, three, four, five. Clearly the 40 foot right of way is substandard since the city standard is 50 feet. The city and the county have joint jurisdiction over this right of way. Constructing Hayes Road, and you can see it on at the top of this exhibit and I have another one in just a moment. Um, it will require fill material and grading due to the difference between the edge of the existing grade of four feet and the necessary grade for the road at eight. So it's a little hard in the next slide I'll go to in just a second, we'll show that a little more clearly. So in order to fill and grade, that grading would occur outside of the 40 feet of right-of-way would occur along these properties here and along these properties here outside of the right-of-way. The adjacent property owners will need to grant additional right-of-way and or easements. And unfortunately or fortunately, however you want to take it, um, a property owner such as ourselves does not have eminent domain authority. Only a government such as the city or Pinellas County has the authority to obtain that right of way or easements through their powers of eminent domain. There is also not enough room within this substandard right of way to install a sidewalk on even one side of the road and comply with the needed grading. We believe that there are wetlands um, in this area um, for which there's no area to mitigate within the 40 feet. And of course, like all development, the road will require some method of stormwater management and this 40 feet 
uh, most likely does not have adequate room to provide that as well. And all of those issues are challenges, but the most critical one that prevents the applicant from building the road is that additional right of way and or easements will be required. And we as a private property owner do not have the ability to do that. Only the city or the county has eminent domain authorities to obtain that. This analysis demonstrates that it's not feasible for the applicant to build the road as a second access. But even though it is not feasible for us to build it, the applicant wants to support the wishes of the city to build this road if that's your desire. <coughs> We would like to make a, a donation of $100,000 to be used for the road construction. Our traffic impact fees are $573,680, so say $570. When you add those two together, you would have a total of $673,000 to build the road. Using the DOT's cost per mile estimating for an undivided two-lane rural road, the applicant's engineer has estimated the cost of construction as $509,000. Now that is excluding right away and, and easement costs, just the construction. So since our impact fees and donation together are $673,000, that exceeds the cost of construction of $509,000 should you wish to do that. Now, before we leave the slide, I just wanna point out there are some unanticipated consequences on the site if the Hayes Road connection is required. That's what we're showing here. The connection would be, this is uh, building five, the easternmost building. So the most logical location would be to extend this parking lot and uh, make that connection in this, in this curving uh, roadway section that I'm showing you here. Um, the orange and purple are the new wetland impacts that would be required. And there would be wetlands that would have to be removed um, to install stormwater pond for our new part of the road in here. So the unanticipated consequences are the one and a half, new, new one and a half acres of wetland impact, whereas before we only had less than one acre of impact. The nature preserve, this, was, this is the entrance to the nature preserve, it extends further down. Clearly the nature preserve will be reduced in size and clearly vehicular traffic will be introduced um, in the previously pedestrian only area. But if you are in agreement with this proposal, we will make that connection and we will make the changes to our site plan. And there's one other unanticipated consequence and Mr. Miklos can speak about this if you have further questions. Um, uh, we believe that uh, the impact of these wetlands in this area right here uh, would be an Army Corps permit, which would extend the permitting timeframe extensively for that type of permit. Um, so it just makes the construction timeframe a little more complicated. But again, if that's your desire and you wish to build the road as a city, we want to make you, we want to help you and make a serious financial contribution towards that. This completes my presentation. I'd like to stop there. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Mr. Trask, I have a couple of questions that I'd like to ask Ms. Terrapani. Go ahead, Mayor. Okay, Ms. Terrapani, uh, this property, uh, which is a very, very uh, environmentally sensitive. It has two, uh, 20 acres of wetlands. Uh, what impact is going to have to wetlands and where the medication mitigation will, will be done? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, we, the site has 22 acres of wetlands. Uh, at, without the Hayes Road connection, we'll talk about that separately. Um, there, are, there would be one acre of impact and we would impact, we would mitigate for that one acre of wetland impact on the site. Um, if the Hayes Road connection is selected, that would increase the wetland impact to 2.5 acres of impact. Um, I, I would let Dr. Mr. Miklos speak to that specifically as to whether all of that can be accommodated on site, but I believe that it probably would be. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Uh, my, my other question is uh, the reason why we were asking to have the uh, Hayes road to be constructed is because it's to provide addition uh, safety to your residents on the complex. You're gonna have about 800 some uh, residents living in, on this complex. So they need, in my opinion, is they, they need to have an exit to be able to get out much easier so they don't have to deal with a US Highway 19 at all times. Um, now you say you wanna give us a donation of $100,000. I think this is something that you should be constructing the road not the seat of Tarper Springs. 
Well, I, I, I think I've, I've tried to make it very clear that the applicant does not have, let me, let me start over. We're willing to help you build the road, you being the city. We do not have the ability to build the road because additional right-of-way will be needed, right-of-way or easements. And as a private citizen, we have no ability to get that right-of-way or easements. Only a city can obtain that right-of-way or easements through the eminent domain process. So we're happy to help you financially. And we, I think we've shown that there would be a, a significant contribution between the cash contribution and the impact fees, you would have over $670,000 available to you to build the road. And if you do that, of course, we would connect the project, you know, we would connect the two Hayes Road within the project. Uh, explain to me, the, uh, the easement right now is 40 feet wide, isn't it? What about if you just build a one-way street just, to, just for the cars to get out? Um, it's possible that you could build a one lane road within that 40 foot right of way, but it really doesn't serve the purpose that everyone seems to think is needed of cars. And which way would you pick? You can only exit or you can only enter, which no, is the- option. I would say just to exit the, uh, the traffic from the uh, development. Um, and the, I think the issue again, a one way entrance or a one way exit for the project um, for the cost that we be associated with building the road it's not a big enough bang for the buck, quite frankly, Mayor. It just, it does not solve the problem. Also, it's gonna be confusing. Um, people are gonna forget, oh, can I only go in or can I only go out? Because it will be gated like the rest of the project uh, is gated. Um, I, I just don't think you're gonna, it, it doesn't really solve the problem. Again, you have, as I showed on the aerial, you have eight properties along that road. One of those properties is vacant and could be developed with quite a few homes. And there currently are four homes and one almost completely finished. So to tell them that they only have a one way on that road, which it's their only access would be difficult as well. They have no other way to get in and out of their site. So to build a one way road in front of their projects, I think would be pretty problematic for those four, for those five property owners, well, five homes, eight properties. Well, Mr. Anderson made the comment that uh, it's not financially feasible to construct the road but safety should be important to you as well, right? Well, of course safety is important to us, but I think we've shown, and, and Mr. Hatton and Mr. Provenzano have shown that the 19 access is safe. However, if the city is interested in the road, we want to help. We are offering our money, we're offering the impact fees, and we're offering a pretty significant financial contribution that will cover the cost for you guys to build the road, to go through the permitting process jointly with the county, um, but we are unable to build the road ourselves due to the inability to gain right away as a private citizen. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair Panny, thank you for your presentation. Uh, it's clear that um, the applicant is doing a lot to uh, make this project um, conducive to uh, the environmental sensitive areas. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, there's two things in the conditions that uh, I'm not necessarily interested in number seven, uh, providing a design um, and then also uh, reducing the, the impact uh, fee for that. Um, just myself, I think it's the city's property. I think the city can do it themselves. Uh, it would be best just to take the impact fee instead of giving that up for an area that we're not really sure what we want to do with yet. Um, and then um, Similar to um, the mayor, I do have some more questions about Hayes Road. Um, so it looks like there's a piece of vacated property that was on um, the same piece of property that is on site uh, that runs east of the houses that are off Jasmine and on Hayes Road. Uh, did you all look at that as an alternative to take that to Jasmine um, more of a south approach to Jasmine instead of a due east approach. I know this wasn't a question that was proposed earlier, um, but looking at the, the property appraiser's maps and then looking at um, that, I could see that there's vacated property that looks like it was potentially a road at one point or a paper road. Um, and can that be brought in? Can that be evaluated at all as a connector? Um, again, that wouldn't even require you to do Hayes Road, that you could keep it completely in, in sight um at that point uh, uh, you know thank, you for, about? thank you for that question vice mayor i'm wondering if we could go back um to the uh, powerpoint I'm, so I'm not sure exactly where you're talking about i think i do but perhaps we, if we could use that aerial um 
we go back to the PowerPoint, I can get to an aerial and we can uh, talk about that a little bit. Mark, can you bring us back to the PowerPoint, please? And I'm happy to show you on my iPad too, if I need to. Okay. So are you talking about this does the edge of the property is just off the screen, but are you talking about going south somewhere this direction and, go, mm. and then connecting over to Jasmine? No. Um, you, want the, you want the light? <laughs> Am I understanding correctly that if the Hayes property or the Hayes road is going to be connected, it'd be coming from here and going to this way. Is that correct? Yes. That, that, that edge where it's kind of white and gray. Just yeah. Like, that's the edge. That's the corner where Hayes road starts. The Hayes road right away starts just to the left of that. Okay. Right here. Right. So is this part of the property that's being, uh, that's under contract right now? Yes. Okay. So my question is, could you take the road this way and then this way to Jasmine? And at that point, you wouldn't even being you wouldn't be on Hayes Road. You'd be within the site itself, and you'd get an exit to. And a, what I'm looking at in the property appraiser it looks like there's a vacated paper road at some point that was added to this piece of property. Um, so I just I think that would be something that would be worth looking into if you feel that there's concerns on Hayes Road uh, from an applicant standpoint. not sure that this exhibit shows it the best, but I think what you're talking about is um, uh, this area, which is wet, and it's wet all the way down to the former um, uh, CSX transportation line. I think that's what you may be looking at possibly. So we'd have to tr cross, this is uplands, but the uplands stop here. So you would have to cross wetlands in some fashion to get down to this area which is also wet <laughs> off the site so i'm not yeah the further the further east part of it looks like it's uplands and then it does go to wet again i know what you're saying um I, i'm just looking at it from another perspective i do feel that there needs to be a second exit out the back based on what i'm looking at and the waiver that's being requested mm -hmm. um i do feel that just an exit out the back would be sufficient in my opinion uh for this project uh, i don't think it would necessarily be confusing for the the residents that live there you you understand that pretty quickly I think um, so that's how I feel on this standpoint. I was just trying to um, you had some concerns about Hayes Road as the applicant. I just wanted to one. I want to know if you vetted maybe another alternative to Hayes Road, if that's something you thought about, or maybe it's something we could look at before the final site plan. But to me, I think it's important to have that um, exit at least uh, to have an entrance back there. I don't think that's necessary. I think it would add too much traffic to the neighborhood. Um, in the back for cut throughs from um, Keystone Road or some other areas. Um, can, I re can I respond to that? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we have looked at that because we've looked at every possible way to get in and out of the site. Okay. And there is, even if you travel, there is one small area of upland adjacent to the east edge of the site that is isolated. Um, and it's not, you, could, you would have to cross wetlands to get to it. But even if you got to it on this edge, there's no right of way here. This is a private property. So then where do you where do you go? How do you get off the site? The only right of way that exists is this 40 foot Hayes Road that goes along this section. So we would have to buy other property. I mean, I just, I, unless we're missing something, I don't believe there's any other right of way. In our research, we have not found any other right of way that we could utilize except for Hayes Road. Okay, I see what you're saying. That's a Duke Energy right of way. I, I just, double click that so that I'm not too familiar with Duke Energy right away or property so you would have to acquire property from Duke Energy then to cross that is that right I'm not again I, I'm not looking at the same thing you are so I'm, I'm having a hard time visualizing it but again the only right away that exists that we could touch which you can only travel on public right away or property you own so with regard to property we own what we own ends right here okay and then with regard to right of way, the only existing right of way that touches this site other than obviously Understood. US 19 is Hayes. I do, I understand that now, thank you. Sure. Um, from a, a, a vice mayor standpoint, I do feel that it's the responsibility of the applicant 
uh, to pay fully for the road, not just their impact fees. I understand what your your presentation was uh, around that the applicant cannot construct the road. I understand that completely, uh, that there's other issues around that. But I do feel that it's it should be on the applicant's responsibility to construct a road full construct the road fully um, and not using impact fees to do that. So there's a significant amount of investment in the area that the city has made, which impacts fees will help cover, um, but it's not, in my opinion, to use impact fees to construct a road to the project that would be used specifically for that project itself. So and, and I would just remind you, as I'm sure you're aware, in state law, um, projects can only can only be required to mitigate for their impacts. So first of all, our project would not be the only user of the road. That's number one. Um, there are at least eight additional properties, five existing homes and one large property that could be developed with multiple homes that would also use that. So we would not be obligated by state law to build the entire road. Also, since we have an access on 19, only some of our traffic, even if it is built, if Hayes Road is built, some of our traffic would use Hayes, some of it would use 19. What that split is, honestly, I don't know at this point. We, I don't know if, if our team is aware of that. But again, we would not be obligated by state law to mitigate for everybody's impact. We're only obligated to mitigate for our impact and for our road travel. So, so what is that? what would that be then? Like I said, I, I, I don't know. Okay. Um, clearly there are eight property owners who would use the road, five homes use it today, a very dirt single lane road. There's one large property that could be developed with multiple houses. Um, when we take a break, I can talk to Mr. Hatton and see if he has uh, estimated the number of trips that would use Hayes versus using US 19. Um, but again, it, we, we are not obligated by state law to mitigate to build a road to serve the whole world or even to serve a neighborhood that's outside the scope of this project and it's not the obligation of the developer. We can pay our share. Sure. And again, that's why we were suggesting because our impact fees are significant and because we're making a cash contribution as well, then you all would have the funds available to build the road should you decide to do that. Yeah, and I mean, just for clarity, I guess I don't have to approve the waiver for a second entrance or exit also. So uh, from a city standpoint, so with that, I mean, I'm not going to approve the second that waiver um, based on what I've seen. Um, so I do expect the applicant to, to pay for, to construct this road because there's no need for this road right now unless this application goes through and is approved. So that's where I stand on that and based on the evidence that I've seen. So thank you for your time and I have no further questions. Commissioner Donovan, you have questions? Yeah, I do. Thank you, Mr. Trask. Uh, thank you, Ms. Terrapani, for the presentation. Uh, I think you answered a, a lot of my questions. Uh, I'm concerned with Hayes Road as far as, you know, I don't know where we're going to end up as far as the schematics and um, I guess the details of where exactly it would come in and come out, whether it was one way, not one way. But I'm worried it might be taken, you know, one step forward, two steps back, because I think, you know, the initial strength of the project is that, you know, you can say, hey, 96% of the wetlands are being preserved. Whereas if you did this road, you're going to have the wetland impacts, fill-ins, eminent domain. Um, I'm just wondering if, if the road is enough of a headache there um, for the board to still consider it. And obviously, you know, we would want to get more detail on it, but I don't know about that road. I mean, again, the wetland impacts alone, it's kind of taken away from the initial strength of the project for me. Um, I mean, what, what's the developer's perspective on eliminating Hayes Road from the conversation altogether? Well, honestly, we can't eliminate the conversation because you all have asked us to discuss it. So um, we have spent a great deal of time both investigating the technical aspects and discussing internally what we could do as an applicant to help you achieve that road, should that be the wish of the commission. So um, we... As I said, our, our offer still stands um, that we would make a cash contribution and that coupled with the impact fees would be um, more than the estimated construction cost. It does not, we can't account for what the right of way and easement cost would be at this time. Um, but again, we, we are asking for the waiver, but we, we also want to help the city uh, if they decide that that road is important um, to more than just the project, because it certainly would benefit more than just the project. Do you know what the difference would be? So right now, without Hayes Road, you're preserving 96% of your wetlands, over 50% of the site total um, total land. Do you know what the percentage difference would be there? So say we did Hayes Road, what that would be? 
are, are you talking about the difference in the wetland impact yes. specifically? Yes, sir. Um, without Hayes Road, uh, we were impacting one acre of the 22 acres. With Hayes Road, we'll impact two and a half acres of the 22 acres. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't have a calculator to do the <laughs> percentage, but it goes from one acre of impact to two and a half acres of impact. Okay, thank you. Are we, are we going to get to hear from somebody more for the environmental side of things? Mr. Uh, yes, sir. Miklos, uh, I believe. Yes, Mr. Miklos is here from Biotech Consulting, and he can answer more questions of all the environmental issues, this, um, the wetlands, the gopher tortoises, the eagle. He, he is following me in this presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Vatikos, do you have questions? Do you have questions, sir? Yes. <clears throat> Good evening, Mrs. Terrapani. Evening, Mr. Vatikas. Uh, thank you for your information. Um, I do have some questions. Um, I'm not really to, ready to state a position on anything yet. I, I still think I've, I've got some information I need. Um, I, I want to get back to what I, I believe I asked you. I may have been wrong. Um, have you performed any um, studies to support your claims of a... Um, a superior solution for the single access um, to the site? We did. We did a qualitative analysis of that, and it was contained in our RPD project narrative. We discussed, it. of course, it was done back in August before we had this new information, but taking what we did before plus what we now know about the difficulty of building the road within a 40-foot ride, wide right-of-way um, and the impact um, on the residential neighborhood. Generally, it is not best planning practices to take multifamily traffic through a single family neighborhood. Um, that's generally not the way that things are done. That right. it certainly was part of our analysis at the time when we submitted the application. And again, the, the limited amount of right of way it was my feeling at the time doing when I did wrote that analysis that I really wasn't sure how we could get two lanes and all the requirements within 40 feet. And now we have shown you that it, it, it will be difficult to achieve it all without additional right of way. It's not, not difficult, it'll be extremely, extremely difficult right. to but, do that. But there haven't been any formal analyses such as by Mr. Hatton or anybody as far as what the impact would be on Jasmine, the actual- From a traffic point of view of the number of trips, um, I'm not sure what Mr. Hatton might have done. We can you, are you aware of any? I'm not aware of any, okay. no. Um, and then, as, and I do have some questions concerning the uh, environmental impact, but I'm going to save that for the civil engineer. Um, I, the, I, I want to get back to reconfirming the comment that there were some questions that both Mr. Provenzano and Mr. Hatton said. They basically, they just have some questions concerning whether one access or two access, uh, two accesses uh, would be better, and they would need some additional information or work in order to determine that. Um, have you spoken to uh, Pine Ellis County about Hayes Road? No, sir, I have not. Okay. Has anybody from the applicant done that you're aware of? I don't okay. know. Not, have you not spoke, that I'm aware of. Have you spoken to any of the property owners? No, I have not. Okay. Um, I want to shift. To, well, let me just ask um, on the um, I want to talk about recreational open space a second, but you know, we 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 kind of I, or and I understand the proposal number five um, that um, that that you've got some some offer down here. I know in the past uh, when you've got multiple uh, people that may utilize something that uh, a contractor or consultant or developer has done, there are ways of reimbursing that part, uh, even though the developer may do the whole project. And we can talk about that later at some point, um, maybe with Mr. Armstrong, because I'm sure he's going to have to have some communication with his uh, client. But, um, <clears throat> you know, we, we talk about the, um, the numbers that you've got, the impact fees plus 100,000, and um, in that, um, uh, this is what the developer has to offer and sort of thing. We've not talked about anything in between or anything like that. Um, so I, I don't want to get hung up on that. I, 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 um, I, I guess, I, and I, I guess you're not saying without further 
con conferring with the Mr. Armstrong and the developer that um, they're ruling out the developers ruling out paying for this uh, road altogether, this second access, if it was to be along Hayes Road. I'm not sure what you're asking me. Are you asking me if the developer would fund the entire project without I mean, impact I, fee credits? I, I think Mr. Armstrong is saying that that's a deal breaker. Is that what you're saying as well? If the de developer is made to uh, pay for the uh, entire improvement? If the uh, developer from... has to build the entire road and not receive any impact fee credits, that is a deal breaker and the project is not possible. That's a deal breaker. That's correct. Okay. Um, as far as the um, recreation open space, um, I, I want to talk about our, our policy um, 1.5.3 in the comprehensive plan to uh, preserve environmentally sensitive open spaces in perpetuity through conservation easements. And I know you had a write up in the last, uh, I think in the response to my memorandum uh, with regard to, uh, uh, I have, a, I think preservation would require four public hearings where uh, turning over a conservation easement would, would only require one, let's say. I, I don't recall, uh, recall the exact number, but why can't you have both? Why can't you have preservation uh, land use designation and a conservation easement over it? Uh, where the, the rights to that easement are, are dedicated to the city of Tarpon Springs. Um, that's something I'll have to talk to my client about when we take a break. Um, oh, I mean, pardon me? I, I will have to talk to my client about that, whether he'd be in agreement to that when we take a break. Okay. I don't know the answer to that question. But I mean, there's nothing that you're aware of that would prevent that from happening other than the developer agreeing to it or not. It, it's certainly theoretically possible. I, I think the rec... I mean, in my opinion, I mean, there may be other reasons financially or something else that may be problematic, but as far as any, any kind of a jurisdictional, uh, from a planner's perspective, you don't see any reason why that can't be. Um, I don't want to speak as to whether there's any complications on the title with adding conservation easement. It's not my area of expertise, but as a planner, I can tell you that the rec open space plan category, once it's applied, it's very difficult to change. It's it's four it's two public hearings within with you as the city commission. It's going to the forward Pinellas, it's going to the countywide planning authority, the county commission. So it's an elaborate process to change. So it is extremely final and extremely certain that the only thing you can do with that nature preserve is rec open space. Whether or not a conservation easement can be added on top. I need to talk to my client about that and obviously confer with Mr. Armstrong about that. Well, having said it's nearly forever, then that shouldn't be a problem with a conservation easement on top of that as well. I, I, I'm just um, not as familiar with easements okay. and I haven't we, discussed it with my client. We can, I, there's, to me, there's kind of a psychological effect when you do that, that I think is important. Um, okay. And that's why I'm bringing that up. Um, also the, um, the doc, um, I, I know you've you've suggested or in that uh, recommended conditions that it would be um, no more than than I think 10 slips or something like that. Um, sure. And I, I do believe I don't know whether Ms. Vincent were to have Mr. Powell available during the uh, cross examination as far as but I, I would I if I remember correctly, we're going to need a uh, uh, the, the applicant would need a letter of no objection from the city and I think for multi use and commercial that comes from the commission. I may be mistaken on that. And I'm going to try and confirm that a little later, later with uh, some redirect. But, um, but I just want to make sure that you would not have a problem that that's what you're saying is that you're, you're, you're kind of stipulating to nothing more than 10, 10 slips as an example, but that doesn't mean you would not uh, be willing to consider additional um, I don't want to call them restrictions, but covenants on top of that as well. Right, whatever Depending is required what as we go through the permitting process, if there's At the time of permitting process. Sure, okay. we understand that it has to be permitted through the city and through Water and Navigation Authority. Okay. Um, on the electric vehicle charging stations, I don't know whether we had a conversation on this or not. Um, one of the, um, um, the, the uh, kind of philosophical aspect of encouraging electric vehicle use is when a tenant might be considering it 
um, and they're looking around, they don't see any electric vehicle charging station. They say, well, okay, it doesn't even make any sense for me to buy one because there's nothing there. Um, I'd like for you and, and Mr. Armstrong to also consider uh, uh, some kind of a requirement on the part of the uh, a landlord to, uh, as far as a disclosure to a tenant that if they wish to have an electric vehicle that the landlord will install an electric vehicle station for their for their use rather than um, them waiting to see if one's available and then not doing it because they don't see one available it's kind of a way of encouraging the the use of electric vehicles and and if someone's interested in purchasing an electric vehicle then this might be an incentive for them to do that which given the commute times and cost and things like that uh, would certainly be a lot cheaper for them to do, have that than it would be going down to the service station at the corner of Tarpon and and, uh, and uh, US 19. So um, it, it, I would like to have that consideration. I, I can tell you a little bit about it and then um, about the charging stations. We are installing some on the site right. at the clubhouse and in the center of the property. Um, the applicant's experience with those is, has been, the, been a couple of things. One, um, they're not very used at this time. We do obviously see the future need for those. The experience also is that I understand that um, the, the speed at which a car can be charged at these stations is increasing as well. So that reduces the amount of time that the car has to sit there. Um, Morgan also does in their current projects, they require, uh, they, they have some sort of a pencil penalty built in. If you leave your car at the charging station after it's been charged, you, you know, you get penalized um, through some process, administrative process they have. So they're building in all these ways to make sure that there's turnover. But again, we are committing to putting the conduit at every single, at the parking area around every single building. And because it's an apartment complex managed by one entity, they can manage that and, and they will be able to um, get an understanding if people have an interest. Um, more interest is increasing for more electric vehicles and therefore more charging stations. So they have the ability to do that. It's not like if you own the house and you have to buy the whole charging station yourself. This is where the complex can do right. that. So right. we're, we definitely yeah. want to accommodate people. For I, I don't want to get into the business of it. I'm just asking that that be take a little more proactive um, approach to this. And rather than uh, not having anything that may be discouraging somebody offer that if they wish to purchase an electric vehicle. So that would be something that perhaps you and Mr. Armstrong can discuss. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, I believe I want to make sure that that's it. I think that's it. Thank you. Mr. Armstrong, do you have questions of Mr. Terrapani? Yes, sir. Good evening, Mr. Terrapani. Good evening. Uh, I do have a question for you. Big macro, fifty thousand foot level question. Is this better? Yeah, um, I have one question for you. It's a big picture macro question. Um, and looking at these applications, would you view them to be a down zoning from the existing circumstance? Yes, sir. The applications you have before you tonight are significant down zoning from general business to a residential development only. It's a down zoning in the amount of development that could be accomplished, and it's a down zoning because it significantly reduces the number of trips that would be generated by a commercial project versus the small, much smaller number of trips that are generated by this project. So yes, it is a down zoning application. So um, if you don't have any other questions, then Ms. Graham, now is your opportunity to ask questions of Ms. Terrapini cross-examination, if you have any. Yes, good evening, Ms. Tarapani. How are you? Good evening. Good evening. Um, Jane Graham, representing Concerned Citizens. Just have a few quick questions for you. And if I could just interrupt for just a moment, we're going to object on a procedural basis. Hear us out. We're doing this for the record, and you can, we can move on from there. And but for the record, although we do not care uh, whether or not Ms. Graham um, asks questions or makes a presentation, 
and we continue to view her client not to be an affected party, uh, to not and to not have standing to challenge any of our applications. I just want to put that out in the record uh, as a housekeeping matter. Thank you. Okay, and and just to reply, and we you know we obviously object to that. We do not agree. We we are an affected party, and we do have standing. But I'll talk to that during our presentation. Um, so, Ms. Tarapani. You mentioned this nature center and the, the trails and all the natural things on this project. Is this open to people in the public or it's just for residents in the community? Well, obviously it's a private development uh, that is house home for the 404 apartments and it is not open to the public unless they are guests of the residents. Okay. And as far as the recreation area that you spoke of, you mentioned trails. What other type of recreation would be available? Uh, the site includes a major clubhouse at the project entrance with a pool and an outdoor uh, recreational area. The project includes a second uh, outdoor plaza in the center of the site in the middle of the, of the units that includes an outdoor seating area, um, cooking area, dog park, um, outdoor recreation area. The site includes two canoe boat launch areas, one on the Anklet River and one on the uh, southwest area, southwest portion of the site. And again, uh, a nature preserve of six acres of uplands that is, includes a, a nature path that, that the residents can travel, walk, and bicycle along. When you talk about what's already proposed, are there potential changes? Like, are, are there other types of recreational uses that you could still put on the property? Things like tennis courts or a small, oh, anything like that. I'm not sure I understand your question. As far as the uses for recreation. Okay. okay, so I mean, more specifically, what other uses are allowed in recreational open space? <coughs> in the, are you mean in the recreational open space plan category? Yeah. Um, I need to refer to one of my documents. I'm sorry, but I don't, I thought I had that whole, that policy of the rec open space plan category, but um, perhaps, you know, some of the city staff could respond, but it allows general recreational open space activities, public park, as I remember, private park, um, private recreation area, public recreation area. I could be not listing all of them because I don't have all of it memorized, but that's generally is my recollection. Okay. Um, no further questions. Thank you. Any redirect, Mr. Armstrong? No? Okay, uh, Vice Mayor, the, the court reporter has been going for three and a half hours, and I know you have as well. Can we just maybe take a five-minute break to everybody stretch their legs and use the restroom? Yeah, and I just want to make a, a quick point. Um, I believe we're going to the recorded emails first when we go to public comment. Is that correct? That's correct. And I just want to make it, it clear to the, the public that it's going to be three-plus hours of um, recorded emails um, and public comments. So I just want to make you aware of that now uh, that we're at the, the 930. Point of order. Point of order. Point uh, of order. Mr. Delacus. Excuse me. Hold on a second. Excuse I understand me. there's three this hours is, of Excuse emails me, Mr. Delacus. Give the, you let Tara Excuse Panigo, me, Mr. Delacus. This is Smith your second go. warning. So let these people Mr. Uh, Chief, I'm going to need your assistance here. We're going to go to recess right now. 
Mr. We're going to go to a five minute recess right now. Thank you.
You could please take your seats. Yeah. I asked, you know, I don't know. We're going to find out in just a second. I've talked to him about it. Um, if, if we could have uh, everyone take their seats, please. We need to wait for our uh, city clerks, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. You want to go again? I turned on all the map. Oh, yeah. Oh, did I? Oh. Okay, we're going to go ahead and reconvene at 9 uh, 39. Uh, I have had discussions with the city clerk and the city attorney. Uh, procedurally in the past, we've done emails first, uh, typically before public comment. Um, in that review, we discussed that it's not um, a requirement. It's more of a procedural situation. Um, for additional information, um, we would like to take the public comment first, but I do want to be clear that if you have an email that was sent in to the city clerk to be read, they've been pre-recorded, and we have the names also, so if you are getting up to speak and you have an email that has been sent in, that's already considered a public comment. So you cannot have an email sent in and also get up and speak. Um, so for now, I'm going to defer back to the city attorney. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, so we're back um, in the still. This is a case in chief of the applicant. And so, Mr. Armstrong, call your next witness. Yes, sir. The next witness I have to present to the commission is Mr. John Nichols. He is our environmental consultant on the project. John? Sir, were you sworn in earlier tonight? Yes, sir. Okay. Can you spell your last name for us? M-I-K-L-O-S. Thank you. Good evening. John Nichols, Biotech Consulting. Uh, local address is 6 6011 Benjamin Road, Tampa, Florida, main office 3025 East South Street, Orlando, Florida. I'm the president and senior project manager of Biotech Consulting. I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Limnology. 
I have more than 28 years of professional environmental consulting experience, conducted and contributed to environmental evaluations and permitting on land in Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, Texas, Colorado, New Jersey, and the Bahamas, totaling somewhere around 300,000 acres, most of which was in the state of Florida. I've served on various environmental and land use boards over the last 15 years, including two years on FDEP's Environmental Regulation Commission, nine years on the St. John's River Water Management District's Governing Board, five and a half of those as chairman. And I was on Governor DeSantis's transition team where I served with Congressman Mast on the Environment, Agriculture and Natural Resources Advisory Committee. I, uh, I know there were some questions from one of the commissioners originally about gopher tortoises. I know Ms. Terrapani responded to those. I can go into detail on that. I can answer questions. I can do neither. Um, appetite of the, the commission. Sir, why don't you just go ahead and make your presentation? I All think right. there were questions about the gopher tortoises, the eagles. Um, so I'll, I'll be brief on the tortoises since you guys probably already have that information. There are two primary methods of extraction for gopher tortoises. Um, there's about five authorized by the state of Florida. 95% of tortoises are extracted using either excavation via a backhoe or bucket trapping. Probably 90% of those 95% are done via backhoe excavation. And the reasons are, are, are pretty simple. Uh, it, it's, it's actually a safer method of extraction for the tortoises. It's more timely. And one of the, the key components is it allows you to get to the bottom of the burrow. And one of the interesting things about gopher tortoises is the other species that live in the bottom of the burrow, generally with the tortoise, sometimes without the tortoise. Includes Florida mice, gopher frogs, gopher cr crickets, and in a very rare occasion, an indigo snake. So when you're bucket trapping, it's a situation where you dig a hole in front of the burrow, you place a five gallon bucket there, and per Florida statute, you wait 30 days, the tortoise walks out, it falls in the bucket, you take the tortoise and go. It never gives you the opportunity to get to the bottom of the burrow and find out if there are any commensal species there. The other thing is a timing perspective. Uh, this time of year, you have to have 30 days above 50 degrees. It doesn't happen that often. You often run into situations where you get two weeks in, you hit a day below 50, you have to start over again. Um, it's also the flip of that in the summer. You end up with situations where you're required to check the bucket twice a day. You check the bucket in the morning, you miss it. You can have tortoises fall in right after you check it. When you check it by the afternoon, tortoises can be suffering heat exhaustion and other issues. And there is the rare occasion where you have two tortoises in one burrow. So if you bucket trap them, one tortoise falls, you close the burrow, you take the bucket, you could miss the other tortoise. Um, over the last 30 years, and if you notice, I said I have 20 years of professional experience, I have 30 years of gopher tortoise experience. We've conducted and relocated somewhere over 13,000 gopher tortoises um, throughout the state, a few in Georgia, but mostly in the state of Florida. Um, with no significant issues. Um, beyond that, I wanted to touch on the, the memo we got today from Ms. Graham. We did get it late in the day, but there were some points I wanted to make about it. Um, one, of, one of the first points that is made in section one, conservation and habitat in Ms. Graham's memo, uh, talks about uh, the burden of demonstrating the site will not result in significant adverse impacts to the environment. I've been permitting development for 28 years in the state of Florida and other parts of the country. I haven't seen a development like this in all that time. Um, very similar to what Ms. Terrapani was noting, Normally you would see use of all the available uplands, increased wetland impacts, maximizing the site, fixing all the geometric issues in terms of how the site lays out. Uh, Morgan Group has gone above and beyond to avoid that. It's very rare that we have a situation where we're preserving this much uplands and, and such a minimal impact to wetlands. Uh, the, the 0.88 acres of wetland impact is comprised of two small isolated systems that just kind of sit in the middle of everything. The systems are currently 
dominated by Brazilian pepper and some other exotic vegetation. And they're serving little or no ecological value in the landscape today. You now, other points, we were just talking about gopher tortoises. The, the, this site, although it has gopher tortoises, gopher tortoises, it's not the ideal location for gopher tortoises. As you all know, we're right next to US-19. Uh, you also have a limited footprint of habitat there. What that limited footprint does is it decreases the gene pool. It, it damages the tortoises from a long-term uh, genetics perspective. And ultimately the, the species will, will wither away across the site. When we relocate tortoises, we take them to significantly large tracts of land that are encumbered with conservation easements, have long-term perpetually funded management plans and it's a, a more conducive environment for the species and it's more of a regional perspective. Looking at the site the way you are, it's, it's more of a, we call it a postage stamp, right? So it's a little spit of land in the middle of a dense urban area that has limited ecological value and the tortoises are to a certain degree doomed there over time anyway. You may be able to, you'll keep them alive for probably longer than we'll be alive because they live for a while, but the amount of habitat, the ability to manage that habitat appropriately doesn't really exist. Again, we just talked about the wetland impacts. That level of wetland impact is insignificant, does not merit any level of significant environmental impact. And then the, the, the second part of that is when we permit these impacts with the Southwest Florida Water Management District, we're going to implement a fairly comprehensive management plan that will encompass all the on-site remaining wetlands as well as the upland preservation areas. Those areas will be managed and maintained to eliminate the exotic vegetation, keep them free of exotic vegetation and promote uh, native vegetation and native growth in those areas. It'll also help with what we've seen in the Eagle Zones. Uh, if you've been out there, you've seen pictures, you know, the site has been a target of dumping. A lot of people go out there four wheeling. There's uh, significant, or there were at least significant homeless encampments there. Um, a lot of which we believe led to the lack of utilization of the eagle nests in the 2019, 2020 season, and now into the 2020, 2021 season. Um, but with our plan, the, the, the lion's share of the, of the optimal eagle habitat on the site, the larger pine trees, is being left intact. Uh, as, as, as Ms. Graham's memo goes on, she, she, she calls out some quotes from Ms. Walker. And Ms. Walker states in her opinion that the project's impacts are too great, it won't be sustainable. And she's tying most of that to uh, the connection to the eagle's nests. She also goes into the, the concept of carrying capacity. Uh, I didn't have time to, to research if, if Pinellas County is, is at its carrying capacity for eagles nests. I, I don't know. I know that uh, you have a significant number of eagles in this county that have adapted to other environments. It's, it's very common across the country where you have eagles nesting on power poles, you have eagles nesting in oak trees, uh, stadium lights, a variety of different areas. They prefer pine trees. Pine trees are great for them, a lot easier for them to build a nest in, but they're able to adapt to those things. But again, our project is retaining all those pine trees, retaining and protecting the two nests that are on site. Um, and when we talk about the nests, the smaller the nest, the southern nest is uh, it's quite dilapidated. It clearly hasn't been used in, I don't know, certainly not the last two seasons. The larger nest is also somewhat dilapidated and uh, recent, as recent as yesterday, we were able to view the nest via a drone and a, a great horned owl has moved into that nest. And I'll photo that if, if you'd like to have it passed around. Uh, you know, I, we suspected that the homeless encampments initially drove the eagles off. The, the large encampment was at the base of the large nest tree, uh, care of a significant area. It, it makes a mess. We've run into that on other sites across the state and that tends to drive them off, but it could very well have just been the, the great horned owl. I think with the way our plans laid out, if the owl doesn't uh, leave the nest anytime soon, we still are retaining the pine trees in the south, southern part of the site where 
eagles, if they were so desirous, could move into that portion of the site, build nests, and continue forth without, hopefully without any interference from the great horned owls. Uh, Ms. Graham's memo goes on to some comments from Mr. Parisi, who was talking about plant life. The, he references the original report that was submitted to the city from uh, the previous environmental consultant, ECS. Uh, ECS's report was preliminary in nature. It, it might've been a little lean, but it was adequate and it was correct. Uh, my firm has done additional studies across the site. And uh, those studies began in July of 2019 when we were first tasked by Morgan Group to inspect the Eagle's Nest and inspect the site. We've been regularly looking at the site since then, uh, vegetation, the wetlands, the eagle's nest. So we've been monitoring the site through that process. Uh, there are no listed plant species on the site, so there's nothing there. Uh, further comments go on from Mrs. Matthews or Mathis. <laughs> She's, she makes some comments about lasting adverse uh, impacts based on impacts to tortoises and the pines. I disagree completely. Uh, the tortoises are gonna end up in a better spot. And again, the majority of the pine trees will remain. I know there's some further, there's been a lot of discussion about Hayes Road and uh, by bringing that road through, you know, from, an, from an impact perspective, you're going to lose an additional acre and a half of impact. So it's almost a, it's a 200% increase in impacts from where we are. That wetland is a little bit better in quality than the wetlands we are impacting, but the, one of the key differences is that wetland is connected over as it, it flows back to the west and has connection tidally into the river. Uh, that will necessitate additional permitting with the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, you may be aware, you may not be aware that state of Florida just assumed the 404 permitting from EPA and would be handling that. Regardless of that fact, it will still be a lengthy process uh, and it's additional impact. But not only in that, adding that road into you lose additional wetlands, you'll lose some of these pine trees that we're talking about that provide some of the habitat that we're looking at for the eagles. Um, let's see, what else did I have? I think that was kind of the high points. You know, again, the effort made to avoid the significant wetlands, the significant areas of habitat is uh, something I haven't seen on a lot of projects. And the impacts and the plan overall has a negligible impact on the environment. There's, there's so many other uses of this site that would have a more significant impact and a more detriment, uh, more detriment to the environment but with the additional buffering, with the preservation of everything along the river, with the preservation of all the wetlands, stormwater protocols, uh, you know, we feel this is a uh, well-designed, uh, effective development, and um, you know, I would hope it meets with your approval. Um, with that, I can answer any questions you may have. Questions of the commission, Vice Mayor? Thank you. Uh, thanks for the explanation between bucket and backhoe, and uh, I appreciate the details that came back from the planner as well. Um, can you just touch base real quick on the options for mitigation? Uh, I believe you have three of them. It's on-site, off-site within the county, and then within the district. Right. So when you mitigate for wetland impacts, whether it's state or federal, you're bound to stay within your hydrologic unit. So if you're able to mitigate on-site, all those problems are solved. So from a state perspective, when we talk about Southwest Florida Water Management District, our plan is to mitigate on site. That mitigation will include a long-term management and enhancement plan of the remaining wetlands. Uh, the, the wetlands that we're currently impacting, one is 0.11 and one's, the other one's 0.77 acres. The wetland that's 0.11 acres does not require mitigation per Florida statute. The wetland is 0.77 acres does. However, as I stated, it's extremely uh, impacted with exotic vegetation. So it's gonna store, score extremely low. So we need a very minimal lift to mitigate for it. Our enhancement plan should provide eight to 10 times the mitigation that we need. Uh, 
when you score it out per the uh, uniform mitigation assessment methodology as prescribed by Florida statute. Uh, from a federal perspective, however, we'd be bound if Hayes Road was to go in, um, uh, and Ms. Tara Penny spoke to it, if Hayes Road were to go in, I believe we could mitigate all the impacts on site for the state with our enhancement management plan. However, it, since it would require a federal authorization, which would now be issued by FDEP, it would require federal mitigation credits from an approved mitigation bank uh, within the area. Uh, those credits would have to come, I believe, from Citrus County, mm -hmm. and it would just be for the federal, you know, I, we're still looking at pricing if we have to do that, how that would work out, I, I don't know for sure, but it would definitely be mitigation that's out of the county uh, for those impacts from a federal perspective. So if I understand correctly, I mean, there's there's an option of mitigating with the state on site, which is would be most preferred. Secondly, would be that within the county or the district area. And then third would just be the whole district itself. So when you mitigate on site, that's more of a positive situation for the project. Am I understanding that correctly? It, 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 it varies from project to project. Some projects on site mitigation is not the way to go. Um, this project with the connectivity to the river, uh, some of the systems that are already starting to become overrun with uh, Brazilian pepper and whatnot, it's, it's definitely a, a, a good situation. But again, back to, then the second step would be offsite mitigation somewhere else, but not necessarily a mitigation bank. Third option would be a mitigation bank. Okay. But keep in mind, if the federal aspect is pursued and we have to put in the impact for Hayes Road and we have to purchase mitigation credits, those credits would be, they'd be able to cover both the state and the federal mitigation, therefore not necessitating the on-site plan. Understood. Thank you. Mr. Donovan, you have questions? Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, this might not be a question for you specifically, but I hope it is. When you mentioned committing to the bronze uh, building standards and using the green building consultant, what does that mean? What are the bronze standards versus the silver standards, gold standards? Kind of what does that come with? That is definitely not me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who is there somebody here from like an environmental <laughs> aspect that would be able to answer that? We'll find out when Mr. Armstrong comes back up. Any other questions of this witness though? No, I just, I, I learned a lot about the gopher tortoise and eagle protection, so I appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Hang on, sir. Uh, Mayor, do you have questions of this uh, witness? You're on mute, Mayor. We can't hear you. No, I do not have any questions. Um, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Vaticato, do you have questions? I do. Yes, sir. Sorry, I didn't get your name. John Miklos. Say the last name again. Miklos. Miklos? Yes. Uh, good evening, Mr. Miklos. Um, you, you mentioned something about the, um, you know, it, it's kind of a small parcel uh, in an urbanized area. Um, can you give a sense of what the overall conservation value of this site would be, kind of from your professional language description? Sure. So, uh, and, and I touched on it briefly. When we look at conservation and mitigation, I also do a tremendous amount of mitigation bank permitting across the, the Southeast US. So when we look at conservation measures and mitigation efforts and where you can actually create environmental lift and preserve rare habitats and important habitats, you generally need some scale. Uh, that's not to say that there are sites smaller sites in different areas that can, that, can, that can be valuable. But as a rule, we would never look at a, a conservation or an ecological enhancement site next to a six lane highway. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's just, it doesn't fit the box. Um, we usually look at thousands, we're usually talking thousands of acres, not tens of acres. And I think you can see that when you look at most conservation lands or wildlife management tracks around the state. For instance, when I was chairman at St. John's, we had somewhere in the neighborhood of 500,000 acres in conservation and, and management. The smallest of those was 900 acres. Mm. Um, just because 
when, when you talk about ecosystem management, you're really looking at a mosaic of different communities and how those communities interact together, how wildlife moves across those areas and how the system is managed and maintained from a long-term perspective. There's not one native system in the state of Florida that isn't supposed to be maintained by fire. There's just not. And we're clearly not gonna go out to this site and fire manage it on a regular basis. It's just not gonna work. Um, and that's, you know, when you look at things like that and factors like that, that come into play. So when we, when we were talking about mitigation a second ago, yes, we can mitigate for tiny little wetland impacts by doing some work on this site and finding a nominal level of ecological improvement. But what we can't do is take a site like this and turn it into a true mitigation site from a bank or some type of regional perspective where the water management district or army corps of engineers would say, Hey, this is great habitat. This is a good ecosystem. This site doesn't fit that box. I, I understand that there's a lot of passion behind this piece of property and the Eagle's nests are there and there's tortoises there. But at the end of the day, Eagles aren't currently there. Their habitat's going to be maintained. Tortoises are moved constantly. It, it, it's if you part left, of that. If you left the site as it was, um, don't do anything to it. Is it going to improve from a, a value? Or Absolutely it, not. The, so site will, would, the site will continue to degrade. Uh, the, the, one of the problems that we've, we have is the establishment of Brazilian pepper. That will continue to spread through the wetlands and engulf them. Okay. It's an exotic species that moves by brute force and it will continue and will take those systems and turn them into a monoculture of just Brazilian pepper. Uh, that's an important factor. Uh, you know, you'll continue to have vandalism, homeless folks. I mean, obviously those are some things you can do um, with that, but you also have people coming in on the river and, and doing things. So right. with those yeah. factors, if it's left as is, it will continue to decline. Yeah, not, notwithstanding the human element, let's say that the whole thing was cordoned off, 10 foot high fence, the whole thing. If it was just left to mother nature's doing, would it improve or decline in your opinion? So it would decline and the community types would succeed into something else. So as I stated, all community, all vegetative communities in the state of Florida are fire driven. So, so it eventually evolves into a different community. So you type. need burns and things like that. Uh, okay. And, and, uh, so you, uh, you would also need enhancements of other type. To, right. Okay. There, are, there are means to skirt around burning. There are some mechanical means that work, but some of the communities on this site have gone beyond that, and they have to be just managed as they are. Um, have you worked on grants for purchasing properties before? Yeah. Yes, I have. I've uh, done numerous submittals, particularly to the Acquisition and Restoration Council for FDEP, uh, for projects to be shortlisted for Florida forever. Um, I know there was some talk about this for this site. I can tell you that the 2020 five-year plan for Florida forever came out. The site's not on it. In fact, no Pinellas County sites are on it and no sites referencing if, the Anacloat River on it. If, if there was a grant pursued, just in your opinion, where would it fit in competitively for something like this? Uh, this would be a low priority. A low priority. Low priority. Okay. And part um, of that is, is a lot of that's tied to size and the di diversity of the site. Well, well, what parts would be the most valuable on that site? Um, I mean, I, I know I, I'm familiar with the site. Um, I, I know that they used to use it for dune buggies and whatever, right. four wheelers. And there used to be a canal that's been filled in that, that kind of went through the center of it. Um, it's, it's um, you know, we used to describe it as a sand hill or is that a sand hill community? And, yes. And I, I know there's better ones uh, and, and this was probably marginal for that. And, um, but what would be the most environmentally valuable part of that site? So the tidal wetlands on the, in the, south, in the south, the riverfront and the, the, what I believe Cindy calls the nature preserve where the trail is that bit of a hammock back there, it's not a hammock, but I mean, it's, it's dominated mostly by pines, but that area back there, because it's tucked into those wetlands, it does provide additional potential nesting habitat for eagles. And it, pre it creates a good upland area between those wetland systems. So a, a lot of times we, when you hear about the South Florida water, Southwest Florida requiring buffering. So the original concept behind the buffering was 
two things. One, to create a zone that would keep humans out for the most part, away from the direct edge of the wetland. The second thing was to create a zone between development and the wetland for those, uh, we call them upland dependent wetland species. So they're species that live in the wetlands all the time, mm -hmm. but they have to breed in the uplands or nest in the uplands or feed in the uplands or whatever the case may be. That buffer creates that zone. So you can have an area like that where you've got that pine system, some of those oaks are coming in there and you've got that wetland wrapping around it. It's, it's a fairly unique area. Okay. Um, and you mentioned the, um, the wetlands for the uh, Hayes Road, if we went that direction. Yes. That's achievable uh, to mitigate that yeah. and permittable. It is permittable, opinion. particularly okay. for a road mandated by the city. We would be able to permit it. It would just take longer, cost more in mitigation, require out of county mitigation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, sir. Appreciate it. Mr. Armstrong, do you have any questions? No, sir. Ms. Graham, do you have any questions of this witness? No. She's shaking her head no. Thank you. So we'll go on to the next witness, Mr. Armstrong. I have no further witnesses. I would just... Um, remind uh, Mr. Trask and our mayors, our parliamentarian, at the appropriate time, I do have questions from Ms. Graham. Gotcha, I understand. I, I had a question on civil. Civil. Gonna put on a civil engineer? We haven't uh, yet, but we have a civil engineer here who can, who's involved with the project. And if you'd like me to make him available, I will. I, I have some questions from a civil perspective. It's up to you, it's your case. Yeah, we'll put them up. I, I think I, the gentleman back there with the black mask is who spoke in the past and, and whoever else would be available. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna do you. one witness at a time. So who are we gonna call Mr. Armstrong? Nathan. Yes, sir. Could you provide us our, his name again? Provide his name again. Nathan Lee with Kimley Horn & Associates, 655 North Franklin Street, Tampa, Florida, 33602. Thank you. Nathan can, Nathan, can you please summarize your credentials in the field of civil engineering? Uh, yes. I've uh, been practicing a state of Florida professional engineer for over 15 years in the state of Florida, mainly the Tampa area. And I have a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of Kentucky. Okay. Um, you have any questions? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, may I have your last name again, please? Lee, L-E-E. -E. Lee? Yes. Okay, Mr. Lee, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to confirm a question that I asked Ms. Terrapani. Um, have there been any um, claims uh, I'm sorry, have there been any uh, studies to support the claim of environmental impact for the Hayes Road uh, that you're aware of? In regards to what part of environmental impact? Yes, in other words, you, 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 I would suspect it was your kind of group, your area that laid out the, 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 the uh, what would you call it, the proposed or the, conce the concept of connecting the Hayes Road right of way? Yes, we chose the most optimal for that kind of access, which would be a rural section to so you didn't have a lot of infrastructure included with that. So I mean, but we didn't do like a phase one or a phase two right. for like groundwater. We didn't do any of that. We just looked at it from an effective, uh, not shortest route, but the kind of a, a, a good design for a road sort of thing without looking at the environment or its impact or anything. Yes, sir. I mean, you took it into account, but you didn't do anything special to, to avoid any environmental impacts or anything. As far when you're talking environmental here, are you talking everything, groundwater for, for? No, no, just in general. I mean, you, what I'm trying to determine is that it gets back to this waiver that's being requested for uh, of a second access. And, and there's some, uh, you know, this single access is being considered to be superior um, because of the environmental impact of Hayes Road and also the, the impact on the um, neighboring streets with the additional traffic. 
And what I'm trying to do is uh, determine whether there was any studies, uh, not studies, but any work done on your part from the standpoint of um, determining what the environmental impact would be. Did you quantify what the environmental impact would be? Yes, that's where we got, I mean, we worked with uh, John. He okay. just spoke about the wetland impacts from the shortest route from our development to Jasmine. Okay. Um, the grading issue, um, I, there, was a, there was some discussion by Ms. Terrapani on the grading. And as I looked at the grading detail that was provided, um, and it was the back of the, um, um, the report that was done earlier uh, showing this concept, I think it was, um, I forgot which ones, but, but basically it seems to me that I, the project was designed the elevation of the site is increased. It's being elevated for the purpose of floodplain, and, and we heard some Portions testimony it, on yes. that. And then I see where the um, Hayes, the road that from on site that would eventually connect to Hayes Road, was um, basically uh, connected at the tail end of this one parking lot that was at the southeast side of the um, yes yeah, southeast side of the buildings. I don't know the building numbers, but there's a parking lot and so forth. And it seems the grading lines that y'all, that you provided, I wish I could remember which report that was in. It's ah. this one right here. Yes, sir. Um, it, the, 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 the grading lines that you're proposing for this road that would connect to Hayes Road is basically picked up off the grade of the highest of the buildings well, itself, we had to consider what kind of upland area we had and we did raise the site for some, right. some of the uh so some... what i'm getting at is it seems to me that there's some claim because of the amount of fill that's being brought in it's not because of the road being an issue but it's because of the fact that the the buildings and the elevations have already been designed so if we want to put in a road that would eventually connect to hayes road we're going to pick up off the established or proposed design for those buildings and that parking out elevation and work it in that way. If Hayes Road, is, Hayes Road is meant to be an extension for access of this site, the buildings have to be in a finished floor of 10 feet or higher. Right. For based on FEMA, foot, you know, base flood elevation. But the, I'm talking, what about the parking lot though? We're well, going to have curbs. So it's going to be just about as high. I think some of these elevations were in the four elevation four area. So, okay. That's yes, you cor you're correct in your statement. I was just explaining that we really couldn't lower the site to accommodate less fill. Yeah, I mean, I'm getting to something, but you, but you've answered that question um, well enough in that regard. Um, I, I guess the um, uh, basically the, the my point was if a, if a second access was considered early on, perhaps the elevation of that parking lot would have been different. To accommodate transitioning to that road a little better that eventually led to Hayes Road. Um, I, I do have a question though on the elevation. There's zero elevation on the uh, profile of the road that's being proposed. What datum is that? Is that sea level? Yes, sir. The, the, the profile of the road itself. Yeah, that we didn't have survey in this area. We had LIDAR, but zero would be sea level. Yes. Okay. That's what I was going to ask. I don't know so, if it's NABD, I'm pretty sure it's NABD 88. So that would be the vertical datum, which is 1988. Okay. Yeah, NABD 88. But that's based on sea level. Yeah, and so. I was going to ask you who did do the survey. It hasn't been done. LIDAR, it's, you're basing it off LIDAR. Uh, we, had sur we have survey for our site. We didn't have survey of this particular that, That's area. what I'm getting yes. at on the Hayes Road. You still, what I'm getting at is you're showing some, some grading and elevation that has to be done. You've got a road profile. And I was just kind of questioning where is that? We had, some, we had some points over there and we did interpolate the best we could okay. to try to give like, hey, this is what our... But that's not based on any additional work that you've done on that site in that right-of-way area. No, okay. we, I mean, we, we looked at it. All right. Um, the 40-foot um, the right-of-way, um, um, uh, I, I won't ask that. I was gonna. It was an issue of uh, how much is enough, sort of thing. But we can we can talk about that later. Um, I'm not going to talk about a one way right now. 
How long have you, you answered that as far as how long you've been working on the project. Um, okay, as far as the permit that for this road, um, and, and I would suspect your, your firm, your Kimberly Horn would be doing the permitting for that, the environmental permitting, or would that be someone else to, to obtain- Wetlands the, or- On there, the wetlands, yes. For wetlands, it would be probably- uh, Okay. Yeah. All right. Fair it would enough. be a combination because there'd be stormwater and wetlands and right. I think that was it. Thank you. Thank you. Hang on a second, sir. Mayor, do you have questions of Mr. Lee? No, I do not. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Donovan? Yeah, Mr. Lee, sorry, uh, again, if this isn't for you, but just it says you guys will commit to achieving the bronze certification through NGBS for Anquote Harbor. Just if I could get any indication as to what the bronze certification means, whether it's what building materials are being used or what you guys are impacting, something like that. I'm not LEED certified and I couldn't be, I couldn't answer that question. Okay. If there is anybody from the applicant side that could just even touch base on kind of what that has to do with. Okay, we'll de deal with that after this witness then. Okay. okay, I have no questions for you, thank you. You have any questions, uh, Vice Mayor? No. Okay, so any questions, Mr. Armstrong, this witness? Okay, don't stand Don't stand down yet, just Mitchell Lee. Um, Ms. Graham, do you have questions of this witness? Thank you very much. Okay, so thank Mr. You. Armstrong, you have a question about LEEDs. I don't know the answer. Fundamentally, that's um, really a construction type question. And I do know contractors and they are experts in the lead certification process and how many points it takes to get what level and all of that. But I would just ask you to keep in mind of where we are in the process. We're trying to, still trying to determine if our proposed use is acceptable. So we're not gonna have every answer to every final question uh, we're just trying to find out if we can move forward or not. So we, we don't have anyone on our team that could answer your questions about lead. I get it, but that just just so to clarify, that has to do with the actual construction of the buildings. The lead, yes. Okay, I'm getting yeses. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other witnesses? No, sir. Okay, thank you. So Ms. Graham, it is now your turn to put on your case and you call your first witness. Yeah, but not quite yet. Um, good evening, Commission. My name is Jane Graham. I represent concerned citizens of Tarpon Springs. Um, it's getting late, so I know that you probably want this to go a little quick. I'm going to present to you a number of witnesses tonight. You'll hear from Mr. Peter Doflos first, who is the president of concerned citizens of Tarpon Springs. Um, then you will hear from Ms. Barbara Walker, who is a expert on eagles and raptors. You'll hear from Mr. Parisi, who has expertise in plants, as well as Ms. Nicole Matthews, who is also an ecologist. You'll be hearing from um, a traffic expert. He's a traffic planner. His name is Eric Houston. Um, as to some issues relating to the traffic. And um, finally, you'll be hearing from Dr. Brooke Hansen on several issues relating to flooding and, and um, sea level rise. The, the thing I'd like to leave you with, or actually to let you start with is, and this is something that city attorney Trask has opened the meeting with is, you know, as you make these decisions tonight as members of the commission, you have to look at the competent substantial evidence and see if it meets the burden um, and, and the criteria of the city's code and comp plan. And we'll show you tonight that for a variety of reasons there, that the applicant is not able to meet this burden and should be denied. Now, I do wanna put a number of things on the record if I may. First of all, um, 
We appreciate the opportunity to be able to conduct this in a manner where we can take direct testimony, cross-examination, and objections. We have left it on the record and we, we renew this, that we are an affected party for purposes of a quasi-judicial hearing. And I would just note that the city does not have specific criteria as to how they define an affected party for these purposes. And we could go into case law, but this is something that, um, you know, it's, we, we maintain based on our standing that we do. The other thing I, I would like to say as well is I don't know when he's going to try to call me for cross-examination, but I fully object to being cross-examined by Mr. Armstrong. I am not a witness, I am an attorney, and I require or and I request that he proffer any evidence that he thinks that I have as far as material facts before I'm subjected to this type of cross-examination. I am simply an attorney. So with that said, I'd like to call Mr. Dalakos as our first witness. Mr. Delacus, were you sworn in earlier tonight? Of course. All right, thank you. If you could stand as close as you can to that microphone, it's really hard to catch everything as, that's being said. Ms. Graham, is it, would it be best for you and your witnesses to come down to this podium? I mean, you have the, the right to do that. The other party did. Would you like to do that? I'm comfortable here right now. Okay, thank all right. You. So, oh, Mr. Donovan, Mr. Carr, Chris, see that? Pocahontas, Sitting Bull, Geronimo, everybody see that? Mr. Delacus, if you would, well, you know, face the sure. commission. Well, they don't have the opportunity to see because there's no camera. It, they're right. not making the decision, this commission is. Okay. What I would like to, uh, Peter Lux 514 Ashland Avenue, currently president of the citizens of Tarpon Springs, sometimes known as the Friends of the Anklote. Some of the people in here are kind of new to what this property has gone through. So I'm just gonna kind of give you a little brief history. 2004, Walmart came to the city and wanted to put a super center in. I was on the board and I went through the whole process. So I know what you are going through and I know what you have the ability to do. But this was not started by me. It was started by a group of citizens back off of Jasmine, yes, in Sail Harbor and Leisure Lakes, those were the first affected. <clears throat> And they were the ones that organized and through the years raised funds, to, uh, hired their own attorneys and their experts to provide information to the board at that time about this property and what its benefits could be to the citizens. But I want to say something because there's been a real big question about standing here. Standing is what we here believe the concerned citizens are is we are representing all of the people at Tarpon Springs who are affected and have the potential to benefit from this property. But we are not the first friends of the Anklote. The first friends of the Anklote was God. And I will quote here, Genesis 1-20, let the water teem with living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing and moving thing with it to the water teams. And God saw that it was good. 
And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the burden increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning. And then God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God said, it was good. And then later, after he created man, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and then subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. God saw that he had made and it was good. And there was evening and there was morning. But God didn't say to abuse the lands or the creatures. His directive was to take care of it. And I show you the pictures of the Indians because it's ironic, as I was getting ready today, I turned on the TV channel 641, and there was Chris Stills giving his narrative again about the photograph or the pictures he designed for the legislature. And so many of them involved environmental scenes. But one of them was how the Spaniards came in and kicked the Indians off their property. And they were the original stewards in our current cultural history. And I point that out because this has been a history that began years ago. And we, the concerned citizens of Tarpon Springs, are now the current stewards of this land. It was spoken about um, this property not having really that kind of value. And I do have to uh, interject a couple of side notes here where Mr. Armstrong had mentioned that they were given a big old document today. Well, as he had mentioned in the first meeting when they got the email from the turn for the tide and he sort of scolded the uh, author of that, it was explained to him why it was at that point. And I just wanna reiterate some information that was provided at the first meeting. Ms. Tara Panny said she'd been working on this project for three years and plus. There were the gentlemen from various groups here working from July of 19. They had put their application in, she had mentioned back in August of 19. They had a lot of time to prepare. We didn't learn about this till the end of November. So we've been the ones that have been burdened to provide you this evidence that we believe we have that's valid. There's numerous things that we're going to go over, but some of the highlights I would like to say is that preserving this property is more important than just not keeping this land vacant. This property has the potential to preserve the identity of our small town character and our cultural heritage. But directly being bordering the border, it does have value. I submitted earlier a uh, four page document. And in there, there's a section under the coastal management section about the Anclote River watershed. Pinellas County Spent, started in 2017 and they prepared an Anclote River watershed. And in it, they state that the Anclote River watershed within Pinellas County has an area of over 9,095 acres and is the largest river system in Pinellas County. The river is a valuable recreational destination. In recent years, the watershed and its associated natural resources have begun to exhibit signs of ecological stress and the watershed is now listed on the state's verified waters list for dissolved oxygens and nutrients. I'm not sure if any of y'all have actually taken the opportunity to look at this property. If you go on Google and do the satellite and follow it up a river and you will see it winds very like, oof, this way, that way, this way, that way, all the way up through Pasco and uh, Northwest Hillsboro to its heads. And most of the area, yes, is either developed with mobile home parks, winding around subdivisions, and there are very few places along the river left. 
So it's imperative that you look at your stewardship and preserving what we can of this river because it does have opportunities for value. <sighs> Ms. Terrapani had mentioned that uh, for years we did nothing. Why didn't anything happen? Well, I didn't join the board of the Friends of the Anklote till around 2012. From that time, for a couple of years, we worked with the Trust for Public Lands to make an offer to purchase this property. The gentleman who came down from TPL was a liaison between us, the city, and Walmart. And the city manager is well aware of the number of meetings we had with regards to this property. Approximately late 13, 2014, somewhere in that range, uh, TPL downsized their Tallahassee office. The gentleman who helped us let go, but he still said he would help us in some regards. But in the meantime, what we learned, and uh, I respect the gentleman who spoke about Florida forever, but I have to clarify something. Yes, Amendment 1 passed, and there is a Florida Forever program. And that is, as he said, for large properties like St. John's, St. Joe's up in the Panhandle. But he neglected to state that there is a Florida Communities Trust Grant program. And you know, I've been here many times telling you about it. Mark knows, all of you, 25%, that's all you need to put in. These programs are designed for cities, counties, and F uh, 5013Cs nonprofits. So it was offered, I believe, originally at around 8.8 .8 million. At that time, the assessed value was 4.4. .4. Now, if you look, the assessed value is probably about five something. If we had approached Walmart, I'm sure they would have loved the PR to sell it at six. So all we need is a million and a half. Now, I have a copy of the beacon from 2013 where Mark stated he had a million dollars in penny for Pinellas funds. All we needed maybe a million, another half million. The county would have done it. And from what I've learned since then, the county has made approaches for the city to purchase this property. We spent almost 2 million for Sun Bay and the Hoffman property and demolition for what, maybe an acre where we could use that million and a half, two, dollar, two million for 72 acres. Now, I wanna explain a little aspect of what we, the friends over the years have also done. We sent not only that information about Florida Communities Trust Grants, but we spoke to you and I've sent you emails about the city creating their own mitigation bank. And as the gentleman said, developers need to go out and purchase grant uh, credits. And those are valuable. He didn't tell you how much, but sometimes they run into the hundreds of thousand dollars. Why not the city, if they got the property, create the mitigation bank? We don't need to have a big property, but we've got at least 20 something acres of wetlands with Brazilian peppers that could be mitigated. That would be done. Somebody else would give us money to get rid of the peppers and restore those wetlands. I'd like to share some of the thoughts that we've come up over the years. Joan Scalen and some of Andy Annis from Sail Harbor started this. Andy Annis was a Marine veteran. And one of his strongest beliefs of something to do on this park was a disabled veterans fitness trail. Some of you are aware of it. You provide a fitness trail for veterans. How many times on this board and previous boards, have you heard about a boat ramp access? The property they were going to give you on that 
northwest corner quite easily because it's so close to the bridge. It's not deep in the channel. It's right there. It's the deepest section. You put in a boat ramp, all that bare grass or that bare sand along the first run of US 19, you put in a parking lot for trailers, paid parking, you generate revenue. So I've given you two things for revenue, mitigation, parking. Another option we have put forth is partnering with San Pete College and or USF. And as Jane has mentioned, Ms. Hansen will speak later and she's with USF. But the value of putting a small research facility on that property where the students from SPC can learn environmental sciences, they have a, a department for that. They're based in Seminole campus, but from my understanding, we have biology teachers here at SPC Tarpon. USF, they do marine studies. Well, we know they predominantly do study, studies of the Gulf, but they also believe that studies would be needed to be done upriver, especially with the Enclote Watershed Management Plan, because one of the things they would have to do is assess nutrient loads and things of that nature. And if you're not familiar with it, Danklot River is on the Blue Canoe Trails. We've talked about having an equestrian therapy center. Now that would maybe possibly require purchasing that 10 acre prop property that's just to the east, that's predominantly grass and some, some open area where you could easily put in a barn and a stable and some trail areas that you could access into the east side of the property. And your nature trails and things that people could come to for respite. As I read to you back at the last meeting, and I put it in a record there, how important it is that people are finding out that they need to have natural spaces for rest and respite. And I know that's true. I went camping a few weeks ago out in Polk County and they're way ahead of us. Way ahead, the Lake Wales Ridge Forest Park. They got the Dinner Lake, they got Lake Arbuckle. Walk in the water, Kiowaka. That's what they call it in Indian. Other things that I think were somewhat neglected in regards to this project, in a sense, not necessarily environmental, but it affects the city in other ways. One thing that wasn't brought up that I could see in any of the staff reports was anything from the housing element in the comp plan. You heard previously that rents in this property would go from 1,500 to 2,500. But in your housing element, the city of Tarpon Springs shall provide a mix of adequate housing to meet the needs of the existing and future population, objective one. The city shall assist the private sector in providing a mixture of number of housing types to meet the city's housing needs. One, two, the city shall create and preserve affordable housing for all current and anticipated future residents. And one dash 10, city shall increase workforce housing opportunities, particularly within proximities of places to employment and transit facilities. I don't know about you, but for a lot of working people, $1,500 is a lot to crack for a one bedroom. There's a whole bunch of other things here that uh, I could go over, I did submit this. But I, I do wanna let you know, as I said, I've been on that side. And I know it'll be a tough decision, but you are the stewards of Tarpon Springs. You are the ones that need to protect and preserve not only this property for its own identity, the eagles, the gopher tortoises, as the gentleman mentioned, there's possibly indigo snakes, 
Florida snake, uh, Florida squirrels, all these other creatures that are there on the property. I'd like to uh, share another section. This is from Job 12. 12, let's see, let me, let's see 7-12. But ask the animals, and they will teach you, or the birds of the air, and they will tell you, or speak to the earth, and it will teach you, or let the fish of the sea inform you. Which of all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. Does not the ear test words as the tongue tests food? Is not wisdom found among the aged? Does not long life bring understanding? To God belong wisdom and power, counsel and understanding are his. So, as I stated, there have been many friends of the Anklote for years and years and years. And we're not a closed organization. We don't ask for membership fees. We don't have people submit an application to be admitted. These are just the people that are concerned about what's going on in their community. And as Many of you were, we sent you flyers, we even sent Mr. Armstrong a few, and I've told him, and I'll tell you now, over the last few weeks, we've probably handed at least, well, let's see, we started with 250, and then we ordered another 500, and then another 250, and another 70, so that's over 1,000 flyers that we've handed out and distributed to the various neighborhoods surrounding this property. We've distributed to Brittany Lake, River Watch, Sail Harbor, North Lake Village, Leisure Lakes, Beckett, Beckett Bay. We spoke to hundreds of people. Many of them didn't know, really. I know a lot of people don't pay attention to the, this inner stuff going on and the COVID and there's not as much notice. I mean, we just didn't find out to the end of November, but these people didn't know. And I do have a point to bring up. The gentleman from FDOT mentioned conflict points. And I have to remind you here, he mentioned Live Oak as one of those conflict points. And he kind of brushed it off. Well, those people didn't get notice. In fact, it's ironic. <laughs> One of my partners was at the dog park, met a lady there, and they were talking. She said, oh, I live in Tarpon Glen. We didn't know anything about it. Why is that? We got a copy of the list that postcards were sent to to advise residents. And why is it they didn't get a notice? Anybody got an answer, a question? Why? Because that property is owned by MHC Operating Properties, a subsidiary of ELS Equity Lifestyle Properties that owns thousands of mobile home park properties all across the country. And that notice went to Chicago, to somebody's corporate desk. Someone who got it, who could, oh, well, just stick in the to-do file. They never got notice. They are affected. Their part that Live Oak Street extension, when you go past Flammer Ford, that street before you go over the bridge, that's Tarpon Glen. That's Tarpon Glen. They didn't get notice. So we really believe there's a deficiency in notifying the residents who are affected. And it's not fair. I tried to reach out to Chicago. I got a number of some guy in Tampa, never got a call back. But from what the residents have been relayed back to me through this lady, they didn't know anything about it. She took some flyers to a homeowner's meeting, shared them out, passed them around. 
majority of the people didn't know. So we also believe there is a deficiency in notification. I'm not sure, are you gonna mention about the hearing signs? Oh, I'm going to wait. I'm okay, wait. okay. I could go into a whole bunch of all these things in the future land element, coastal zone element, floodplains, and all that. But I'm gonna close at this point with one last section. Isaiah or jo Jeremiah? Isaiah. Well, we'll go with Jeremiah for this one. Number 12, 1, 4, 10, 11. You are always righteous, O Lord, when I bring a case before you. Yet I should speak with you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the faithless live at ease? How long will the land lie parched and the grass in every field be withered? because those who live in it are wicked, the animals and birds have perished. Moreover, the people are saying, he will not see what happens to us. And then later on, but it says many shepherds will ruin my vineyard and trample down my field. They will turn my pleasant field into a desolate wasteland. It will be made a wasteland parched and desolate before me. The whole land will be laid waste because there is no one who cares. No one who cares. Over all the barren heights in the desert, destroyers will swarm. For the sword of the Lord will devour from one end of the land to the other, and no one will be safe. You are the defenders of this property. I know they've presented a, a, a good case. They've covered a lot of the bases. I mentioned to Mr. Armstrong, and I'll mention to you, yeah, they did learn lessons from what we had accomplished in doing before, and were able to tweak their project for that. However, as you hear testimony from other witnesses, there are gaps and deficiencies in their proposal, and we're trying to show you that there is an option. An option is to have this park area for the people. As you heard Ms. Terrapenny say, this will be private. Only the people who live there and those who visit will get the option of enjoying this property. That leaves out everybody else. And I mentioned also one last thing in this regard. We're a tourist town. Ecotourism is a valuable economic aspect. And in their economic discussions, it was about taxes, shopping, restaurants, stores, and those things. But this property, if done right, can be an economic driver. People come to places that are set aside for them to have their respite, passive exercise. <laughs> And I talked to Connor about the sports thing. There's economic development there. This also does, because if you have people coming from around the area. Hello? Oh, if you have people coming from out of the area, because there's a disabled veterans park, you have people coming to launch their boats. You have these people who come from out of the area to do studies at the facility. There's some economic development, plus what you would gain from what we said again, and I'll say it again, mitigation banking, and various ways you can generate funds from the parking and the lease of a small part of the parcel. So I will finish at this point, and I'll let the rest proceed, but I will finish with one last passage. 
And that's Isaiah 43, 19, 20. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am a waking, making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen. Part of his chosen is animals. It's not just us. God created all of us. And we have a duty to do what we can to preserve what we can for the rest of God's creatures. Thank you. Hold on, Mr. Delacus. Yes. Any questions from the commission? Don't see any. Do you have a question, Mr. Radkiotis? Okay. Yeah, I, Mr. Delacus, well, first of all, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Delacus and I spoke about a week ago. Do I need to divulge that as ex-party communication? Yes, do it right now. An affected party yeah. then, but they are now. They're not an affected party. They're claiming that, but it's my legal opinion that they're not. So, yeah. but, but you should, uh, you should I, disclose that conversation. I, I, um, yes, I received a call from Mr. Delacus and we spoke about a variety of things. Um, just as pretty much what he's described this evening, as far as the, uh, the site and okay. um, uh, the traffic and, and um, uh, some of the questions I'd been asking, just clarification, I guess, is the best way I can describe it. Okay, do you have a question of Mr. Delacus then tonight? Yeah, I, okay. Mr. Delacus, I'm trying to get my arm, you've, you've covered a lot of area uh, from uh, uh, basically a little historical on the Walmart to, um, to basically um, uh, not objecting, but contra not, or just saying that you don't agree with what the environmental scientist for the applicant has stated. Um, you talked about the traffic a little bit with Live Oak Street um, and then some alternative concepts. Have you done any work to determine what the impact to that site would be from these alternative concepts? as compared to what the- We project. have not done an analytical uh, evaluation, but I will put on the record, I have a degree in biology from Tulane University, a graduate in 1976. That was where I first began becoming environmentally concerned uh, through the friends and through other groups that I've been involved with. Uh, I have learned a lot about what uh, is needed to preserve properties and the value of those, not only to the animals, but to the humans that could enjoy them. Uh, my thing would be that y'all weren't presented uh, information as far as other options for this property. And I think that should have been something staff should have done, not the applicant. Staff should have said, okay, these are the other options that have been proposed and to have done some kind of evaluation on that. It's not the first time I've been before the board. They would have been well aware of what we proposed. And I felt it should have been an obligation of staff to have presented you with some other alternative information as to the value of the park as compared to the developer's applicant saying, oh, it, it's not worth anything. We believe there's a great value to this city by preserving that property. And you've not done any economic assessment? I, no, sir. I pretty much I know what the answer is, but I, I feel like I need to ask you that. That's okay. correct. And I've, that's a fair question. And I would say that there are studies that are out there, economic studies about the value of ecotourism. And since Tarpon is such a tourist developed community, I think it would be a valid option to look at as another amenity that we offer to our tourists. And I would say that that would have had to have been something from staff, not necessarily the applicant, because they wouldn't look for that. Thank you. Okay. That thank, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Okay, hang on just a second. Uh, Mayor, do you have any questions of Mr. Delacus? Uh, no, Mr. Trask, but it's getting five minutes to 11, so we need to extend the time for the meeting. It, yes. I agree. Okay, I agree. So, Vice Mayor, do you want to take control of that? Um, I, I'm open for a motion for, to extend the meeting. Motion to extend the meeting, 1230. 
The motion was six. And Second. The goes, okay, thank you. A roll call, please. Commissioner Vatagiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor Lahuzis? Yes. All right, thank you. So, Mr. Uh, Ms. Graham, do you have any questions of Mr. Delacus? No, sir. Mr. Armstrong, do you have any questions of Mr. Delacus? No, sir. Okay, thank you. You want to call your next witness? Thank you. Um, my next witness is Barbara Walker. She will be appearing on Zoom. Um, so okay. if you're on Zoom, Barbara, uh, raise your hand and they will pop you in. Mr. Jump, if you can make sure that she's... Um... We do have a Barbara Walker that is on the Zoom call with a raised hand. I'll allow her in to talk. Hello, this is Barbara Walker. Ms. Walker, I need you to raise your right hand and be sworn under oath. All right. You swear the testimony you're about to give tonight is going to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Ms. Walker. Um, this is Jane Graham. Can you um, give us a little bit of a background of your educational and professional history? Absolutely. Um, I'm actually, uh, this is year 51 here in Pinellas County, and uh, I've been through all of the um, schools in Pinellas County, high school, college, FPC, USF, um, and uh, I had my own business for quite a long time in uh, computers, but uh, after that, I uh, uh, ended up having a family, and I got involved with um, caring for captive raptors and, and raptor rehabilitation through my association with Audubon Florida's Eagle Watch program. Um, throughout the last 17 years, I've completed um, courses at the University of Minnesota's Veterinary College in captive raptors and in raptor rehabilitation. And I've spent more than a decade mapping bald eagle and osprey nests in Pinellas County, including Tarpon Springs, I'm currently the president of Tampa Bay Raptor Rescue. I'm the immediate past president of the Clearwater Audubon Society. I'm a former Audubon of Florida board member. I was the, account, uh, the uh, county coordinator for Audubon Florida's Eagle Watch program for over a decade. I received additional training in St. Louis, St. Louis from the World Bird Sanctuary, from the Avian Reconditioning Center in Apopka, and from the Audubon Center for Birds of Prey. I was awarded Volunteer of the Year by Audubon Florida in 2012 and received the Dutcher Award from National Audubon in 2018 for my work with raptors. I'm a current member of the Florida Wildlife Rehabilitators Association of Audubon and of the Raptor Research Foundation. I have been accepted as an expert witness by the City of Tarpon Springs Commission in the past and my work is well known throughout Florida um, with raptors, and I have been cited in the book, Birds of Pinellas County by Ron Smith. I'm also a member of the Concerned Citizens of Tarpon Springs. Based on my personal experience, observing Haliaetus lacusophallus from the Greek bald eagle on this property for over a decade, and based on evaluating the documents provided by the applicant, the city, the comprehensive plan, the land development regulations and data from Audubon Eagle Watch and various publications. It is my opinion that the project's impact is too great to be sustainable and is incompatible with the existing use of habitat on the property. Allowing the proposed density of 400 plus residential units on the property will result in significant adverse impacts to the environment and will negatively impact the region on a long-term basis. Um, I'll pause there for a moment, just to say that I do have some PowerPoint slides and there's just a few that we will look at. We won't have to go through all of them. Um, and some of what I'm gonna say will be backed up in the slides. So just want you to know that. Um, so if you take a really good look um, at this, there's not one, but two bald eagle nests on the property. It's loaded with gopher tortoises. Directly across the Anclote River are nesting sandhill cranes, which are a threatened Florida species. Hang on a second, um, Mrs. Walker. Yes. 
you need to share your screen so that the audience can see what you're talking about. Right now, we cannot see the photograph. Hold on, hold on. Um, so I don't have a photo up right now. We've sent the PowerPoint to the first, so it should be being put up. Mr. Jump should have that. It is loaded on the laptop, and I do believe okay. Renee is bringing that up. Yeah, she's there. All right, Barbara, hang on one oh, sec. That's fine. And um, actually, I think I need the pointer to help. I don't know where the pointer went. Yeah. Is it right on the top of the lectern right there? Yes. Somebody brought it. Oh, yeah. I can see the slide all right. Hang, hang on just a moment, please. We're trying, we got some technical difficulties. Yeah, the, down, down the down button advances through the next yeah, one. Got it. All right, Barbara. Um, I guess just tell me which. I, I'll tell you when I get there um, which one to go to. So, um, my point is, I don't think I want the commission to really understand that I don't think this is about giving the bald eagles ample space and 330 feet for those nests because it's more than just about nests. Bald eagles need more than just a nest to actually raise their young. Um, and pressures in our county are so obvious if you Started, if, if, if we could just weigh every decision on every property that's been made, starting from the southern tip of Pinellas County to the northern border, which is right there at, at the um, Anclote River, what you would see is 50% um, of bald eagles population uh, in Pinellas County is pretty much, they are on cell phone towers. And that's a whole nother layer of regulatory issues that you have to go through. Um, when you have them in a cell phone tower and you cannot knock out your 911 service. We like to really try and keep them in the trees. What we've noticed since the other 50% of where we still have some trees left starts in the Dunedin Tarpon Springs area. And I believe we have a slide that I want to go to. And it is the one that has the um, rare longleaf pine coastal forest on it. You know the one, Jane, I think. So that's it. Okay. The map on the right um, is the longleaf coastal pine forest that exists in Florida. And you'll see that it's actually quite rare. The um, portion that starts about mid Pinellas and then it goes up in through Brooksville is called the Brooksville Ridge. The um, pine trees are, um, you, you need a lot of pine trees to maintain your bald eagle population. Um, they're getting pine bark beetle, they're getting salinity, they're getting um, struck by lightning. Um, and this happens to the variety of nests that are out there, particularly um, longleaf pine. There's a distribution chart on page, let's see if I, there's a lot of pages here. So there's a Pinellas distribution chart, Pasco, and then Pinellas is up in the beginning of the presentation It's somewhere around slide six or seven. That's the one, okay. So that, that's, it's a little bit of an older map, but that's basic distribution of bald eagles in Pinellas County. And the way they're distributed is they're, they're along Tampa Bay, Lake Magory, Lake Seminole, Lake Tarpon, and the Ann Clote River. And between the nests on the property and the, um, Brooks, uh, Brooker Creek well field is a bit of a corridor. 
And there are not just nests there, there are also juveniles and single adults that utilize that property. That's part of an important usage area that is noted um, for conservation at the state level. It was done by Libby Majika in a dissertation, and I believe that report has been turned in to you for evaluation. So there's a, a map, we can go over to that map real quick. I'm trying to do this really fast for you, so we're not looking forever, but we're gonna go on to the important usage area maps. Go to that, back, go to the back, to the back one. Yep, a little further back. Before you get to that one, there's one more. There's a list of core areas. Let's see, that's it, that map right there. Let's look at that slide because it has the most information. Along the left-hand side, you'll see a list of the core nesting territories of bald eagles in Florida. And those core areas are in central Florida um, and there were, you know, where all the lakes are, and, um, Polk County is up there and tons of core nesting areas. I think that right above the um, nest in question, all these nests from PI3, this nest is known as PI41, and then you go out to the Duke Energy Plant from there. They're all connected, not just by the river, but also by the power line corridor. So when you go in and you start monitoring in the power line corridors, you can see how many bald eagles are utilizing these areas. Not, not to mention the refuse and the response that we have to the fights that have been taking place in these territories, not just between eagles, but um, between, um, of course, the bald eagles and the owls. Great horned owls do not build their own nest. They are taking the opportunity of the fact that the Endangered Species Act worked and we got spent millions of dollars. We got the bald eagles off of the endangered species list um, and they're building more nests. And we got the ospreys off and they're building more nests and it's giving the great horned owls more real estate basically to shop for. So, you know, these birds and people, they like to live in the same places. And unfortunately, great horned owls have caused a lot of problems around uh, Lake Tarpon's Nest. Uh, not only that, the bald eagles have been fighting around the Lake Tarpon Nest. And there has been a um, failure of the nest in this in this region, in this area around Lake Tarpon. These natural nests are failing because they're prime property and the birds are fighting. One of the nests actually was just seen with three adults in it. Because, and we've seen that a couple of times because they're, they're still trying to adapt, but they are so pressed and so stressed her habitat that I look at this and I say, well, we need to protect that whole area, and this is part of that area. So to me, it's your responsibility to help protect that, protect the Brooksville Ridge, to protect the important usage area, to protect the wildlife corridor. Um, the uh, birds along the Anquote River, um, they do go all the way out, as much all the way out to the power plant. And there's a substation also, and the Duke Energy um, uh, is right south of the property that we're talking about here. So it's important that they're managed also as to not impact power line structures as well, because um, unfortunately that happens too. Um, the, um, the bald eagles in the important usage areas um, this is when the site is used by more than one eagle. And the property in question is in this important usage area. It is used by more than one eagle. It is used by subadults. There have been birds with satellite transmitters in there. And the whole purpose was to protect, manage, and purchase property at the state level. So, I really would like to have seen more happen on that. 
Um, but unfortunately, what I've noticed is a rapid deterioration of wildlife protection and more building over the last 10 years since we've talked about this. So I objected to, to the super center the last time. And I'm saying I think 404 is way too dense for this property this time because we don't really have much space left here in Pinellas County. We can't buy large swaths of land as Peter referred to, that's not possible. Um, we don't have that, we've never had that. And I think it's caused Pinellas County to be overlooked a few times on important pieces of property like this one. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, I think we need to um, Barbara, can I jump in? Yeah. Could, you, could you speak to um, your experience specifically on this property and the nest and your observations? Uh, sure. This particular property um, in this nest, um, we found about, we found this nest, we had looked for it for a year or two prior to finding it. it's difficult the original nest, the first nest, nest number one, was difficult to see on the property, but there was a resident um, named Dr. Abbott that continually called us and said, no, I got eagles here. And I said, just keep calling me when you see him and I'll come out. And, um, and we would make a point of uh, bald eagle season in Florida is October 1st through May 15th. And that's great. And that's what we have on paper as people, but eagles don't read calendars yet. So you see him at different times, <laughs> different times of the year that might not be non-breeding doesn't mean they're not here. Um, but at the beginning of every October, we would check, you know, to see if there were new territories. And we um, showed up at Sail Harbor um, it, at, it, on our regular October 1st or 2nd or 3rd kind of a, a survey, having gotten calls from Dr. Abbott. And there was a lot, a lot of cars in his um, driveway. And it turned out that the whole time I had been talking to him, he um, was an emergency room physician who was suffering from cancer himself and he had passed away. And his family sent us and they said, oh, that was so important to him, you know, go on, go on out and, and look. And when we were, we walked out there, the sun hit just the right area. And, oh, get the scope, I see the nest. And then the next morning we went out very, very early in the morning and we, did see that it was absolutely bald eagles bringing branches in, not ospreys or what have you. And besides bringing branches in, uh, they'll bring other types of debris in too. That's also in the presentation that I've submitted. Um, we had Irma in 2017, that messed up nesting. <laughs> we have had um, great horned owls. That, that area, is critical area for the bald eagles and for the juveniles. And just because they're not there right now doesn't mean they're not going to come back. A lot of times what happens is the great horned owl nest will also fall. And then once it falls, they go and they take someone else's territory and then the eagles come back because that's their territory. It, they like their spot. Um, there's also uh, gray oaks, as I said, PI3, that's directly east of this. And, and the very same thing is going on there. The very same thing. So these guys are all shuffling around. Pinellas County has been no, known for a long time that um, we have a density of, of bald eagles here because we have um, lots of water, but those nest sites and those uplands are important. I love saving wetlands. Boy, let's do that all day, every day. Uh, but we need to save uplands too. Those two go together. They don't just, just because we save the uplands, if we're going to impact, um, you know, I don't know, we're going to save 12 or save 16 uh, acres of uplands and the rest of it is not, not then that's a problem. Um, bald eagles aren't going to respond to the din and drone of US-19 anywhere near the, as what they will respond to with foot traffic. Um, and during the building process, south of, south of, this nest, you got Anderson Park. Okay, Anderson Park got hit by lightning. Those birds are now in a cypress tree. They're fine. Um, then you go further south and you get midpoint on the west side of Lake Tarpon over to Grand Cypress. 
and the, the bald eagles were in a beautiful pine tree right in the middle of a brand new development and when they started adding more houses and they started banging on the roofs and the garbage truck started coming and then the workers needed a break so they walked over and they took a rest under the tree um and that disturbed eagles it eventually ended up moving um and it was disturbed by owls it moved again another pair came in um and it's down to where we just got the one this year the one new nest on the west side which is kind of a conglomeration of two or maybe three pairs that really kind of that's about all it will support um the john chestnut nest is fine but even in getting on top of the large buildings in east lake and looking at john chestnut park you can see bald eagles they need super canopy tall trees and even looking at john chestnut park you think yeah that's there's only so many of those super canopy tall trees because they're older growth trees and they're the first ones that get hit by lightning because they're tall. So maintaining multiple trees and multiple space for the birds is just critical. Um, other things you'll see in my presentation, I, I have a map of the um, of Pasco County to the north of you and there's tremendous development in Pasco County um, as you know, particularly in the eastern portion of the county where a lot of rural nests are going to be impacted. So there's a lot of pressure um, than this one project. This is, this is a, a much bigger issue. And when we start measuring things like climate change, we know we have to reserve that space and a little extra space for them because, the, because of the sea level rise that's coming. So that's really important too, and not just for the eagles, but for shorebirds and all the birds people too, <laughs> um, everybody move over because we have, uh, besides this pandemic, you know, we have this terrific climate change going on that is um, increasing our hurricane activities. And when that happens, um, sometimes a tropical storm or hurricane can come through and it can just blow down all the nests and then everything is chaos until the eagles are able to work it out for themselves. One of the bald eagles that I did rescue throughout the years was um, in the ditch on uh, Keystone Road, right around George Street. Um, it was actually the sheriff was in, it was the male person that saw it. The sheriff came out and he was down in the ditch with his jacket covering the bird and waiting for me to get there. And um, we arrived, and I don't know which which nest the bird was from, but. Um, in any case, we took it over to British Gardens and unfortunately required a sliding amputation. We took the bird in as a permanent. Um, his name was Wish. He eventually did pass away. Um, but he was one example of the uh, problems that exist uh, at the north end of Lake Tarpon. There is a patch of land that was just developed there, kind of up in the north. Uh, the northwestern corner. Um, we have another development proposed where I think the city was annexing, and now we have this. So I really, and we know the area is already pressured. So I am trying to compel you to look very closely at your plans and see if they really are consistent because I don't feel that they are. And you look north into Tarpon, if you look north into Newport Ritchie, the homeless camp. Mrs. Walker, Mrs. Yes. Walker, yes. hang on a second, your, your lawyer is talking. Yeah, Ms. Walker. I can, I can hear her. You can hear me, okay. Um, I wanted to just ask you a specific question. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Nicholas spoke about um, a number of the impacts in the most recent nesting season. He seemed to think that maybe it had something to do with homeless and um, I, I was wondering, can you talk a little bit to um, any theories or what, what you think the, um, the state of those nests might be attributable to? Oh, absolutely. Weather. We've had a lot of, a lot, a lot of problems in weather, but we, it's the great horn owls. Most likely it's great horn owl. 
And um, those are the ones that, that can really create havoc in the territory. And then it's got to come back into natural balance. Um, and, and as far as homeless encampments go, it's not good to have them under Eagle's Nest either in Pasco County. Unfortunately, we've had a couple of the bald eagle nest trees burned down because the homeless encampment made a fire at night and we lost the tree in the nest. So that is an issue too, but studies have shown that foot traffic is a lot more impactful. And I'm just wondering what's gonna be protecting that nest when the residents realize there's bald eagles there and that they're, they're standing 100 feet from the nest with their zoom lens. And um, how many people are going to be just unwittingly walking by, not even knowing that there's an eagle's nest there, you know, and or even owls? They can be equally disturbed, and we're not allowed to disturb these birds. They're protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So that's, I guess, basically what I wanted to say. Um, are you done asking questions of her? Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm done. Ms. Yeah. Ms. Walker, mm -hmm. there's going to be probably some questions of the city, from the city commission. If you could hang on just a moment. Any questions sure. from the commission? I, I see none. Uh, do you have questions? Okay. Mayor, do you have any questions? No questions, no. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, do you have questions of this witness? Yes, I do. Um, good evening, Ms. Walker. I'm Ed Armstrong. Um, as you know, we have three applications before the um, commission tonight. Do you have an opinion as to whether our plan is consistent with the Bald and Gold Eagle Protection Act, the Fish and Wildlife Commission requirements, and the requirements of the Fish and Wildlife Service? The requirements for the um, individual eagles nests, are, I believe are usually worked out um, with them directly during the permitting process. Um, there is a bald eagle management plan and it does state um, some variety of um, whether something can take place within 330 feet or 660 feet. Um, what we've noticed um, from an eagle watch perspective is that these permits, you know, they do end up getting issued, but ultimately it doesn't always have a good outcome for the birds. They are ultimately disturbed because that's what you will be getting is an e probably an eagle disturbance issue if the nest is or nests on the property, you know, end up having eagles in them, um, which right now, from what I understand, is there's a great horned owl in the nest. So. But, but to be fair, my, my question goes to the, uh -huh. the information and um, plan submitted in our applications. Do you have comments with respect to our applications? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I'm having trouble hearing you. Yes, I'm sorry. It's do you okay. have, yes, do you have an opinion as to whether our plan is consistent with our, our plan, our applications, which is the record what we're talking about tonight, whether it's consistent with the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, the Fish and Wildlife Commission requirements, and the Fish and Wildlife Service requirements, specific to our property as evidenced by our applications that are before the commission tonight. That is really, the, the people that decide that are the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service individuals and I would present the same case to them as I'm presenting to you not only that is I would start saying that after the last 10 years or so is that and you know how COVID how they the, the, the governor and we're saying how every county is different and that we need to be able to deal with things differently in different areas I honestly believe the same thing is true of the bald eagles and so whether it's consistent or not, yeah, it seems consistent to me. It seems like you've, you've called out 330 feet and 660 feet. I just don't think it'll work. Have you reviewed the, that, the application? The that we, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, have you personally reviewed the three applications that are before this commission tonight? 
I have personally read through all of the applications that I could read through, whether I have what their names are and what all of their all of them are. I, I cannot tell you. It is way too short of a time frame for me to do that. So no further questions. Thank you. Any redirect? Uh, no. no. Okay. You want to call your next witness? Yeah, uh, our next witness is Chris Parisi. He's also on Zoom. Chris, are you there? If you're there, raise your hand and they'll put you in. And if we can keep your witnesses narrowed in on the issues of this particular case, um, that would be helpful. Maybe you could help us do that. Hi there. Mr. Parisi, if you could raise your right hand, I'm going to swear you're under oath. You swear that the testimony you're about to give is going to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. Can you tell us your first and last name, please? My name is Christopher Parisi. Can you spell your last name? P is in Paul. A-R-I-S is in Sam. I. Thank you. I've been a resident of Tarpon Springs now since uh, 1997. And um, I am uh, both a uh, concerned citizen and a citizen scientist. I've uh, worked uh, with Cornell University, uh, the Xerxes Society, the Florida Native Plant Society on studies of endemic wildflowers, milkweeds, and uh, migratory insects. Um, also uh, an avid photographer, astrophotographer, kayaker, and fisherman, I'm sure like most of you are. All right, thanks. Um, Chris, do you have a, um, can we show the drone footage that we submitted? Um, this was the link exhibit. So Mr. Jump, if you can bring on the drone uh, footage, or do we have access from that down here? Um, I do believe I had that open as a email that was down there. Chris, can you just talk about um, when you, I guess, the, the recent drone and what you saw there? Uh, it doesn't sound like mine. <laughs> um, yeah, I can just talk about it briefly. Um, really what I did was a perimeter sweep around the property just to see, uh, you know, um, from, an eye, from a person's eye view, it's kind of difficult to ascertain what the property is. Um, and on the- uh, Let me course, just interrupt for a second. We're having trouble with some technology here. So Mr. Jump, do you have that? Uh, available or not? Um, I'm trying to find it at this point to see if I can find if it is on my computer up here. Okay. At least we've gotten back to video of the chamber. Okay. So Renee, you're not, you don't see it. No. I, okay. Mark, if you can direct me where to look on the laptop, I'll take a shot, but I don't see it. Um, I know I had opened up a web page. I think it was a Facebook page post. I think I'd left it open as an edge. Play. Yeah, what I had done was um, I just took a quick uh, sweep of the property um, with my drone at about tree height to see, um, you know, what, what it looked like, because from the road, you really can't get a good idea of it. As you come up here, you can see some of the, um, the tidal um, inlets 
and there's some tidal streams. All right, Chris, go ahead. Yeah. Chris, if you could just keep, you could keep talking while, while they're trying to do okay. this. Okay, no problem. Um, one of the things that I was, uh, most concerned about is uh, I did read the reports about the plant life on the property. And um, although it is correct that at, um, you know, that there are certain types of trees there, certain types of pine trees, they really didn't go into depth about the vascular plants, the wildflowers or anything like that on the property. And um, I do understand that, you know, there may not have been any present at the time, but Florida native wildflowers are very seasonal sometimes, and uh, a lot of a lot of the uh, different beneficial plants, especially milkweeds that grow in the sandhill communities, are only active uh, for certain months of the year. And so you may be there at a certain time of the year, and they may not be there. Um, on parcels of land similar to this in the area around Keystone, I have found butterfly milkweed and pinelands milkweed um, in the uh, sandhill areas around where gopher tortoises live. And uh, to me, the, uh, the flora and fauna survey of this, uh, especially the flora survey of this area, um, it seems very generalized. And it would be nice to have a deeper understanding of what exactly is there. I understand that the the land is, you know, essentially, as, as the other gentleman had said, a postage stamp. It's a um, isolated area. It doesn't have very much biodiversity to it. The gopher tortoises on it, you know, are an isolated population. But that being said, it is also a very valuable point in what you would call a green corridor where many animals may not live there on a permanent basis, but use it as a transient area for traveling onto different places, especially things like migratory birds. I've seen uh, roseate spoonbills, um, terns, skimmers, uh, wood storks, uh, great blue herons, great white herons, night crowned herons, um, oyster crackers in the area. And these are birds that may not stay in one area for a long period of time, but may jump from island to island. One of the unique things about the Anklot River is, if you, it's probably something you may not have noticed or may have, is that it has a tremendous sawgrass population. And um, the mangroves are um, surround, that surround those islands are some of the farthest growing north mangroves uh, for red mangroves in um, the, um, the United States, especially with Florida, the uh, cutoff area for red mangroves usually won't find them any farther north than say um, the uh, Chazowitza area. And from there on around the Big Bend, it's nothing but sawgrass. On the east coast of Florida, the cutoff point is probably around uh, uh, Daytona, a little farther north. Once you get that far, it gets a little bit too cold for mangroves. But um, one of the important things that about this piece of property that I find to be very unique is that at the southern end of it, there is a tidal, there's a bridge that goes under the uh, US-19 from the Anclo, and uh, there's a very good tidal movement through there. And the reason why I can say that is because there's oyster beds growing in the small lagoon on the side of US-19 where uh, that would be uh, basically facing one of the proposed buildings. Now, in order for those oysters to be um, prolific there, there has to be a very good tidal flow. And I noticed that a lot of the, that, uh, that in fact, that right there, that area right there is where um, there is a, a, a a very decent oyster bed area. Also in that area, um, I catch a redfish, trout, and snook which is, you know, you know, those are not 
fish that hang around in one area for a long period of time. They're very transient. They are very tide related. And um, if tidal flow is disrupted through those cuts and channels in that area, I'm concerned that uh, whatever um, what wetlands are there may degrade because they also rely on the nutrient loading in tidal changes to help um, create the fish estuaries that mangroves are so well known for. Um, and uh, yeah, as you go back towards the back property there, you can also see uh, in the background Salt Lake um, and uh, the, the other part of Anclo River. Um, one of the things that I am concerned about is the overall, even though the, the, the land itself may have, uh, you know, over the years been degraded and it is easy to see even in this drone footage, the, um, um, you know, the, the tire tracks that people go in there with their motorbikes and things like that. As a, as a piece of land that is used as a refuge and a possible stair step for um, green, greenways and green corridors for animals. Um, it would be hard pressed to find another piece of land like this anywhere in the area. Um, I used to travel a great deal for work up and down 19, uh, actually up and down the west coast of Florida. And it always struck me that I knew I was getting close to home because I live in Brittany Park subdivision, which is basically on the intersection of Beckett Way and US 19. And I always knew I was getting close to home when I got to the Ankle River and I would get to this parcel of land and I would say to myself, you know, after driving 19, this is the last parcel of land in Pinellas County of any good size that is not developed. And it always reminded me as I was driving over it from either north or south that it often reminded me of US-1 going through the Keys, especially in the lower Keys, where it's nothing but mangroves on either side of you in the road and that's it. And it always made for a very picturesque and nice place. Um, some of the uh, land usages that probably wouldn't really come to, um, um, come to mind often would be, uh, it happens to be a very good dark sky area too. Um, not getting on the property, but in areas around the periphery, I've uh, taken my telescope and had a couple of friends that have telescopes and we do uh, deep sky astrophotography around there because it's one of the few places in North Pinellas that isn't inundated by light pollution. One of the other things I think is really unique about it is it's one of the few places in Central Florida where I've seen fireflies on a regular basis. So that tells me right there that even though the, uh, there may be degradation mm -hmm. to the land, there are uh, s s solid areas of good soil there because if there wasn't, there wouldn't be a life cycle for lightning bugs. Um, also things like rhinoceros beetles and other larger invertebrates that, you know, tend to get overlooked, but are also very good indications of the health of an area. Um, and uh, as a, I'll take off my science hat and say, as a um, person who's lived on basically US 19 since 1997, um, I can tell you for a fact that I've spent, um, and this is something that, you know, I understand there's been many traffic studies and I understand that we're in a very unique situation right now with COVID, but I can tell you that uh, from February, usually starts around spring training, from February until May when the kids get out of school, it is gridlock from Tarpon Avenue through Spruce Street all the way up to Beckett Way and beyond almost to Flora Avenue headed southbound because of the amount of development that has been happening in the State, um, State Road 54 area and all the new developments. Those folks that work in Pinellas County, they're not going down Gun Highway. They're not going down East Lake. They're coming all the way over and coming down 19. And when I say they're coming down 19, they're coming down 19 at 65 to 70 miles an hour, not 55. Because I have to gun my engine to get out of my neighborhood, if I can get out of my neighborhood. Often, I will sit through that light at Brittany Park and Beckett, or excuse me, Beckett Way in US 19 in front of St. Luke's for three or four 
cycles of the light because there are tra there's traffic in the intersection during my green light. And um, it, is, it is an issue. And it especially uh, is really bad, it seems, after we change the clocks for some reason. This, the the um, uh, traffic always seems to be really out of sync. It will take me almost 15 minutes to travel from Brittany Park to Tarpon Avenue. And uh, I only have to travel 15 miles to get to my work in Clearwater. And it takes me over an hour in the morning, whether I leave at seven o'clock, quarter of seven, 7.30, I've tried it at all times. Um, I know it's you know, seasonal. The, the is, it's getting later and later. Um, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Um, yeah, there, uh, I would just like to say that, um, you know, I think this piece of land has potential for the community. Uh, it has potential to be an education tool for the community. And um, I've seen the success of the Splash Park and the Bark Park, and I enjoy using the kayak launch down off of Oak Street. And I think that uh, this would be appreciated by the people of Tarpon Springs as a public use area. If this land has to be used, I would rather see it used for the good of the community than for the good of just the tenants of a uh, apartment complex. And um, I know it's getting late and I know y'all are getting tired. And so I'll just, I just have one more thing to add. I understand these U-turns are very useful, but when traffic is coming down US, coming north on US 19 at 65 miles an hour, and you have to pull out of that driveway that you're gonna be, that you're looking at right there to get to a U-turn that's across three lanes of traffic. Um, pretty soon you're going to learn that it's a lot easier to go down to the light at Beckett Way and late for a green arrow that will guarantee you're not going to get, well, supposed to not guarantee you're not going to get broadsided. And that is going to create even worse of a mess at that intersection for people making U-turns and going all the way around. So while I think, um, you know, the intentions are good of the traffic modifications, I, as a person who lives here and drives here every day, I really don't think that those U-turns are going to alleviate any problems at the intersections. And uh, that is all I have for you. Thanks so much. Any questions from the commissioners? I, I have one just real quick. Yes, go ahead. Mr. Parisi, um, I, I've listened to your presentation and, and I'm not sure I understand. Are you saying that you're not for any development at all on the site, including a park? No, I am for I am for turning it into a park for public use. I think between um, uh, the uh, fishing amenities there, the uh, uh, the uh, potential for a learning lab there, uh, the ki a kayak launch, um, playground for children, and just a natural place for people to walk, um, I think that it would be beneficial to the community. Um, uh, more so than to a private entity. Have, have you ever been to the North Anklo River Nature Park? Yes, I have. I, and I, in fact, I've recently started going to the Key Vista one that was just uh, added to the north spur of uh, the trail there. And um, I think that that, I, it's, it's, especially now with COVID, people are trying to get out into areas. And I think that they're learning valuable lessons as some of the people have said before that um, you need fresh air and sunshine. It may not be pristine fresh air and sunshine, but it's not pavement. So, so you're saying as a resident, you think that this 72 acres should be developed similar to what we already have with 77 acres at the North Anklo River Nature Park? Yes. Um, I think that these, uh, um, these places not only would provide an area for wildlife refuge, um, especially for uh, migratory animals, but uh, valuable, um, valuable resources for people as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trust. Mayor, do you have any questions of this witness? I have no questions. No. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Graham? Hold on a second. Mr. Armstrong, you have the right to ask questions. He Um, 
Um, good evening, sir. Uh, I'm Ed Armstrong, and I have a couple of questions for you. Sure. Towards the end of your um, testimony, you talked about traffic. Do you have any credentials um, as a transportation engineer or a transportation expert? Now I've got credentials as a resident of this house for 20, uh, let's see, 97, 20, 22 years, watch traffic go bad to worse. And on occasions have even parked at Home Depot and walked home because it was quicker than waiting three hours for them to clean up the fatal accident at Beckett Way. So uh, in terms of professional credentials is what my question is going to. No, sir. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned, um, the birds that would utilize the wetlands on the site. Are you aware that our proposed plan would retain a big site, over 70 acres? Our plan would retain all but 0.8 acres. Are you aware of that? I understand that, but um, the, the, the preservation of an area is one thing. Um, when you're dealing with people that utilize parks and green spaces, Norm, uh, you know, you're, you're talking about 24 occupa 24 seven occupation of this land by a group of people that live, live there. And there isn't the same type of rhythm for the wildlife in a, a place like that, especially when uh, you have people walking dogs and dogs barking and people blasting radios and cars and just regular foot traffic. Uh, I wasn't asking about the rhythm. I was asking about whether you are aware that our application preserved all the wetlands on the site with the exception of 0 0.8 acres. It might be helpful if you could answer yes. Yes, I, I, I am aware of that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so Ms. Graham, do you want to call your next witness? Yeah, our next witness is Mr. Eric Houston, a transportation planner, and he is on Zoom. Um, Eric, if you could raise your hand, they will put you through. If you could please state your name and address for the record. Yes, my name is Eric Houston, um, address 1724 North Holland Avenue, Los Angeles, California. Okay, sir, if you could raise your right hand, I'm going to swear you under oath. You swear the testimony you're about to give is going to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Graham. All right. Um, good evening, Mr. Houston. Can you tell us about your education and experience in the field of transportation planning? Yes. Um, I have over 18 years of experience in the field. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have over 13 years of experience in the transportation industry. Um, I have both a bachelor's in urban and regional planning and a master's in community and regional planning from the University of Texas, bachelor's from Florida Atlantic University um, in Boca Raton, Florida. Um, I have concentrations in both land development and transportation planning while at Texas, and also um, uh, associates in civil engineering from Florida Atlantic University. Most recently, Five years of direct experience um, as a transportation planner reviewing development projects for traffic impacts and mitigation. And, um, have you reviewed any documents in formulating your testimony relating to this project? Yes, I have. I have reviewed um, several documents um, related to this project. The first document I reviewed is the Antelope Harbor um, application, um, applicant's application and responses to the Board of Commissioners questions. Um, I reviewed a memorandum with the subject titled um, Antelope Harbor Staff Report Addendum um, to be provided prior to the second reading. Um, I reviewed the City of Tarpon Springs Comprehensive Plan. Um, the transportation and future land use elements of that comprehensive plan. I reviewed the 2045 long range transportation plan for Pinellas County. Um, I reviewed the countywide plan for Pinellas County. I reviewed the Harbor Apartments gap study review comments. Um, I reviewed the um, Florida um, FDOT uh, and FAMU Florida State joint study 
development of the safety and performance for restricted crossing U-turns. Um, and I believe that's it amongst other research such as um, Google Earth, Google Maps, um, and aerial site visits. Great. And um, after reviewing those documents, um, tell us what you think about this, the, the plan, the, the turn lane, and um, kind of as far as safety or any, any thoughts you have on it. Okay, after reviewing the documents um, I explained above, um, I had several comments um, on the impacts that was caused by this development, um, which led to my decision of my opinion, sorry, um, that the project not be approved. Um, the first is the proposed roadway and access configurations are inconsistent with the existing roadway and access configurations of US Highway 19 um, and the surrounding community. The proposed R-cut U-turns will not only, um, and I know they're referring to them as um, restricted U-turns um, or restricted left turns, um, they will not only be kind of um, the first, if it is an official R-cut U-turn, it will not only be the first in the county, but the first in the state. Um, which is unfamiliar to residents. And whenever you introduce a new traffic feature um, or a new traffic pattern to an area, um, there's always some confusion by local residents, which will cause um, added backlog in, um, in traffic congestion. According to- Oh, oh sorry, go ahead. Um, as far as the level of service for this specific area on US-19, what is it and what, what did you review? And, and tell us about that and what it means. The current level of service for US 19 is um, actually a level of service F in some sections and E in other sections. Um, and what level of service F mean is that you experience severe traffic backlog, um, similar to that of an accident. Um, so we're talking extreme stop and go traffic um, to where it is um, affecting everyone's impact. So we're seeing speeds of lower than uh, 10 miles an hour. Okay. And um, as far as, you know, proposed transit improvements and any impact on the roadway network, can you speak to that? The, from my review, this project did not offer any transit improvements. The nearest bus stops are over a half mile away. And um, that's both to the north and to the south. Um, that's a half mile walk with no shaded um, sidewalk. There are no shade trees along US 19. Um, and because of the large nature of the site, it would be at least um, a quarter mile walk from the furthest unit uh, proposed in their site plan. Um, in addition to that half mile walk. So we're looking at um, a three quarters of a mile walk to the nearest transit facility um, with no proposed um, transit amenities, no bus shelters, um, no reloc no additional bus stops added. Uh, in addition to that, um, several of the county um, transportation plans propose BRT on this roadway. Um, in order, and for those of you that don't know, BRT is bus rapid transit. Bus rapid transit is usually a dedicated um, lane of travel for high frequency busway bus um, travel. That will require either the conversion of an existing lane of traffic or um, an additional lane of traffic be added to US Highway 19. And any result, there will be construction impacts that will cause further level of service um, decay on US 19 and the surrounding network links, as well as if they were to take away a lane of traffic, it would uh, severely impact US 19. So this project not only does not propose any transit improvements, but is also in conflict with proposed transit improvements that is meant to benefit current and existing residents in the area. Did you have a chance to review the applicant's gap study? Yes, I did. And um, tell us your thoughts about it. The gap study, in my opinion, is premature. Um, there were a lot of factors that were not considered 
the first major um, factor is that the GAP study was completed on October 1st of 2020. Um, that was during a global pandemic where safer at home um, orders were in place nationwide and traffic volumes were reduced. Um, traffic volumes were reduced because not only were people working from home, but students had the option to opt out of going to school um, in person and attend virtual classes this year, which caused a degree, uh, decrease in um, automobile traffic um, from taking kids to school, taking people to work and things like that. Um, and not only that, but the gap study was not detailed in the sense of it didn't determine which type of vehicles were used it did not follow um, F dot recommendations on the um, MUTCD and um, highway uniform traffic safety manual in terms of recommendation for the level of um, time that's needed to safely make that turn across six lanes of traffic. Um, F dot actually recommends um, 7.1 seconds which was pointed out in one of the reports and um, that was presented to me. And the gap study only recommended a five second um, gap, which in my opinion would not be adequate. It doesn't take into consideration added truck traffic, it doesn't take into consideration delivery vehicles, um, bus stops if there are school buses added and things like that. So um, in my opinion, the gap study is, is not complete and not thorough enough to really consider the full impacts of this project. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Yes, I would like to add, um, With respect to um, minor streets and the residential streets, um, this project will also have impacts. It's only proposing one entrance um, at the um, on US Highway 19 and a gated entrance for their traffic study showed 178 trips in the peak hour. Um, with the gated entrance in the peak hour um, for that many trips is going to cause significant backups and delays both on US Highway 19 um, and internally as well. The reason why those delays will be caused is because um, you'll have visitors coming, you'll have delivery people coming, you'll have food service deliveries, um, Ubers, Lyfts, things of that nature that would have to wait to be buzzed into the, the neighborhood. And while they're waiting to be buzzed into the neighborhood, maybe they're into the wrong code. Uh, maybe, you know, it takes some one time to answer the phone and give them the password. Whatever the case may be, that will cause backups and delays at the main entrance that will spill out on um, US Highway 19 and also can impact the residents from entering the site. Um, in addition to that, um, there are currently um, other roads in the neighborhood um, that is shown to be below level of service D, which is the acceptable level of service standard, um, East Tarpon um, Avenue is one of them, Live Oak is gonna be impacted. These are both roads that are um, already kind of have a poor level of service and it would be further degraded by the added trips of this project. Um, there are concerns of impacts on the surrounding neighborhoods in terms of cut through traffic um, and other traffic calming factors that will happen if um, a second entrance is proposed, it will have severe impacts on the local community. And um, in my opinion, this project does not meet code and it should not be approved. Thank you, Eric. Questions of the commission? Yes, Commissioner Donovan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Trask. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, you mentioned we were going to be the first in the state on something, I believe. Could you provide some clarification on that? Yes. Um, that was referring to the ARCUT um, intersection. And I know there has been some back and forth on the exact treatment that is proposed with the medians. But to explain um, the way our ARCUT intersection work is it is pretty much restricted left turns. Um, so it kind of forces you to make a right turn which is what this project is proposing. So take away the left turns and to cause vehicles to only make a right turn 
um, to enter and exit out of the site. Um, and what that does, um, it, it, if it is a true R cut intersection, it would be the first um, that has ever been uh, implemented in the state of Florida. It is a new feature um, that only a handful of states have used um, nationally. Okay. The FDOT representative that spoke earlier mentioned that he had no concern about the specific cut um, and that he was fully satisfied with it. So I, I'm not sure that it would be the, the first of its kind in the state. Um, I don't know. I can't speak to the legitimacy of that. Um, and then where'd you say you're located out of? I'm located out of California right now. I'm a Florida native and a um, past Florida resident. I just recently relocated to Los Angeles. Okay. Have you driven on US-19 in this area? No, I haven't. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the commission? Sorry. Yes, uh, Commissioner Vatikiotis. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Houston, I, I mean, again, this isn't um, meant to be anything other than a question. You, you don't agree with what the, the applicant is proposing, um, and you don't agree with a second access through the neighborhood. Do you have a, con and I know you've reviewed all these documents. Do you have a recommendation of what you think would work? I think this is a unique site due to the waterways and the, um, the, the configuration of the site. Um, I think a gated access would not work for this site um, because of its proximity to US-19 and the level of traffic that's on US-19. Um, the ideal situation would be to keep the main access points on US-19 so you do not disturb the surrounding communities. Um, and ideally to still preserve um, as much wetlands and green space as you can. Um, with that and said, I, I don't want to design an applicant site for them. I just think that you do not want to um, pour um, that many trips into a, a single family, um, low density neighborhood. I mean, if I understand what you're saying is that you don't recommend the second access from Hayes Roads through the local neighborhoods, and you're okay with the single access onto US 19 as long as it's not a gated access? Is, is that what I understood you to say? Yes, I said that if I said that if there was a, I said that there should be a second access on US 19, sorry, um, and neither one of them should be gated. I just said I wouldn't, I don't have a recommendation on where the second or how the second US um, 19 access will work. Um, I don't know if it's possible given the constraints of this site um, and the spacing that is needed to make it safe um, is, is why I'm, I'm saying that I think this site is overdeveloped and it, it, it doesn't work. Um, I don't see how you can have so many trips going in and out of a single access um, where anything can happen, especially on a um, busy road such as this one. Um, an accident can happen at the entrance and then you'll have backlog of people trying to get in and people trying to get out. Um, so you definitely do not want to have a single access on this site, um, but you definitely do not want to put a secondary access going through the single family residential neighborhood because it will um, be used um, as cut throughs, high speed and things of that nature. And, and let me just qualify your answer. Is that based on 400 apartments or do you think a hundred apartments would be better or, or would be satisfactory? I, I guess what I'm getting at is you're basically, you're, you're not agreeing to what's being proposed yet many of the residents who are against the apartment complex are also proponents of a park of some sort, which I would suspect would create some kind of similar traffic load. Parks actually have lower um, trip generation than um, single family, uh, I mean, sorry, multifamily um, residential units. So a park would actually um, have less traffic impacts than say a multifamily apartment of any size. Um, 
depending on the size of the part and the activations that you put in the part. Um, clearly, if there's a, a um, ceremony hall or a wedding venue or something like that, um, it could be you know different. But what I'm saying is um, the the density and intensity that is proposed on this site and the number of trips that is generating um, is going to overwhelm uh, a single entrance. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Houston. Uh, Mayor, do you have any questions of this witness? No, I do not. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mr. Armstrong, do you have questions? Good evening again. I'd like to, you, to introduce you to my law partner also at Hillward Henderson, Scott McLaren, and Mr. McLaren will be performing the cross-examination of Mr. Houston. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, members of uh, commission. My name's Scott McLaren and I have been sworn. Um, Mr. Houston, uh, good morning to you, sir. Uh, at least here. You're in Los Angeles, right? Correct. And uh, how long have you served? You're the transportation planning manager, right, for LA County? Yes. And how long have you been in that role, Mr. Houston? For over one year. Okay. Uh, at some point in your career, you were a transportation planner for uh, the city of Hollandale Beach, is that right? Yes, I was the city's transportation and mobility planner. All right. Um, now, was was Miss Graham employed by Hollandale Beach at the same time you worked there? Yes, she was. Okay, is that where you met her? Yes, it is. Okay, are you guys friends? Um, no, I wouldn't say we are. Okay, how long did you work together at Hollandale Beach? I can't recall. Um, it was a short period of time. It was Can less. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I say it was less than a year, I believe. Okay, um, I haven't seen your name on this case prior to today. When were you contacted about this case? I was contacted about this case um, earlier, I want to say earlier this year. Um, so I want to say about a, maybe a week ago. Okay, about a week ago. But in 2021, you were contacted? I believe so. I don't, I don't remember the exact date. And Ms. Graham contacted you? Yes. Are you being paid for your work in this case? Yes, I am. All right. Um, how many hours have you spent on the file given that you were just recently contacted? I have spent over 30 hours on this file. And you didn't do any independent report. You just simply reviewed some materials uh, that you that you discussed earlier, correct? Correct. All right. Um, have you ever been to Tarpon Springs, Florida? I have. Okay. But you've not been on this portion of US-19. Is that fair? Um, I've been on US-19. I will can't say if I've been on this portion of US-19 or not. You don't know one way or another, is that right? Correct. You've not been to the site, correct? Correct. You're a planner, right, by trade? Correct. You are critiquing the report of Christopher Hatton, who is a transportation engineer, is that right? That's correct. He is a tr uh, registered licensed engineer in the state of Florida, is that right? I'm not sure of his credentials. Okay, uh, assuming he's a registered professional engineer, he's qualified to make uh, the complicated traffic uh, analyses and calculations in his report, would you agree? I'm not 
I'm not aware of his credentials. All right. Um, you are not an engineer, correct? I am not. I'm a certified planner. Okay. Thank you. Um, did you do any, uh, did you arrive at any independent uh, opinion on the number of trips that would be generated by this proposed development? As I mentioned earlier, due to the nature of what we're experiencing now with COVID-19 and the pandemic and the changing status of kind of trip generation, I have not come to a conclusion of the number of trips that will be generated by this project. Okay, and is it true that your uh, opinions are generally outlined in your affidavit uh, that you signed today in this case? Yes. Okay, and who prepared the initial draft of that affidavit? I prepared it myself. Okay. Um, Now you understand that this application is to downzone the property, right? From a more intense use to a less intense use? I do. And the, and the current zoning, do you know what the current zoning is? Um, it's a commercial zoning. I don't know the exact zoning code off the top of my head. You don't know the zoning classification? Not at the top of my head. I reviewed it and it's in my report. Okay. Do you know if the permitted uses under that zoning, zoning classification allow for a big box retailer? Can you repeat the question, please? Do you know if the permitted uses under the current zoning classification allow for a big box retailer? Yes. Um, and your understanding is they do allow for a big box retailer, right? Yes. And this proposal is for 404 apartments, right? Yes. And is it your understanding that the number of vehicular trips of this proposal are approximately 20% of what, what is possible under the current zoning? Yes. That's a reduction of 80% on the number of trips, right? Possibly. Let's look at page or paragraph number five of your affidavit. Do you have it handy? I do. All right. Looking at number A, it says a final traffic study has not been completed or submitted for review by the public commission or the Florida Department of Transportation for consideration of the impacts uh, from the proposed roadway and access configuration. Do you see that? Yes. Okay, now where did you get that information? From the staff report. Okay, are you aware that um, in November of 2020, uh, Christopher Hatton of Kimley Horn submitted uh can you see me via zoom i can okay submitted this uh small phone book final traffic study uh to the uh city of tarpon springs and its commission did you know that yes but it also stated that the final report would be resubmitted once the final site plan was agreed upon so it said that this report was submitted for preliminary consideration um, for um, approval of the rezoning. And it said that it would come back once a final site plan was more developed. Right, but a, a, a final report for the final site plan, we're not at site plan approval, right? We're at rezoning. So this is the final traffic study, this report, correct? For purposes of you know, this hearing, final traffic study for what is my question? Are you saying that's the final traffic study for the rezoning, or is that yep. the final traffic study for what will be built? For the rezoning, which is the proceeding that we're here on today, correct? Yes. If you're if you are saying on record that that is the final traffic study, then that will be accepted as the final traffic study. But from the documents that I reviewed, 
it noted that it was not the final traffic study. All right, sir. Um, now you, you've, you've given some opinions about this, what you've described as an R cut. Is that right? Yeah. Now, have you been watching the proceedings this evening? I have been in and out of them, yes. Okay, did you see Mr. Hatton's presentation uh, where he showed that this is an offset left uh, turn median opening? I did not, I was not able to watch his, his um, presentation. There's no left end to the project, would you agree? Yes. From design, okay. So this is not a, an R cut, this is a offset left turn median opening, correct? No, that's not correct. All right, sir. Uh, doesn't a R cut allow a left in to the project? Isn't that typical in an R cut? No, R cuts usually restrict left turn movements to force traffic to take right turns. Right, coming out of the project, correct? R cuts are not typically, um, well, R cuts, can be associated with projects or intersections. So it, 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 it doesn't go either way. Usually our cuts are built around say an intersection or in this case, a project entrance to where you don't have a direct left turn. You would make a car do a right turn to go around and do a U-turn so that you don't make a left turn. So our cut is restricting the left turning movements. Restricting then, a left turn out of the project, correct? Correct. Or and into the project. Turn into the project, correct? Correct. All right, sir. And R cuts also have other names as well. They are called super intersections. Um, and, and, you know, they go by many terms, but it's generally the same idea. And this, this traffic plan does not contemplate a left end to the project. Isn't that correct? Yes, that's why it's considered an arc cut. That's why it was reviewed as an arc cut. All right, sir. Um, isn't it true there are multiple examples of this offset left turn median opening um, on US 19 alone? And from the research I gathered, there are no other R cuts in the state of Florida. Right. Uh, this is, an, as Mr. Hatton described, an offset left turn median. I can open. testify to Mr. Hatton's. Um, Can I finish my question, please, sir? Okay. Um, according to Mr. Hatton, this is an offset left turn median opening. Do you dispute that testimony? I don't, I don't, I can't dispute his opinion. Okay. Do you dispute that there is this exact same type of median opening at 46th Street North and US 19 intersection in Pinellas County? I am not aware. Uh, do you know whether or not this exact same type of median opening is located at Sun Valley Boulevard in US 19 in Pinellas County. I am not aware. Do you know whether or not this type of uh, median opening is located at River Watch Boulevard in US 19 in Pinellas County? My review of this project was limited to the project site and the surrounding streets. So aside from the research that I performed on the Arcut intersection, I, I cannot um, speak to what you're describing um, and if it is located anywhere else. I think there are several factors that will determine if this is um, what you're describing and without um, having time to evaluate the intersections you're naming, I can't say whether they are similar or not. Okay, let's look at uh, paragraph 5C on the following page of your, your testimony here. Okay. About two thirds of the way 
down, it says that FDOT has not reviewed or approved permit plans for the northbound right turn lane into the site and the offset median U-turn lanes. You see that? Yes. That's your language, right? Offset median U-turn lanes? Yes. All right, sir, you didn't call it an R cut there, did you? No, I didn't. Okay, and it says FDOT has not reviewed these this type of plan, but uh, did you hear Mr. Provenzano's testimony tonight? No, I didn't. Okay, so you didn't hear him testify that it was actually FDOT's idea to uh, implement this type of uh, traffic control device? No, I wasn't here for the testimony. All right, uh, just a few more questions, Mr. Houston. Um, your uh, affidavit talks about levels of service and I believe your testimony earlier talked about that. Is that fair? Yes, it is. Entry door. Um, are you familiar with Florida's Community Planning Act that was passed in 2011? Um, no, I'm not. Okay, were you a planner in Florida when that act was passed in 2011? Twenty eleven. No, I was in school. I was a student. Um, are, are, are you aware that that act adopted an analysis where the, the analysis of traffic, uh, the implementation of, of traffic control devices was moving away from the level of service analysis? Are you aware of that? Yes, I am. Okay. And are you aware that in 2017, Tarpon Springs adopted the analysis under this act and repealed their reliance upon concurrency and level of service analyses? No, I can't testify that I was. All right. Um, about done here, Mr. Houston. Thank you for your time. Um, last topic. Um, on the next page, I, I don't know how to describe it. The pages are not numbered, but it's the third from the last page, about halfway down um, the page. You, you uh, recite an opinion. I just want to make sure this is, is I got this right. It says, a second entrance on US Highway 19 would be unsafe and to use other local roads would be overburdensome on the surrounding community. Is that your opinion, sir? I, what page are you reading from? It's the third to the last page. Um, it's about okay. a little more than a third of the way down the, the page there it says, um, and I quote, a second entrance on US 19 would be unsafe and to use other local roads would be overburdensome on the surrounding community. Is that, yes. your, is that your opinion? Yes. Okay. I don't have any further questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I guess any other questions i i just have we're approaching 12 30 so i want to make sure gotcha um, if i could we, we need to extend the meeting hang on just a second we're about to run out of time okay is there a motion to extend the meeting motion to extend the meeting to 2 a.m <laughs> i guess i'm gonna have to suck it <laughs> thank you uh roll call commissioner vati yes commissioner donovan yes Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor Lahuzis? Yes. Okay, Ms. Graham, you can call your next witness. I just have one, one question for um, redirect for Mr. Houston. Oh, sure. Uh -huh. um, so in addition, it's, you know, you reviewed the ordinance 
um, the, the request today. It's rezoning conditional use. And it is also a preliminary plan development. Is that correct? So yes. There is a, yes. Okay. And um, just a, a general, really quick question for you. Um, in looking at the safety from your perspective as a planner, a, a transportation planner, um, what do you think of the conflict points and what do you think um, as, I, I mean, do you, do, would you consider this plan safe as far as the turn? I would not. Um, the, the way the conflicts are set up, um, when you're entering and exiting out of this site, you will have to navigate across three lanes of traffic um, to a median refuge to then navigate across three more lanes of traffic um, to proceed in whichever direction you want it to go. Um, and that is unsafe on a road of this size um, during peak and off peak hours. Um, during peak hours where there's um, heavy traffic, you're going to be trying to cut across cars that are in a rush to go where they want to go. Um, during off peak hours, you're going to be battling against high speed um, cars where someone mentioned earlier speeds um, get up to 65 and even 70 miles an hour, um, which is very unsafe for a car to try to turn out and then jet across three lanes of traffic to get to the um, U-turn lane. Um, in addition to that, because this is a multifamily um, proposal um, with both one bedroom, two bedroom and three bedroom units, um, it will have kids and families um, that is attracted to this site, which will bring the need for um, school bus stops, um, which the only place that the bus can safely stop is on US 19, which will back up traffic and also um, expose kids to a very wide roadway, um, which is unsafe to, for you know, smaller students to be on. So um, when I say it, it is unsafe, it's, um, from those observations in terms of adding a residential use, the uh, um, heavy traffic, high speed um, roadway. Thank you, no more, no further questions. Um, I'd like to call our next witness, Carl Wagenfor. Go. Sir, were you sworn in earlier tonight? I am. Okay, thank, thank you. you if asking. you could state your name and your address. My name is Carl Wagenfor. Can you hear me okay? Yes. 98 South Highland Avenue, Tarpon Springs, 34689. I, uh, my cover slide here covers a bit of my uh, background. Uh, I am a board member of Concerned Citizens of Tarpon Springs. <laughs> I, for the period of 2009 to 2012, was a member of your planning and zoning board where we evaluated uh, as part of our job some of the transportation issues that came towards us. I had the distinct pleasure of being a journalist in the city of Clearwater for about six years, where I covered uh, primarily the municipal government of the city of Clearwater, including its transportation issues. And before that, or actually during that, I was a member of a, a citizens advisory committee that was appointed by the Clearwater uh, City Commission to evaluate what had become a big debacle in their tourism industry, the uh, infamous Clearwater Beach Entryway Roundabout, which uh, suffered a great deal of dysfunction. The uh, city hired a very good engineer from England who worked with our group and we jointly uh, solved a great number of the problems with that roundabout, not the least of which was the destruction of the fountain which sat in the middle of it and uh, not only doused cars with water, but caused cars to avoid using the inner lane of that roundabout, giving uh, severe traffic backup. And finally, my interest in traffic issues uh, goes back even further than that. I had a 25 year career in IBM 
where, among other things, I was a de designer of telecommunications networks using some very sophisticated tools that were developed by our researchers. I had the opportunity to attend an FDOT class, lasted about a week, on uh, a level of service training using the art plan tool that they developed for use by municipalities, counties, and consultants. So that's my, uh, my history. I, I am not a transportation engineer or a transportation planner. So that'll save Mr. Armstrong a couple of breaths. Um, uh, I lifted this, uh, this slide from a presentation that was given by the planning director to you guys. And there are a couple of things that I want to point out on it. First of all, she claimed that US Highway 19 is currently operating at a level of service C between Tarpon Avenue and Beckett Way. I'll show you that that's incorrect in a minute, but I also want to discuss yeah. management in terms of its supplanting level of service for your ability to evaluate the impacts of developments on our traffic systems. Um, one of the things that I was concerned about in this proposal was you've accepted that, or they're asking you to accept that the transportation management proposed by the developer is going to mitigate some of the traffic issues that would otherwise occur, whether they build recreation facilities within the property or other amenities. Ultimately, a true measure of the effectiveness of that mobility management should be the reduction in trip count, don't you think? But yet, no one has attempted to quantify the reduction that is going to happen as a result of these as yet undefined amenities that are going to be built into the property. This is a map that's uh, provided by Forward Pinellas, formerly the MPO, and it describes Highway 19's level of service all the way from the Gandy Bridge to the Pasco County border as an F. Regardless of mobility management, the classifi classification of F defines this road as a failing roadway. Okay. Another slide lifted from the planning director's uh, presentation is uh, review criteria. And I want you to focus on number two, public facility capacities are sufficient to serve the project. I don't understand how one could state that the insertion of 2,198 trips out of this property per day is going to have any beneficial impact on Highway 19. In fact, because it's a level of service F, it's, it's uh, ineffective. You're inserting additional traffic onto an already failing roadway. And that tells me that the infrastructure, the transportation infrastructure is not capable of serving this project. I'm going to fast forward through a few slides here. This is a slide which was uh, lifted from the applicant's presentation, and I, I did make a mistake on it. Yeah, you probably recognize it. There's the right turn out of the uh, complex, heading to the offset left turn lane, where a U-turn is made to uh, proceed south on Highway 19. Conversely, southbound returning traffic uh, proceeds beyond the property and makes a, uh, a U-turn following entering the offset left turn lane on the southbound side. The way I count, I, I miscounted actually, the uh, number of traffic conflict points for a vehicle desiring to head south on Highway 19 is actually six. They would have to cross three lanes of northbound 55 mile an hour traffic in moderate traffic conditions. Proceed to the 
offset left turn lane to make the U-turn and in the process of making the U-turn crossing three lanes of 55 mile an hour traffic that is southbound. That is a total of six conflict points, each of, each of which is capable of producing horrific high speed T-bone collisions. The southbound traffic is uh, faring a little bit better, I guess, trying to return home. They only have three conflict points to deal with, having, uh, making the U-turn to uh, get to the, the right turn lane to get into the property. So we're all used to uh, seeing Highway 19 gridlocked, stop and go, backed up for half a mile or so. That is not when this road is dangerous because at low speeds or no speeds, there are no collisions or the collisions are not very severe. The, the, the time to be concerned about this type of traffic pattern is during periods of moderate traffic, heavy enough to produce in, insufficient gaps, but light enough that the cars are able to travel at the posted speed limit. I had a look at the gap analysis. It was uh, actually just revised today or yesterday. I forget which day it was, but uh, the applicant actually increased from five to seven seconds the uh, amount of time that they thought was necessary to safely cross those lanes of traffic. They cited uh, FDOT and Transportation Research Board documents describing a right turn from a minor roadway as needing a seven second gap in order to make that turn safely. And that those books did not describe the additional time that it would take to cross the three lanes of traffic to get to the safety of the off -cut, offset left turn lane. The applicant also today, they, they presented it to you. I think it just hit the, uh, hit the city's website today. They did a gap analysis using 10 second gaps, which I think are much more reasonable. And uh, using 10 second gaps, the northbound four to 5 p.m. project traffic uses nearly the entire capacity of the available gaps. It uses the outbound traffic count of 46, has got to fit into 47 gaps. It's uh, any additional traffic added to that is gonna be a failing situation. The southbound 7 to 8 a.m. traffic is uh, projected to be 70 cars per hour. And the number of available gaps that were measured during their study was only 55. So we have a failure there. The other thing that I, I found that was missing from the gap analysis was any discussion of oversized vehicles. There are lots of FedEx trucks, UPS trucks, Amazon delivery vans coming and going. This is an apartment complex. There's a lot of turnover. There will be a lot of moving vans coming and going from this property. Not to mention twice a week sanitary waste trucks, daily school buses, multiples of them. And uh, the point is that longer, slower vehicles are gonna require greater gaps to get safely to the offset left turn lanes than the uh, study permits. And finally, the, the required gap is very, very dependent on something that we have no control over, unfortunately, I wish we did, and that is the driver's skill level and judgment. Are they gonna be able to look down the road and find the gaps that they need to safely get to where they're going to. It's not clear to me that they are. In fact, I'm gonna show you a movie at the end of the presentation that I hope will demonstrate that for you. I wanna move on to the, uh, the back exit uh, proposal that apparently is uh, an initiative of city staff. This is a diagram that I pulled from the presentation that illustrates the Hayes Road exit to Jasmine Avenue, 
cars wanting to go southbound on 19 would uh, make a right onto Spruce and then be able to make a safe left turn under the protection of the traffic light that sits there at Spruce and 19. Traffic uh, desiring to go eastbound on Keystone Road would take Jasmine all the way to Keystone Road and then make a left onto Keystone under the protection of the traffic light that sits at the junction of Jasmine and Keystone. That's the city staff's proposal. I think you all understand that Jasmine is a two lane country road. If you've uh, looked at it closely, you'll see that it's bordered in places by wetland. There's actually water channels there to take care of the, uh, the water. The street is lined with residences and it's absent any sidewalks for pedestrian safety. The city has a very uh, keen uh, initiative that it's trying to fulfill in promoting walkable communities. And this is not, and it's gonna be worse if we put a thousand cars a day onto it, a thousand additional cars per day. In addition, I haven't seen any evidence that there's been a traffic study of the additional cars that would use this Hayes Road uh, to Jasmine rear exit. And uh, I, I think that would have to be completed before anybody considered this. But perhaps the, the most overriding issue with this is a reduction in the quality of life for all of the people that live in that community. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you're gonna hear from them later. So what we'd like you to do, I'd, I'd like you to do is to find that US Highway 19 capacity is not sufficient to handle the additional traffic that is gonna be generated from this development. To reject the concept of using Hayes and Spruce and Jasmine as a rear exit. And if this goes beyond tonight, I would like to see full transparency of the discussions that occur between the developer and the city and FDOT so that the residents of the city of Clearwater can have some influence and knowledge of what the outcome might be. This is uh, taken yesterday at 3.09 p.m. Not a peak hour. Standing in the driveway of what would be the carpet project, southbound, at driver's eye level, a lot of drone video. But unfortunately, the drivers don't have the benefit of the drone view road half a mile away so that they can gauge a gap is coming in. Here you are. Sometimes large vehicles block the view road. And uh, they find it very difficult to take that step and press my foot to the accelerator and dart out into this traffic and the gaps that might exist. Also that the gap in order to reach the safety of the offset left turn lane has got to be our width of the roadway. Cars generally travel standard outside side by side or standard. So, and you can't see what's on it. So we can um, look at this for another minute or two. I would like to refer to a question that was asked by the mayor. I think, and he asked the uh, the engineer, the traffic engineer, the developer, what are you going to do if it doesn't work? And he did not get a direct answer to that question. Instead, he simply got a statement of the confidence of the engineer that it will work. So what's going to happen if it doesn't work? If you approve this project, it's going to be the responsibility of the taxpayer to fix it. And I don't know what the fix would be at this point, but it's not going to be inexpensive. So I'd encourage you to deny this application tonight 
and find a less intensive use for this property, a park would be a very good one, and that would have no impacts on the surrounding traffic. That's all I've got for you. Do you have any questions? Any questions from the commission? Mayor, do you have any questions? No, I do not. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Vaticutis. Mr. Wagenford, can, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Can you put your slide back up, if you can, on your recommendations? Uh -huh. Yes. On your... Um, your Ignore the three, second bullet. Your number three, um, reject the concept of using Hayes, Jasmine, Spruce as a rear exit because of traffic impacts to the communities along those routes. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that earlier in your testimony, you said that there weren't any traffic studies uh, for that area. That's correct. And yet here in number three, you're saying that you want to reject it because of the traffic impacts of the communities. I don't know what those impacts are. That's my whole problem for okay. tonight. Yet you say you don't know what they are because it hasn't been a traffic study. You're saying to reject it because of the impacts. I, I just... Okay. The traffic study would expose the level of service that would be on that road given the additional traffic that would be injected onto it. Here I'm referring to the impacts to the quality of life of the residents along Jasmine and along Spruce who are gonna be faced with a continuous stream of traffic in the morning and in the evening and make their lives as pedestrians in the neighborhood. And they do walk, they do walk through that neighborhood. It's gonna impact their ability to be mobile on foot. Okay, thank you. I, I think that my point is that these traffic studies um, are involved in the sense of uh, lifestyle impact, as well as um, safety, just from vehicular safety and that sort of thing. And um, I know that there was a uh, comment made earlier about mobility management, what that would do with, to mobility management on US 19. And so it's wrapped up into everything together. And um, I'm just trying to say that I don't know what those impacts are. And um, I, I'm not ready to reject anything right now because I just don't know what those impacts are. And, and uh, I just thought that, and I appreciate the clarification on that. Thank you. Thank and you. I, would, I would suggest to you that the uncertainty that you have in and of itself should cause you to want to not approve this tonight. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Armstrong, do you have any cross-examination? I'm disappointed. So, Ms. Graham, do you want to go ahead and call your next witness then? Thank you, Mr. Wagonhorn. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, is Brooke Hansen on the line? Brooke Hansen on Zoom. We do. Let me. May or may not still be on. For IT, can you guys check? Can you see if he's checking right now? He said he thinks so. Okay. Great. Ms. Hanson, if you can state your name and address for the record. Can you hear us, Ms. Hanson? Ms. Hanson, are you on the line? Can you hear us? Her microphone, well, now she just muted it. If you can unmute your microphone. Dr. Hanson. Uh, 
Hansen. You are unmuted now, Ms. Hansen, if you can state your name and address for the record. Oh, she's saying that the mic doesn't work. Um, and if there's a dial in. Yes. Uh, one. Number. Mark, if you could provide her with a dial in number. I'm looking that up now, sir. Okay. You have another witness that you can go ahead and call in the meantime? Um, okay. Hold on. So, is, is Nicole uh, Matthews still on? She may not still be on. We'll find out. Okay. So for Ms. Hansen, the join by phone number is one three one two six two six six seven nine nine and the webinar id is nine 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 one two six six four four three seven and then in order to raise your hand you will have to press star nine I don't know if she's able to hear us at this point. Okay, is there a Nicole Matthews um, on Zoom, Mr. Jump? Nicole Matthews. I do not see any Nicole Matthews on the attendees side. There is a phone phone number that's there, but I do not have anyone with raised hand at this time. Okay. Could we try um, Dr. Brooke Hansen one more time? And then um, I think we might just. She's got to call in. Oh, okay. That's the number that he read out. She's got to call in. Mr. Trask? Yes. Can we, would this be an appropriate time? It's been about three and a half hours since our last break to take a, a quick break. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. great. Let's go ahead and do that. So Mr. Uh, Jump, if you can try to get her online in the meantime, we're going to take a few minute break. Thank you. Thank you. Well, even going to a lot.
Hey, Dino, Brooke, did she get on? Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll just give her a call. Hi, did you see the, um, we just broke for like a little break, but can you? Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. Sounds good. So. Okay, sounds good. Thanks so much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know this is it's hard doing it like that. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much. I'll talk to you. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're almost done. I'm going to send my guys home. They can't hang anymore. And Ms. Hanson, if you are on now, if you can unmute yourself and we will test this. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, we have conquered technology in the middle of the night. All right, hard to hear with the mask. Thank you, and then you'll just have to wait until we reconvene. Okay. I don't think anybody wants them. Do y'all want to put them back out there on your way back? Not you in general. Okay. Yeah, you want, you want a bottle? I got a bottle. I can. I tried water out of the fountain and it was yellow. <laughs> you want to by the women's room? How about the mouse? Yeah. It was yellow. <laughs> Just dumped it out. Well, that's not good. Steve? Yeah. Thanks for being here tonight. That's a good idea. Uh, if we could go ahead and uh, take our seats, please. Thank you. Simple card. 
We're going to reconvene the meeting at 1 a.m. January 8th. Thank you. Sir Attorney Graham, are you ready to proceed with your last witness? Yes, that's right. Thank you. Okay. I'd like to call Dr. Brooke Hansen. Okay. Brooke, are you on Zoom? Yes, Dr. I believe I am here and I believe you can hear me. Okay, raise your right hand. I'm going to swear you're under oath. Okay. Where the testament you're about to give is going to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay, if you can state your name, please. Yes, I'm Dr. Brooke Hansen. I reside at 18846 Tracer Drive in Lutz, Florida, 33549. Okay. And just a little bit about my credentials. My BA is from USF. I have a master's degree and a PhD from the University of Arizona in anthropology and community studies. I've been doing community sustainability projects for over 20 years. I am currently a professor of sustainability at the USF Patel College of Global Sustainability, where I have expertise in a variety of sustainability fields, including climate change, sustainable tourism, and waste reduction. I'm a sustainability consultant in a variety of capacities throughout the region and the state. I currently serve on the Super Bowl 55 Sustainability Subcommittee, where we've been engaged in a number of different sustainability measures from carbon offsets to environmental restoration in the Tampa Bay area. I serve on the US Green Building Council, Tampa Bay Governing Council Committee, and I also train students in lead for cities and communities. And my college trains students in the Well and Envision platforms for buildings and infrastructure. I'm the director of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Action Alliance at USF, where I focus on SDG number 11, sustainable cities, and also SDG 13 on climate action. I currently have a project with the city of Tampa revising their building codes to infuse green into their codes. I host the statewide power dialogues for the Solve Climate 2030 event, which is sponsored by the Center for Environmental Policy. And I'm also a participating member and an educational consultant for Turn the Tide for Tarpon, who I've been with for three years since their inception. I do sea level rise projects in Tarpon Springs and at Egmont Key. And I currently have a grant from USF to use virtual technologies to model sustainability issues such as sea level rise threatening our coast and our tourism industries. And I just have a brief statement this evening related to the impact of sea level rise in Tarpon Springs and on this project. As you're well aware, the mayor and the board of commissioners signed an MOU in 2018 with the Tampa Bay Regional Resiliency Coalition. And in that document, it states that they acknowledge that intense rainfall and other climatic stresses will compromise crucial infrastructure and drainage in our area, including Tarpon Springs. That MOU continues to say that climate resiliency planning is instrumental to reduce Tampa Bay's regional vulnerability to changing climate. And that this is amongst the most consequential actions that the Tampa Bay region could pursue. And also that the Board of Commissioners, they are committed to being resilient to a changing climate and will ensure environmental assets. And additionally, in the MOU, the Board of Commissioners says that they will coordinate their efforts and enhance their abilities to prepare, adapt, and mitigate for the effects of sea level rise and climate change in Tarpon Springs. Now, if we turn over to the Tampa Bay Regional Resiliency Coalition, they have a document that they recently released titled, Recommended Projections of Sea Level Rise in the Tampa Bay Region. And this was put out in April, 2019, and it was offered, authored by the Tampa Bay Climate Science Advisory Panel. And I just wanted to read a few bullet points from page two of that document, which is the executive summary. 
Bullet point number two is based on a thorough assessment of scientific data and literature, the Tampa Bay region can expect to see an additional two to 8.5 feet of sea level rise by 2100. And in considering the discussion earlier about Hayes Road and the very preliminary thoughts of utilizing it, that it would be at sea level. So that could be a problem. Bullet point number three from the executive summary states, projections of sea level rise should be consistent with present and future national climate assessment estimates and methods and that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, otherwise known as NOAA, the low scenario should not be used for planning purposes. So I wanted to continue on to the Tarpon Springs Coastal Planning Document from 2019 and the flood hazard area map on page 107, figure 22, which clearly includes the development area and that there are numerous references in this planning document to restricted development in the coastal high hazard area, which this development sits squarely within. And this should all give the commissioners pause and serious caution in considering this development. And I just wanted to end on a few bullet points from that coastal planning area plan including policy 3.1.2 on page 98 that states that it would restrict public investments such as roads, water and sewage infrastructure, which would subsidize new private development in the coastal high hazard area and policy 3.1.3, where the city shall consider the most current and credible sea level rise data when planning in the coastal high hazard area. So I just remind the commissioners that they might want to check those most recent documents and scientific data on sea level rise from the Tampa Bay Regional Resiliency Coalition, because clearly this area of the proposed development is at great risk from sea level rise. And I would question any development going into this area with the current scientific projections that we have. And that's pretty much what I wanted to say this evening. Any other questions? No. Does the commission have any questions for Dr. Hansen? Mayor, do you have any no questions? No questions, no questions. Commissioner Vaticuris, did you have a question? No? The, well, the yes, I do actually. Okay. Um, is it Dr. Hansen? Is that correct? Yes. yes. Dr. Hansen, you made a statement that this property sits square, square dab in the middle, if I heard you correctly, of the coastal high hazard region. Is that correct? Or did I misunderstand you? I superimposed the maps and it appears to me that the entire development area is in that region, which is shaded in yellow on the coastal planning area document. Okay. I, I, I'll, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm not, I, I'm not disagreeing with you because something tells me that that's not accurate, but I, I don't recall specific enough to, uh, to, to kind of offer you a counterpoint on that. So, but thank you. I just wanted clarification on what you stated. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you have any questions of Dr. Hansen? Okay, no questions then. So, Ms. Graham, do you have any other witnesses that you wanted to call tonight? No further witnesses. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Armstrong, did you want to address the issue of questions for Ms. Graham? Okay. Ed Armstrong again. I would agree that's a general proposition. It's an unusual situation to have one attorney cross-examining another attorney in a hearing like this. What I base my, uh, my belief on, that I'm entitled to cross-examine her, goes to the letter that Ms. Graham sent to the city at 1.09 p.m. this afternoon. And she was courteous enough to copy on me that. 
And that is her package of 563 pages, more or less, that uh, she submitted. And it's interesting, I'm pulling it up now, the way it's phrased, because it's clearly testimony. It is rife with opinions. It cites the comp plan time and time again. Um, hold on, I'll give you some examples. Of course, my... Um, if I could, if I could object to this, I mean, I, it sounds like you're going forward, but I do before you keep proceeding. I mean, we do wage an objection to having some kind of cross examination for me. I am not a material witness, and the citations are legal citations in a policy document. No, you're, you're, I'll, I'll read you excerpts. You're making le you're making arguments in here based upon facts that you state in your letter. You cite goals, objectives, and policies from the comprehensive plan. I mean, let's read your conclusion. I mean, you're testifying in this letter. This is based on the testimony from the witnesses and the 500 something pages that you've heard and the witnesses tonight. But you sent us the letter at one o'clock this afternoon. How could it be based on the witnesses from tonight? Because they are the ones who have the, um, the letters, the letters that are attached in this 500 page document are the witnesses who have spoken tonight. Here's a, here's a title of a section. Finding flooding conditions on the property conflict with elements of the comprehensive plan and larger policies of the city. And then you go on and on about objective this, 3.4. Let me scroll here. I can't get it to move, but you cite other um, the other yeah, I mean, I'd goals, like to objectives, actually, and policies of the comprehensive plan, and you give your opinion. If I can, I'd like to object and see if City Attorney Trask would make an opinion as to whether this should even move forward at this point. So it, it appears to me that the letter is something much more than um, arguing a legal position. I think that the way that I read the letter is, is that yes, you were attempting to present evidence by way of this letter, and then you attached 500 pages after it. So when I read it, it appeared to me that you were basically testifying. So if you're taking the position that you're not interested in testifying or you won't submit yourself to testimony, maybe the way that you could handle it, it would be to um, you know, withdraw your letter from the... From the yeah, package. This, this is the testimony of my clients. I mean, it's I, I think it's ridiculous that you would try to bully an attorney into withdrawing a letter that's based on testimony from clients. I'm I, just making from, a suggestion. It's our opinion. Oh, hold on a second, Mr. Delacus. Where the lawyers are talking. Thank you. Evidence. So Mr. Armstrong is, is asking have the ability to cross-examine you and your answer to that question is is you're not submitting yourself to that cross-examination i i object to submitting myself to that cross-examination and if if he were to do a cross-examination to me i mean i could try to i would ask to do a cross-examination of you no i'm not the one who testified in the letter I there's no testified. letters from me to the city of tarpon springs it comes from my experts you, you have every opportunity to hear their testimony and cross-examine them. I'd never testify. I'm not a witness. That's the difference between me and you. I object I'm not a witness. This is just including testimony. This is distilling testimony from all of the documents that have been attached. Okay, I think Mr. Trask has already made his decision. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, if you don't want to testify, then I would, you know, if you agree to withdraw your letter and all of the exhibits, I think that makes it a moot point. Well, I do not agree to withdraw the letter because it was it was registered. I, I sent it to the record, and this is a document that we've submitted. Well, I insist that we have the right to cross-examine this witness. Okay. So then, okay, then I'm gonna move to strike the letter okay. and the exhibits attached to the letter. Mm -hmm. That's my motion. Okay. And I object. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, I don't have the capability. You're the chair of, of this particular meeting. And so you have the, uh, the 
burden, I'll put it that way, of making decisions relative to motions or objections. And so at this point, you have to decide whether or not uh, Mr. Armstrong is making a motion to move to strike this letter and the attachments. The attorney is objecting to that and she's stated her position. So we'll leave it to you as the chair of the meeting as to whether or not that you are going to strike the letter or the attachments or both, or you're gonna allow it to remain in evidence and acknowledge Mr. Armstrong's um, objection to that. If I understand that, was your um, suggestion to strike the letter in all the exhibits? Does that mean 502 pages? 563, whatever the number is, letter um, and all the exhibits attached there too. Thank you. And Mr. Trask, you said, uh, in your opinion, based on the letter itself, it sounds like the attorney was making some um, testimony based on what you could read. It looks like in the letter, the several page letter that you've got, let me figure out how many pages it is. Yeah, eight pages that, it, that in fact was her testimony. There were, obviously there, there were uh, references to other exhibits and affidavits of other individuals and she cites some of the testimony in those affidavits, but there is additional um, language in her letter where she was representing uh, actually making um, opinions on planning issues um, is the way I saw it, so. Okay, and then uh, do I understand this correctly, attorney, you're not willing to be cross-examined then? Well, I, I do not consent to being cross-examined. I, I object to that. Okay, um, based on what I'm hearing uh, from our attorney and hearing from the attorneys. May I make a suggestion? Sure. to be constructive. One Fine. alternative would be to strike the letter and let the exhibit stand because those witnesses did testify. Yeah, that's the approach I was heading. So, um, based on what I'm based on what I'm hearing, uh, you've had your opportunity plenty of times. Um, the the letter will be struck. The exhibits will remain. Um, if I can, if I can make one possible suggestion, if you were to keep the letter and if you were to cite specific sections that you pull out to say this is definitely testimony. I mean, I would consent to that, but we'd have to agree to what was testimony because most of this, I mean, the letter itself is all a distilling of the client's views. So it's not my personal testimony, but if there were certain sections that you would want to strike, I would potentially look to that, but I mean, I will not agree and we have a First Amendment right to be able to present um, things into the record. Now, I have a due process right to cross-examine witnesses, and that's you. I think that uh, vice, the, the uh, vice mayor has made a decision. The letter will be struck. The remainder of the evidence that was received starting at page nine and back is gonna remain in, in the record. Um, and I guess we can move on at this point. I've got a point of order. The vice mayor can make a decision on that without any kind of discussion among the commission? That's right. That's correct. And is that in our rules of procedure? Um, it's parliamentary rule. I'd yes. Like to the, the he's going to make decision on objections. The answer is yes. It's not a matter of uh, discussion amongst the commission. I mean, if there's three of you to decide that you want to overrule the position that the vice chair has taken, that's an option. Can I move to have a discussion on that? I think you would need to have a motion to, you know, address the issue, and that would be a motion to allow the letter to remain in evidence, see if there's a second, and then you would have the discussion on that motion. Is that what you'd like to do? I'd like to move to, re to retain the letter in evidence uh, a motion to that effect, uh, overturning the vice mayor's decision for discussion at this point. So is there a second either from the mayor or from Commissioner Donovan? I'll second it just for the sake of discussion. Okay. Um, do we, do so we vote on this now? Or? You have any, do you have any comments, mayor? 
Uh, yes, I believe that uh, if we're going to keep the record as it is, the attorney should be a cross-examined as well. Commissioner Donovan. I guess I'm just not sure why the resistance to the cross-examination, if we're going to keep it into the record. Is there any response? Um, well, you're just party? talking amongst yourselves now. This is discussion on this motion. Okay. Yeah. I, if, okay. If, if the letter includes, um, you know, per personal opinions in there, I don't, I don't see why it would be a big deal to do a cross-examination. I'm fine to keep the letter if a cross-examination is on the table. I, I, I was wondering whether it was a po the reason why I'm asking, isn't there a possibility of, of uh, Ms. Graham waiving her right to it being evidence? She wants to leave the letter in, so it's going to remain. I'm talking about that. She okay. can leave the letter in, but she can, she can stipulate that it is not evidence. Well, that's what's being left in. So if it's left in evidence, if it is evidence. So if I'm not sure I understand that if she says it's not evidence and and if this comes up in some other court case later mm -hmm. and maybe I'm misunderstanding how judges operate. But if she says it's not evidence here, then it's not evidence to, regardless of what it says. This board makes the determination whether it's evidence or not. The lawyers don't get that opportunity to do that. In my opinion, uh, Commission uh, Securus, if it's not an evidence and then it needs to be removed. If it is an evidence, it needs to stay there and the attorney should be examined, uh, cross examined. Okay. You can't well, have it both ways. I, I'm, I, from what I'm hearing is that Mrs. Graham, it, it, you correct me if I'm wrong, is that it's nothing more than a cover letter? Okay, we're not going to do that. We're not, yeah. we're not we're, this is discussion amongst the Okay, basically, yeah. the way I'm interpreting it is it's a, it's a cover letter, and I don't want to get tangled up between jousting with two attorneys, and I always like the way in favor of, of what we have, and I, I um, um, you know, from my perspective, I don't, I mean, don't take this the wrong way, Vice Mayor Carr. I don't know that we know enough from a legal perspective to start doing this sort of thing. And, um, um, you know, maybe there should, there, I, I don't know anything more to tell you. I just don't understand what the issue is right now. I think Mr. Armstrong is arguing that he has the right to cross-examine Ms. Graham. She's objecting to it. She's, Mr. Vice Mayor, I'm calling the question. Let's take a vote on that. Is there a second? Second. All right, so the motion on the floor is, is to allow the letter to remain in evidence without cross-examination. So am I correct with a roll call, this would go to, yay would be to leave the letter in evidence without cross-examination, nay would be to strike the letter, is that correct. right? Without cross-examination? That's correct. Okay, and the exhibits would remain? Correct. Okay. Roll call. Commissioner Vatikiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? No. Vice Mayor Carr? No. Mayor Lahuzis? No. Okay. So it's complete at this point. Okay. Are you going to add, I mean, if if that's the decision, I mean I would I would say you could cross examine me under my objection. Okay. Do you want to go down that path? Do you ready to do your cross examination then so we can get the letter back into evidence? You're, you're asking me to waive my cross examination with you? No, she's saying that she will be cross examined now. Yeah, under an objection. Okay. Okay. To hide. I mean, you know. Okay. Okay. It's point of order. I, I'm a little confused as to what's going on right now. So the, after the motion passed, the letter is out of evidence. She is now submitting it back into evidence with the ability to be cross-examined. That is what is happening right now. That can be done as well. Yes. Good luck, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Proceed. Yes, sir. Okay. I'll try to make it brief. Um, there are several opinions in your letter. Uh, and what I'm going to is your qualifications as a land use planner <clears throat> and whether you believe that you're an expert in the field of land use planning. Is that, 
That is a question. Do you hold yourself out and believe yourself to be an expert in the field of land use planning? I am an attorney who has dealt with land use law for a number of years. I am board certified in city, county, and local government law. I am not an AICP. I don't hold myself out to be a professional planner. I do hold myself out to be an attorney who has, um, has experience in land use. Okay, thank you. We're done. Okay, so uh, Vice Chair, I think that now that the cross-examination is done, you can receive it into evidence. We'll deem it to be received into evidence. Is that acceptable to you? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, Ms. Graham, you're, you're done with your case in chief then? Okay. Okay, any rebuttal? Mr. Armstrong. And then what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna go to the people, to the public to speak. Correct, Ms. Vincent. Um, do you have quite more questions of Ms. Vincent? Yes. Oh, okay. We'll get to that. Is there anyone else? Just uh, Renee? Costa? Yes. Just Renee afterwards? It's just Renee you wanted to talk to? I, I, Renee's the one, yes. Okay, okay. All right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, we, we'd call Christopher Hatton. Um, again, my name is Scott McLaren. Um, I'm going to ask a question and then ask Mr. Hatton to respond. Mr. Hatton, could you please explain the difference between an R cut, which I, I discussed with Mr. Houston, and what's being installed here, which is, uh, if you could explain the difference between what's being installed, I don't remember the name of it, and an R cut. Thank you. Uh, good evening again. My name is Christopher Hatton, again with Kimley Horn. Um, yes, the, the R cut, which again goes by other names, such as a bi directional meeting opening, uh, allows a, a left in at the driveway. It is then a right in, right out at the driveway. Uh, what we are being proposed and what again was being proposed initially by the Florida Department of Transportation uh, is a right in right out only not allowing the left in. Um, and again, that's uh, further reducing the conflict. Point. So those are the difference between the two. And, and so what is being proposed is not an R cut. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hatton. If you can just hang on just a second. Uh, Ms. Graham, do you have any additional questions of Mr. Hatton? Yes, I do want one more. Actually, no, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hatton. Okay, so uh, Commissioner Vaticiotis had um, an additional question from Ms. Vincent, who testified at the last hearing and the hearing before that. So, Renee, were you sworn in earlier tonight? Okay. So Mr. Vaticiotis has got a question for you or two or more. Thank you. Yep. Um, Ms. Vincent, um, I just have two questions. Um, was, and I've asked this the same of everyone, uh, was the second access ever discussed? The second access was discussed as um, part of the, the preliminary concept plan that was submitted and went to the, to the TRC. So the applicant was informed that by our site plan review criteria that a second access, and let me just I want to state exactly what it says. It's under the site plan review criteria. It's not in the plan development section. It says for residential developments of in excess of 50 units, right. a secondary access shall be provided where feasible. And I think that's an important point to make in all of this. So yes, it was discussed that they would either need to provide it or they would have to submit for a waiver to, to not provide it. Okay. Um, the, the, I picked it up with the first TRC September 3rd. And I recall that there was a, a comment made by Ms. McNeese that the, um, uh, that there was an explanation given by Mrs. Uh, Terrapani. And, uh, but I, I never really heard that there was a, um, uh, an actual, I, I guess I should say an alternative has uh, ever been discussed, an alternative to just having the single access. An alternative presented by staff? 
or just an alternative or, or in anyone, general or anyone or anyone i'm i am okay we can't have you jumping up and down either you know the answer to the question or I, you don't i don't think so okay okay all right uh the other question i have is the um studies uh performed by the staff um now your your earlier testimony said that um, it would be superior because of the environmental impact um, to have a single access, and that's why you would support picture. the waiver of a second access. Um, have there been any studies done by staff that you're aware of that would support that? No. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Does, does the rest of the commission have any questions? Mr. Mr. Trask, I have a question to uh, Ms. Vincent, please. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Go ahead. Uh, I, I just need a clarification. Uh, would you please, in your professional opinion, does the Ankle Harbor project meet the uh, requirements of the Land Development Code and the comprehensive plan of our city? Uh, succinctly, yes. Considering the, the waivers being requested, yes. Thank you. Okay, so Mr. Armstrong, do you have any questions of Ms. Vincent? Okay, Ms. Graham, do you have any questions of Ms. Vincent on the this testimony she just gave? Not on the testimony she just gave. We, we have a, a general question. We may be able to open it up. Okay, why don't you step up to the microphone so I can hear what you're, everybody else can hear what you're saying too. You have a, another question of Ms. Vincent? If, if we may, we have a, a quick question. All right, let's go ahead and get that done. Okay, um, if she could quantify the re reduction in trips from the mobility management plan that had been um, I have not quantified the, the I assume you're saying the reduction of 488 versus 404 residential units it, there's 7.2 trip ins per residential unit in a multifamily development so if you want to run that math that would be your overall daily trip reduction as a result I haven't ran the math myself Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, so we're at a point now where we can go ahead and start hearing from the public. So those that want to speak, we're going to use the podium in the center. If you could step forward. Um, Tell us your name and address, please. You have four minutes. Sure. Uh, my name is Joseph Offerman, 1576 uh, Mary Lane, Sail Harbor. Um, I live in the neighborhood just off of Hayes Road. And I'm a little bit confused why uh, the commissioner uh, especially is, just seems to be so obsessed with this Hayes Road access. I mean, we've heard tonight from the FDOT, we've heard from a qualified engineer, um, we've heard about environmental impacts of trying to put a road in where a road really doesn't belong, um, where it would take uh, studies, it'd take uh, FEMA looking at it, take a lot of different things, plus the cost of it and everything else, not to mention the uh, impact on the traffic on Jasmine. There's uh, 50 houses in Sill Harbor, there's 10 behind it, there's another five or 10 along the road, there's uh, two other neighborhoods, the trailer parks, you've got North Lake, you've got that new development. Uh, Jasmine is a two lane road that's not in the best conditions. It's got two hairpin turns that everybody coming out of the new development would have to navigate, which are very dangerous already. The road is in pretty bad disrepair between uh, Mellon and, and uh, Tarpon Ave. Uh, there's a sports development park there. Traffic gets backed up already as it is. Um, we've tried to get the county to put a right turn lane in on, on Jasmine so you can head um, uh, west to, to uh, US 19 because the traffic backs up there so much people don't always take melon so to bring another 1000 1500 whatever cars it is a day in there is just ridiculous it just doesn't make any sense from an economic standpoint an environmental standpoint a safety standpoint and the roads themselves are in disrepair and need repair I call the county two or three times every year and we're not even on a list to have those roads looked at because they're those are Pinellas County roads so to bring in more traffic without any study of it or even, uh, you know, having a real discussion is just, is, doesn't make any sense. And, and, the, and the cost and nothing else supports it. So thank you. Next. Hi. If you could state your name and address, please. Uh, Lisa Offerman. I live with that handsome guy, okay. 1576 Mary Lane. I know that you said you do not, Mr. Chairman, you do not understand the impact. You're not cognitive 
cognizant, cognizant of what we have currently on Jasmine and Mellon, but I can tell you as a resident of Sail Harbor, it's pretty dangerous since they put the Spruce Street cut through. People come right off 19 and they use that little cut through to shoot down Jasmine. And if they don't take the left because they don't want to make the left onto Keystone by the, um, with no signal, they, that traffic, that light to Mellon backs all the way up past North Lake and it's single lane. The cemetery just increased the size. They put a sidewalk over on the cemetery side, only from that one little area. But the other side has a major traffic light right there. And there's absolutely no room to even have a right lane turn. So you've got traffic already backed up. And all they did was offer a cut through for people that have the you know ways um, and know how to cut that angle off and miss the big left turn onto Keystone from 19. So if you start adding now more cars coming down that way, it will be a disaster for our community. There are so many people that ride their bikes. The trail is right there. Um, there's always a near miss of people coming down and then the trail crossing. All right, so you have the trails there. You have tons of people walking, um, their dogs. There's bus stops there. I am, you know, because you, you, my husband said you have the, uh, detriment in terms of going from almost a 200% increase in the environmental impact in using Hayes Road as a secondary exit. It just doesn't make sense. Economically, the developer doesn't want to spend the, take the, let them save their money and do something else with it because we don't want it. And, you know, I just, I feel like somebody needs to hear from the neighborhood. And by the way, these people are from the neighborhood. We didn't even know about this until our, uh, we were supposed to get a, a notice in the mail or a notice on their door. Nobody communicated it with our neighborhood at all. So we've got just a, a handful of people here and a few people that sent emails, but we did not get the legitimate notice because we are the abutting area. So that's, I don't know what happened, but you should be aware of that. Um, I think that's about it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next person, state your name and address, please. My name is Tony Doyle. I live at 1188 North Jasmine Avenue, Tarpon Springs, right on the corner of Hayes and Jasmine Ave. The road that you're, that the mayor suggested we make a one-way road, you can't do because there'd be head-on collisions. They have too many people living on the left side that come and go unless you want them to just go to work every day and not come back. So that's impossible. Second thing is, is the road isn't wide enough. From what I heard, Tarpon, the city of Tarpon and the county, which is where I live, will have to take easement rights and Im eminent domain from my yard, which I will not agree to, just so you know. The road is small. If there's drainage problems, I have the sewer if there's drainage coming from the, the, the apartment complex coming down that road, you'd have to widen the road, you'd have to put in embankments, and you'd have to put in drainage. There's a house on that side, and there's my house. There is no way. And I don't know, there's four of you, five of you. Have you driven down that road ever? Have you turned? Have you watched the kids get on and off the school bus right in front of my house? Have you noticed that the road has no line in it? It's not wide enough now for, for the bus and a car to pass hardly. And then you have to navigate two turns. Then you have to pass Pinellas Trail. Then you have to go down to the cemetery, which, oh my God, you try to drive a road, your, your tires nearly get banged up. All I'm saying is, and the wildlife, the one gentleman who spoke about the birds, we have Rosietta spoonbills. We have all of them. And every year, I've been living there for nearly 13 years on that corner. There was only one other house on that, on my side of Jasmine. I see those eagles come every single year. This year, they don't seem to be very happy. I agree. They, I have not seen, we see them flying around, but we got pictures of them on every pole around. I've seen bobcats. I hear coyotes talk, crying in the background. 
These are things I see in my yard that go back and forth. And you're thinking of destroying that land? Did you look at it? Did any of you see how beautiful it was? And you're gonna put apartment complex there? Personally, I would have preferred Walmart at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Next person, could you state your name and your address, please? Uh, I'm Jim Thornton. I live 1188 North Jasmine with Tony. <laughs> um, I'm an engineer. So my life has been about common sense. And to put that street in just doesn't make sense. All the objections on the, the size of it, the height of it, the cost of it, they don't want to pay for it. You don't want to pay for it. No one wants to pay for it. No one wants it there. That is a horrible place for a street. New homes are coming in there now. There's one right behind our house. There's another one going in next to him. And then there's another one going in there as well. So those three houses will be impacted. We have grandkids. I, you know, we take them across the street to the Offerman's cows and go feed the cows. I, I would not cross the street with an extra thousand cars a day coming through there. I, I, I wouldn't do it. That's, it, it wouldn't be safe. Now all of a sudden I have to stay inside the house. We go for walks in the beautiful neighborhood behind us. That's gonna be done all because of a second access. It, it doesn't make sense. And if the construction on these roads is correct and the, you know, the experts are saying this is safe or whatever, they're basically saying you don't need it anyways. So common sense, that is not a place for a road. And I'm also a little upset that we didn't get notified about this meeting. We had to get someone knocking on our door to say, hey, there's a, something going on here you should know about, because um, it was a shock to us. It was bad enough when Walmart tried to come in and now we have this, you know, a road that's gonna not only, we're literally Hayes and Jasmine. So when they turn, they're on this side of my house, or I'm sorry, when they come out, they're on this side of my house and then they're on the front side of my house, te tearing up my lawn, like a, a lot of the cars doing everything else. Terrible idea. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir, if you could state your name and address, please. My name is Bob Marusa. My address is 1566 Mary Lane. I live in Sail Harbor. I drive that Jasmine every day. I don't know whether you have ever driven it, but it's not just a line on a map. You are, the road is narrow. As people have said, it's a double it's a 90 degree turn that is blind. You can't see traffic coming. You come around that corner, there's people walking, their dogs, kids riding bikes, you, and you add another thousand cars or even 500 cars a day on that road. If they can't get out on 19, the exit out of the back side is not feasible. It's the traffic engineer said that it's safer to make a U-turn than to go to a lighted intersection with a, with a light. If they come down Jasmine and take Mullen, they're gonna to come to an intersection and get on Tarpon. That's not even controlled. You're gonna cross two lanes of traffic, sit in the middle, cross two more lanes to, to, to go east. And also, Jasmine, when it rains, there's two places that it floods. You can't pass in one lane. You have to go into the northbound lane when you're going south. And further south, past Mullen, it does it again. The southbound lane floods. You have to go into the northbound lane. Plus, you have a little bit of a knoll there. So you can't change lanes safely on that road and, and not have a car coming the other way that you, don't even, you can't tell yet. That's, that's my point. It's just not an option. You should not even consider it. School bus, I mean, I can't believe that they, if you just look at the map and say, oh, well, we can use this road and that road, you already have 
uh, the, the trail, you've got everything. And you, another thing on that road that is dangerous is the new complex of townhomes there. They built a post right at the corner. You cannot see to make a left turn and go home up further north on Jazz, but you have to pull out almost into the intersection. And as often as not, somebody's coming up that road that's turning on, to, on spruce and you're out in the intersection already. They, they get sort of pissed, excuse me, get annoyed and come real close to you. Granted, you're somewhat in the intersection, but if they're not going the other direction, they don't know the problem. So to add more traffic on that road is just insane. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. If you could just state your name and address, please. Chris Roboski, 1602 Gulf Beach Boulevard, Tarpon Springs, 34689. First, I object to any destruction of any wetlands that will be challenged at the federal level and at every level. I object to the traffic and the increase of traffic that this project proposes, the increase of accidents. Heck, the guy from FDOT said that they're gonna let people die and then when enough of them have died, they will fix it and like they've done, just like you said, up and down 19. You know you, his testimony was not competent and substantial. You know how you know that? Because you've driven on 19. Every year for the last 20 years, it's gotten worse, not better more accidents and worse traffic because they keep rubber stamping these crooked deals. We have to put a stop to this. It's only gonna get worse and more people are gonna die. And then if there's an accident in front of the, the gate, you can't get an ambulance in there to save somebody's life inside. That blood is on your hands. Why would you do that? You can have one entrance and then somebody needs to get an ambulance, but they can't? What are you thinking? This has to stop. And then you got a land planner comes up here and says there was no proposal, no serious proposal. When Mark Lucuris knows, and all of you know, that Peter DeLacos testified at the previous meeting that there was a serious proposal. The guy had the check in hand from the trust from public land. So she lied under oath. So you could toss her testimony out as not competent and substantial because she lied to you under oath. How could you trust anything else she has said? Somebody has to hold people accountable for what they say. If you're gonna lie here in this body, then you don't have the right to speak anymore. That's not right. You all know that he testified, she was here when he testified that. Look, I was talking to the reporter the other day and it dawned on me that the Greeks invented democracy. And look what you've all done with it. You've turned it upside down. It's backwards. You're supposed to represent the people, not the developers. What is happening here in our town? Yes, you need to follow the law. You also need to follow the people. And you've seen enough evidence that is competent and substantial to hang your hats on to vote this project down tonight. And if not, it will be, I mean, look at all the ways that you guys have bent over backwards for this developer. Sneaking it in, nobody told us about it. Sneaking it in in the, in the holidays during a pandemic. And then at the last meeting, you guys were following procedure and you were working on which night the next meeting was gonna be on. And guess what? Armstrong approaches the microphone and says, no, 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 this is my meeting. We don't, he took over, he was the mayor that night. He told you when it was gonna happen. Now, how was that? You guys were working it out. He had no point of procedure at all. He was not following procedure. You didn't call on him. In my board, we don't allow that. We tell the person to sit down and wait their turn. Doesn't matter if you're an applicant or not, an attorney or not. Why does he get to tell you what to do? You guys were setting it for a regular Tuesday meeting, but now you suddenly decide a Thursday at six, a bizarre day, a bizarre time, right after Epiphany is the time to do this? Why do they get so much special favor in that all these people have to wait to speak? 
and all the people hanging on the phone probably not going to get to speak. What are we doing? What have you done to this democracy? I mean, from the top of this country down to this little town, Mr. democracy Arlowski? is under attack. Mr. We can't Arlowski, have your, it anymore. Your Thank, time you. Is up. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the auditorium that would like to speak? Ms. Wade? State your name and address, please. Good evening or morning, I guess, sorry. Mayor, commissioners, thank you for your service. I was thrilled that I was turned away at the door at the last meeting. It's fantastic. It's helpful for you to have citizen input. Oh, and I forgot to see my address, I'm sorry. 1095 Main Sale. Having followed the Anclote Harbors project, which was available for everyone to follow from TRC to PNZ to the BOC, you've seen my written comments. I've spoken to you before, so I'm not gonna go over all that again. No need to repeat it. My intention in the last meeting was to have you take time, but since we ran out of time, that happened. We've been responsible, we vetted the process, um, we, and, uh, Y'all have really answered questions, things we've asked for. I thought you have accommodated for us. Now I'm the big environmentalist and I'd love to see the land just preserved, but I'm also a realist and nothing has happened to this property for years and years and years, except that it continues to come up before the code board because it gets dumped on, it gets um, vagrant staying there and it has to be cleaned up really often. So, this could be a legacy process project for all of you, or it could be a disaster. I'm not prescient enough to know which, but I've been heartened by the prompt responses of the applicant and their willingness to be community good, good community members. But I have no way of knowing. I have to trust that a local citizen like Ms. Terrapani and Mr. Armstrong are watching out for us. If this project tanks, they still live here and will be upset. But mostly board, we have to let you earn the big bucks and make the right decision for us. I know you make so much money. Please use your best judgment. And if you allow this to proceed, ensure oversight, 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 so that what's presented gets created. And I wish you good luck. I'm glad I don't have to decide. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the auditorium would like to speak? Mr. Coolius? State your name and address, please. Hey, Mr. Trask, would I have the ability to walk down there like you gave other people the option because I have a couple of different documents in front of me. I want to be able to look at them all. And yes, talk over that's them. fine. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Trask, in this time, we've got about nine minutes till two o'clock. I believe our meeting is till two o'clock. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, is there a motion to extend the meeting for there's additional public comment, I believe, on the phone and on the internet Zoom call? May I ask what our plan is for this evening? Are we going to go all the way through? Uh, <laughs> so it, it was my decision to make. Uh, I would recommend that we get through the public comment. And then at that point, we continue the meeting for a date certain to listen to the emails that are going to be read by the city clerk. And then at that point, we can hear um, whatever the next step is uh, in the meeting at that point. They would have the opportunity, each side would have the opportunity to make a summary or summarize their cases um, before you make your final determination. So that would be city staff, that would be Mr. Armstrong and his, on behalf of his client, and that's Ms. Graham on behalf of her client. This would be before the reading of the uh, emails? No, it'd be after all of the presentation. They get to hear everything before they summarize their case but that would be at a later date. Well, that's what the vice mayor is suggesting, yes. Yeah, yeah I'm definitely suggesting that we don't say that's, that's fair, that, that, that's, um, and we can talk about that other date. Okay, um, what would you like um, to motion to, like uh, motion to continue till 2.30? You're going to need more time than that. My suggestion is you do it till four. And if you get done before then, it's just not, four. it's over. Then you don't have to keep doing this. <laughs> All right. Vice Mayor finds that a little humorous. Um, motion to uh, continue the meeting till 4 a.m. Thank you. Second. <laughs>
Roll call. Commissioner Vadikiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. Vice Mayor Carr? Uh, yes. Mayor Lahousas? Yes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Coolius, you're up. You have four minutes. <clears throat> Uh, anybody donating their time is simply just donating their time for me to be speaking. These are my own thoughts and expressions. Therefore, I will have Annie Samarcus donating two minutes of her time, as well as my mother who's intending online, Mr. Jump. Can you verify that? If you can state your name and address for the record. Maria Kulkas. Maria Cullas, 595 Peninsula Avenue. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All right. I'm not the good guy here. You've seen a lot of passionate people come here to speak on this property. Um, if I wasn't here for my own personal <laughs> reasons, this Ankle Harbor stuff would have slid right under the radar. And the people who cared about it most would have missed out on it. Now, my job, they're going to, a lot of these people are going to sit there and say, He's all speculative. He just sits there and speculate. Well, my job is to articulate and, pro and provide a timeline of facts and present truths over speculation. And first, I want to remind you all, you all took an oath swearing at God. I hope those, I hope those testifying have a healthy fear of God with the, with the testimony we've heard tonight. And moving forward, I'd like to see that Bible up in the air when we do ask for the oath. Now, I found this disclosure of local officers' interest dating back to 2011 regarding the Linger Longer property and Townsend Terrapani and his father's interest. I would like this document to be presented up to the board for the people to see regarding this property that was filled out. Now, I'd like to go over this second. I found this article. It said, Tarpon Springs left without a building department. Dated July 1st, 2014. Now, Principal Planner Rodney Chapman and Planning Director Renea Vincent have filed notice to leave, said City Manager Mark LaCourse. Chapman already left and Vincent's last day is Thursday, leaving the city of more than 23,000 with no planning employees. Both are taking planning jobs with Pinellas County. Now, this article is published July 1st, 2014. Neither LaCourse nor David Archie said they knew why Chapman and Vincent left. It is not clear if their department, if their departures are related to the failed sponge docks project the city spent three years developing and modifying. It'd be pure speculation whether it is or not, LaCourse said. The citizens don't believe it's speculative. Vincent, who is leaving her job with the city after nearly 12 years, said the timing was right for a new job and the offer was good. So, Basically, she left, but under public records that I received, Ms. Renee Vincent was terminated on July 3rd, 2014. So why did we bring back a planning and zoning director who either quit on us or was terminated and we brought her back three years later? Or what, five years later, if that? Mr. Goulias, uh, you're, you're on a thin line of... Um... I, I think slander of city staff here. So please address the city, um, the chairman of the meeting. Absolutely. And address this uh, applicant. Well, I am addressing you. Okay. I am addressing you, Mayor, Vice Mayor. So, you know, when this is all said and done, Mr. Carr, the city manager may be using another scapegoat for this, for this project. Now, let's see. I also have a second article that I found. Planning director resigns under fire. It's dated August 25th, 2005. Now, and this is Cindy Terrapani, it's stated, the city planning director who shepherded the rapid redevelopment of Clearwater Beach and the renaissance of Clearwater Mall resigned under pressure Friday amid criticism that she had become an ineffective manager. Terry Penny said her ouster caters to area developers and their representatives. Just read an article, Mayor. Just read an article. Terry Penny, 46, said she believes developer, developer groups pressured Horn and other city leaders to let her go. Terry Penny has recently clashed with some developers over the size of several projects on Clearwater Beach. She also angered many property owners when she, 
with Horn's support, proposed a building moratorium in the One Beach neighborhood. Mrs. Terrapani went on to state, it's pretty clear developers can get their way now, Terrapani said when reached out her home Friday afternoon. If I were a developer or an attorney in Clearwater, I'd be rubbing my hands with glee. The best interests of the city are not being looked after. Now, we've made, there's been several, several testimony that the application for Enclote Harbors was submitted back in 2019, but that's not what the court, that's not what the public record state when I requested them. And I wanted to make sure I got my timeline right because in April of 2020, right, Mr. Carr, we hired back Ms. Vincent. Well, three weeks later is when the first application was submitted on Enclote Harbors, which was May 6, 2020. So I, I find it very coincidental, if that, definitely not speculative on how the biggest project, the biggest apartment development project in the history of Tarpon Springs got pushed through after someone got hired on a few weeks after. Well, we got some more laughing, you know, so. Now, and I mentioned, you know, Mark LaCourse is going to use another scapegoat. Mayor. Mr. Kulias. We are just reading the signs. Now, I want to say, Mayor, you know, you know Mark LaCourse wants to develop this property before he retires. It's on his list of accomplishments, but his lack of love for Tarpon Springs is proof with this development. Jacob, he can also use this property as a tool to make someone who's uh, representing the developer happy after they were screwed over on the Linger Longer property. Now, Jacob, Mark has to make it up to the developer who's being represented, you know? And the two families are always looking out for each other. Uh, you could stop right there. There's nothing wrong with that. There is something wrong with that. You're making accusations of two different families during public comment. I did not say anybody's name. I know, but you're making acquisitions. We know what we're talking about. You're insinuating it, so. Well, I wanted to focus on the competent substantial evidence that's supposed to be provided to the board. Okay, now, this, Mr. this is Armstrong, your second warning. So just, you're, like I said, you're on a very thin line right here. I want okay. you to continue with your public comment, but just understand, Ms. Terrapani is part of the applicant. Mark, of course, is our city manager. You can direct comments to me about this project. I've right been directing, directing them to you the whole time, sir. Okay. And I will continue just to direct them to you. Now, I was personally upset. I'm not going to lie. The first hearing with Mr. Trask, I was upset how everything was rushed a little bit. I was really upset when I saw Mr. Trask nodding his head during the closing statements of Mr. Armstrong's first reading testimony. I thought it diluted the the voting process for the citizens, and it affected maybe the ability for what some of you might have saw on the one end during the closing arguments. So, and you know, we all know Jacob that Mr. Armstrong's a well-known land use attorney. He's one of the best in the county, if not the state of Florida. And you know, we want to make sure we look out for citizens of Tarpon Springs. There's a reason why people fought hard 15 years ago to stop this. And we expect you all to do the exact same thing. It doesn't have to be your choice to make something. Let future commissioners or future mayors come up with that decision. It's good to be reserved and reject something. Can you tell me another four story apartment complex on US 19 in Tarpon Springs? Can any of you? No, there isn't one. Why is that? Because we've been very good at stopping and not letting, uh, not build up our city to that type of liking. That's my time. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else in the auditorium that would like to speak today? Not seeing any. Let's go ahead, Mr. Jump. Are there people that are online that would like to speak at the meeting today? Anyone would like to speak? In, from Zoom, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. We do have several raised hands at this time. Okay.
you can let the first one in, please. If you can please state your name and address for the record. Yes, my name is Dawn Arbitello. I'm at 1366 Cottage Grove Road, Tarpon Springs, 34689. Um, I, just, it, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I moved um, from Michigan to Florida about eight and a half years ago. And originally I was looking at the Clearwater area, but it seemed like there was um, a lot of um, high rise apartments and gated uh, communities and stuff like that. And when I came to Tarpon Springs, uh, visited the sponge docks, drove around downtown, um, I was really captivated by the, the quaintness and the friendliness of this area. And that's why we decided, my husband and I decided to move here. And I really, um, when I first heard about this, I was really worried about the wildlife. And I would like to say that, you know, a, a habitat and an ecosystem is more than just two animals and a, a couple of kinds of plants. It's, it's an entire uh, system that works together. There's a lot of other things going on there that maybe isn't resident all the time, but transitional. And that was my main concern when I heard about it. But I've been listening to this meeting since six o'clock yesterday evening. And uh, when I heard that this was supposed to be a gated community and that all of these wonderful things that are gonna be going on there are going to be denied access to all of the residents of Tarpon Springs, it, it really upset me. I'm, I'm disappointed that, that this board would consider any proposal that would deny a piece of the beautiful nature of Tarpon Springs to its own residents. And um, that's, that's really my main concern. Traffic, of course, is horrible on 19. There's gonna be accidents, but, you know, and I understand that, that the economic impacts uh, to our city are good, but, the quality of life in this city is, is irreplaceable. And I think that this project is going to change that and not for the better. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jump, would you allow the next person in please? Hello? Yes, if you'd please state your name and address for the record. Sure, uh, it's Mark Washburn. 124 East Lake Drive in Tarpon Springs, Florida. Also the president of um, SaveTarponSprings.org. Um, I wanted to um, say a few things. Uh, a lot of stuff's already been said. I don't need to repeat it. Um, first off, um, the requiring EV charging stations is uh, brilliant. Um, I'm about to switch to an uh, EV Volkswagen uh, ID4 and uh, I hope that uh, all new communities that are being built, the common areas should all have charging stations. Um, it takes about eight hours to charge on a level two charger. Um, I know Tesla can do it much quicker, but uh, most uh, cars are Teslas that are coming out as EVs. So uh, thumbs up for that, uh, Mr. Carr. That's uh, fantastic. Um, okay, number two, um, the number one complaint, I've lived here 26 years now. Um, the number one complaint I have and many others do as well is uh, getting your boat into the Tarpon, uh, the Ankle River, and getting out to the Gulf. There is not a lot of public access um, that's easy to get in and out of. So turning that property, considering it to be a park that's public and not a gated community where it's, it's, it's sealed off from, from our residents, I, I think is a high priority. I, I think the fact that putting in a boat ramp there for kayaks, and for smaller boats would make a huge difference, especially because then people from out of our area could bring in their boats, drop them in, bring them to the sponge docks, have a great boat ride, and then eat dinner at um, one of the restaurants that, that caters to the, the, the boats coming up on, on, on the, uh, the place there. So um, that's, that's huge. And I also think uh, this would make a much better park. And, and let's talk about the, uh, the traffic, okay? So uh, the traffic engineer, the second one, had a nice little chart saying, oh, the residents would be best because if we made it a commercial setting or let's say industrial or a shopping mall, it would be much worse. Well, if you think about it, 
the best case scenario, considering the traffic, and on many of us, probably all of us on this on this uh, meeting here, know that uh, five o'clock heading north, you're screwed. I mean, you're in bumper to bumper traffic waiting to get through Pasco because we all know people live in Pasco because of the cheap taxes, but they work in Pinellas. So every morning they all stream south. Um, there's this huge herd of Pascoians heading south to get to their job location in Pinellas. And it's gonna get worse once the pandemic is, is over end of this year, hopefully. And then the opposite happens, end of the day, everybody heads north. So those people, if that were to turn into a 404 apartment complex, are gonna have a way hard time getting out or into their place. If that was a park, think about it. The traffic would be perfect. Weekdays, you know Anderson Park, weekdays, that thing is nice and quiet. You can go there and nobody's there and it's peaceful and it's relaxing. You can meditate and do your yoga. On weekends, that's when everybody goes there for their birthday parties and the Super Bowl Sundays or whatever it is. And week, weekends is when there's no traffic on 19. So heck, if we made that into a park, it would be the perfect solution to the traffic problem. And that's what I propose. So uh, again, Save East Lake is, uh, in, in, you know, would like to join with um, the citizens for Tarpon Springs and the um, our friends of the Anklet River. And uh, if this goes the wrong way, we will join you in whatever we need to do to make this the best for the citizens of the city. And one more thing, um, we did send out, and you probably get our emails, we sent out over 8,000 uh, emails and letters to citizens in Tarpon Springs, all voters, all registered voters, and we had a huge response. 98% were 100% positive to make it into a park and to not have it be anything crazy like 104 apartments. And the 2% that were against it weren't really against it. They were just like, okay, well, what about taxes? What about, you know, uh, total cost accounting? You know, how much will it cost the city? To your your, your time is up. Okay. Appreciate well, anyways, I appreciate it. Again, Mark with uh, uh, SaveProperSprings.com. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jump, if you could add, have the next person join us. And if you could state your name and address for the record. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Jeff Larson. Uh, my address is 1846 Lexington Place, Tarpon Springs. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Uh, first of all, I just want to point out that we are talking this morning about a very special piece of land. Uh, back in 2018, the county put together a list of parcels of land to target for preservation. And this parcel uh, was part of that list. Uh, additionally, I just want you to realize the proposal this evening is one of the largest residential projects to come before the BOC in decades. So it's uh, very much appropriate uh, that you act in a very careful and deliberate manner. Uh, I do have a few significant concerns that I wanted to, to reiterate this evening. One of them is in regards to future flooding. Uh, previously, Turn the Tide for Tarpon provided you with a letter uh, that included flooding projections from NOAA. Uh, this evening, Dr. Brooke Hansen from USF also talked about uh, the flooding projections. These projections show that by the year 2040, there will be a two foot rise in sea level uh, causing significant problems for this project. At the first BOC reading, uh, the applicant stated for the record that they took into account only one foot of sea level rise. So to put it simply, their plan and their projection is not consistent with science. Additionally, I wanted to talk about LEED certification. Uh, the application for this project did not include any mention of LEED certification originally at, at TRC, at the Planning and Zoning Board. Uh, my organization, Turn the Tide for Tarpon, suggested LEED certification should be included as a condition for approval. Now, the applicant is proposing NGBS bronze certification. Um, to be clear, my understanding is that that is not the same as LEED certification, and in fact, it is not as stringent. Uh, we still believe that LEED certification should be a condition for approval. But the bigger question to me is why did the applicant not include LEED or any other green certification in their original proposal? 
Morgan Group, the applicant, is a large company with over 20,000 units that they have built. Uh, their executive vice president includes lead certification in his own biography on their website. So it's not like they don't know what lead certification is. They know exactly what it is. They just didn't think this project on the banks of the Anclote River deserved that level of commitment. Additionally, I wanted to talk further about the traffic concerns. As was mentioned uh, at the, in, in the previous staff report, uh, it was mentioned that US-19 is operating at a level of service C. Uh, in fact, the, the latest map from uh, Ford Pinellas does in fact show that it's operating at a level of service F. Uh, so that's obviously a huge concern. Additionally, uh, we have heard expert testimony this evening indicating that the GAP study uh, has significant flaws and, and uh, that expert questioned the safety of this proposal. On top of that, the applicant is uh, required to have a minimum of two access points for this project. So they're, of course, asking for a waiver. I just want to point out that the, the rule of having two access points is for any project that's bigger than 50 units. This project is over 400 units. So to be clear, the waiver that they're asking for is a huge ask. They're asking for an 800% waiver. It's not like they have 55 units and so they need a waiver. They have 400, over 400 units and they need a waiver. Uh, so it's a huge, huge ask. More than anything, Mayor and Commissioners, here's my message to you this evening. Um, as you know, I have sat where you are right now, and sometimes you have agenda items where you feel like your hands are tied. Sometimes you just, you feel like you have to approve something because there's no legal reason for denial. Tonight, this situation, I'm, I'm almost done. This situation is different tonight. You have heard competent and substantial evidence and you're obligated to vote on that evidence. You do have the ability and the obligation to vote no this evening. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else wants to jump? If anyone else would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand, you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any other raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you. So, um, Vice Mayor, all the public has had the opportunity to speak except for those that have joined us by way of email or e-communication. Did you wanna go ahead and adjourn the meeting then and address those at the next meeting and then also allow the parties to summarize at that next meeting or how did you wanna move forward? Um, I think that would be the best approach to take. Um, so what do you need from us uh, as a board? What do you suggest? So I, I just wanna make a, a statement and then you could adjourn the meeting. And the statement is, is that the next meeting, when you go ahead and schedule it, we need to schedule that date right now um, otherwise, we need to send out another notice, which I would prefer that we didn't have to do that. Um, in addition to that, we would save some money if we could set the date tonight, because otherwise we'd have to pay for publication. So, okay. um, but at the next meeting, then it'll be the commission listening to the comments by e email, um, and then a summary by each party. I have a question for the board. Um, so. I, the city clerk has informed us and mayor that there's over three hours of um, electronic emails to be read into the record. Uh, so I would prefer that the meeting be earlier in the day, um, not starting at six o'clock, if that's possible. Um, I will make my schedule, I'll flex my schedule, what I need to do that to make it possible. Um, and then from a, a day standpoint, um, we probably need to ask city staff um, what days are available. Uh, I know we have a commission meeting on the 12th, <clears throat> excuse me, on the 12th. Um, I don't know if we want to, and then we have a workshop. Is that in February or January? I'm not really, I can't remember off the top of my head. That's February. Okay. Really in looking, we've got the two Fridays open tomorrow and the next Friday and, and looking at the meeting and stuff today, um, depending unless you go to a day meeting. If you go to a day meeting, um, I think we're, pretty well when you want to set it. Um, we do have the off Tuesday the 19th. Um, that is an open night meeting. 
Um, obviously, the 18th is a holiday, so that Monday is not available for a meeting. Um, so you got Friday the 8th, the 15th, the 19th, or if you do decide a day meeting, then I believe we can make an accommodation uh, for that on the day you choose. Okay. Um, I want to ask a question for Mr. Trask. Uh, do you have a, a conflict on the 19th with another city? Yes, I have a bond closing at 6 p.m. and then Oldsmore City Council at 7 p.m. Okay. But Vice Mayor, would it be possible to do it tomorrow night? Uh, I no, in my opinion. No. I'm not. <laughs> in my opinion, I'm not going to have a stamina after being up until probably 3:30 today. So I would have a difficult time doing that. I, I, the only reason I'd, I'd really like to get this thing out of the way because it's going to start. Um, uh, maybe make a suggestion um, next Thursday or Friday would be fine with me. Um, I think the earliest I could get here would probably be 3, 3.30. Whenever uh, evening would be fine. I, okay. It's just trying to get it done so we can get on with the rest of the work of the commission into this new <clears throat> year is what I'm getting at. Yeah, it would have to be Friday the 15th if we did that. We couldn't do Thursday? No. We have code enforcement starting at 2 o'clock on Thursday. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Vice Mayor, uh, Wednesday the 13th, uh, if we do that during the day, can you get off work to be able to do that? What, uh, what, what time would we be talking about, Mayor? Uh, I was thinking like a 2 p.m. or 1 p.m. Okay. Uh, you've, got, you've, got meet, you've got a meet, meeting on the Wednesday. You've got a day meeting on a Wednesday. Oh, you do? Yeah, we moved it especially because of the commission meeting. So Wednesdays. Wednesday's out in the daytime. Um, is, is there a problem with that Tuesday the 19th? Oh, oh, Tom can't go to that one, right? Or city attorney? Yeah, I, yeah. I've got a bond closing at six and then a commission meeting at seven. So it really, I, I need to be here. Mm -hmm. I no, I understand. Yeah. Send another lawyer. Really, the Friday nights are the best options, whether it's this one or the next one. I, I can speak for myself tomorrow in particular. I have multiple other meetings, uh, including one representing us at the county level uh, with homeless leadership. Um, so I, tomorrow would not work for me. Tomorrow would be okay with you? Tomorrow would not work not. for me. You, it's not good tomorrow night. No. Okay. Tomorrow tomorrow would not work, but maybe next Friday. If we, next Friday at 3. Does that work with everybody? That's the 15th. Yeah. Next Friday, that'd be fine. That would work for me. Yes. And we'd do that at 3 p.m.? That's the discussion right now, yes. Okay. Point of order for me, I'm sorry uh, to Mr. Delacus, I'm sorry, you well, can sit I've down, spoken please. With the applicant and we Mr. Delacus, I've asked you. I'd like to suggest to you, that's all. Mr. Delacus, thank you. Time. Um, you could resume. I'm sorry. I'm not sure where we're at. We're with the mayor. At, I think we talked about three o'clock on the 15th. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Are you available for that for that day? I'll make it work. If um, I'll make that work. Okay. Um, Mr. Donovan, are you uh, available on the 15th? Friday the 15th at 3 p.m. I'm okay. good with that. I'm not asking my commission but the cures because him and I will retire. <laughs> <laughs> do we need to, Mr. City Attorney, do we need to talk to this, the applicant about this time or what? We need to make sure that they're available. The answer is yes. Okay. So we wouldn't want to set it when they have conflicts. Mr. Armstrong, are you available on the 15th beginning at 3 p.m.? Yes, we are, and the sooner the better. We gotcha. We, I think we all want closure. Yes, sir. Mr. Mr. LeCour, is the staff available on that day? Yes, sir. Ms. Okay. Graham? 15th at 3 p.m.? Yes. Thank you. There you go. Okay. So that's a go. Okay. I think it would be best. Okay. Would someone like to make a motion? Motion to adjourn. No, we need uh, a motion to continue no. <laughs> January 15th at 3 p.m. Yeah, I'm making a motion to, uh, to continue on the, on the 15th at 3 p.m. Second. Okay. Roll call. Commissioner Vatikiotis? Yes. Commissioner Donovan? Yes. 
Vice Mayor Carr? Yes. Mayor Lujuzis? Yes. Vice uh, Mayor, I just want to thank you for conducting the meeting tonight. Yes, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, this concludes the, the session for tonight, the regular session. Um, do I go to board comments since we continue the meeting or how, how does that work? You don't need to do, you don't need to do that. Okay. We're going to go ahead and adjourn, um, at two twenty six on January 8th. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night.